This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Introducing Anthroposophical Medicine. This is lecture 11, given in Dornach on March 31, 1920. Yesterday we ended up at a very different point from where we started, and today, too, our starting point will be very specific, concrete, and material but we will then attempt to elaborate on the whole issue. We need to approach our task in concentric circles, as it were, partly because of the very nature of the questions and partly because of the short time allotted to us. We cannot take the scientific route of beginning with axioms and moving on to ever more complicated concerns. My task today will be to show you the next concentric circles in the way we are looking at things. Our starting point will be Carbo Vegetabilis. Yesterday we looked at Chicorium Intibus, Woodland Strawberry and the like, and today we will study a material that, although commonly available, is one of the world's most remarkable substances. This is the best way to see that if we are seriously committed to observing nature, we are compelled to look further than modern science tends to look. It was very interesting to hear Dr. Kalisko point out in last night's lecture that in the future chemistry will actually have to become a completely different science. Footnote Eugen Kalisko, 1893-1939, was a teacher and school physician at the Stuttgart Independent Waldorf School beginning in 1920 and later became active in England. End of footnote. The word physiology came up repeatedly, indicating that the gap between chemistry and physiology must be bridged. This made me think of many different points that still cannot be fully articulated in public lectures at present, because the prerequisites for understanding them are totally lacking. Certainly we find carbon in non-human nature, or in what appears to be non-human nature, as I would prefer to put it. Actually, what aspects of nature truly are external to the human being? None of them, because everything we now encounter as external, was removed from humankind and relocated outside in the course of human evolution. Humankind had to pass through evolutionary stages that were possible only because certain processes began to take place externally as opposed to internally, enabling human beings to internalize certain other processes. In this sense, both a contrast and a relationship always exist between certain outer and inner processes. Now I must say I found a remarkable concordance between what was said yesterday about the need to physiologize chemistry. This may not express it very precisely, but you will know what I mean, especially if you heard Dr. Kalisko's lecture and what Dr. Scheidegger was so kind as to set forth on Sunday in his very interesting presentation, indicating the need to understand the purpose of potentization from a spiritual scientific perspective. Footnote, Dr. Scheidegger, see note on page 139, lecture 9, end of footnote. At one point, we heard a remarkable statement, one that has concerned me for decades. It is often said that homeopathic physicians, too, are somewhat afraid of becoming mystical, of acquiring a reputation for mysticism. The reason for my involvement with this question is in very specific views that are absolutely based on realities. Please do not misunderstand what I am going to say here. It is necessary to speak just a bit radically in order to describe matters effectively. You see, in reality, The essence of what we are attempting in the homeopathic therapeutic process lies more in what we do to prepare the substances than in the substances themselves. How we prepare what we encounter in the form of silicic acid or carbovegetabilis, for instance, is the crucial point. 
I have studied at length what happens in the effort to prepare homeopathic remedies, which in this case certainly include the Ritter remedies, as Dr. Rasher confirms, although Miss Ritter herself does not admit this. Footnote Hans Rascher, 1880-1952, physician in Munich. Regarding Marie Ritter, see the note on page 52, lecture 4, end of footnote. <clears throat> this raises the question of what actually happens when homeopathic remedies are produced. Everything depends on their preparation, on the entire production process. What are you doing when you produce a high potency of silicic acid? You are working toward a certain point. Everything in nature is based on rhythmic processes. As you proceed along this course, working toward a certain null point, the inherent, immediately apparent effects of the substance in question come to light first. It is as if I have wealth and proceed to spend it. When I reach the null point and continue spending, what I then have is not merely no wealth at all. It goes beyond the point of being wealth and assumes the quality of debt. It is the same when I confront the material qualities of outer substances. <clears throat> if I remain within the effects of these substances, so to speak, I eventually arrive at the null point, where these effects are no longer expressed in tangible form. If I then continue, it is not the case that the effect simply disappears totally. Instead, its opposite appears and begins to be incorporated into the surrounding medium. For this reason, I always saw the opposite effects as being present in the medium in the ointment or whatever medium was used to incorporate the homeopathic pulverized substance. This medium takes on a different configuration just as I become a different person in the eyes of society when I make the transition from wealth to debt. Substance makes the transition to its opposite state and then contributes this opposite state which was formerly within it to its surroundings. In this sense I might say that while a substance possesses certain qualities, as I reduce it to ever smaller quantities, as I approach a certain null point, it acquires a different quality. The ability to radiate its former qualities into its surroundings and to correspondingly stimulate the medium with which I am treating it. This stimulation can consist in directly evoking the opposite effect described here. But it is also possible that this counter-effect is evoked only by making the substance fluorescent or phosphorescent during or after exposure to light. Then we have called forth the counter-effect in the surrounding medium. These are the circumstances that must be taken into account. For from succumbing to mysticism, the issue at hand is to finally observe nature in action for once, to truly study its rhythmic processes as they apply to the qualities of substances. This is a light motive for recognizing where the effects lie. If you potentize a substance, you will eventually reach a null point beyond which the opposite effects are present. But that is not all. <clears throat> On the route that lies beyond the null point, you can then encounter another null point that applies to these opposite effects. By passing this second point, you can achieve even higher effects that work in the direction of the initial ones, but are very different in quality. It would be a wonderful task to record the effects that result from potentization and graph them on a curve. We would discover that this graph has to be constructed in a peculiar way. We would have to begin graphing the curve, and then when we reach the point where certain lower potencies, 
which are nonetheless effective, cease to have an effect, and higher potencies begin to take effect, that is, at the second null point, we would have to continue the graph at a 90 degree angle, bringing it out into three dimensional space. These issues will be discussed further later on in these lectures. Excuse me, these issues which will be discussed further later on in these lectures are intimately connected to the human being's entire relationship to external non human nature. Considering a substance like carbo vegetabilis strictly from the point of view of what is immediately noticeable, we will say that taken in large doses, it induces a very specific disease picture, a specific symptom complex that in the view of homeopathic physicians can be counteracted with a potentization of the same substance. <clears throat> what is apparent to spiritual scientists who look at carbo vegetabilis? They are immediately directed toward non-human nature to investigate what is going on in the external world's more mineralized carbon, coal. And there we find that coal is essentially involved in the use of oxygen within the overall processes of the earth. The earth's coal or carbon content regulates the oxygen content of the earth's environment. We come to the direct insight that the earth is such, if understood as an organism, as indeed it must be, is subject to a breathing process, and that its coal or carbon content has to do with this process. Chemistry, of the kind that was asked for yesterday, will come about only when we see the existence of coal in connection with human or animal respiration. The interaction between the Earth's coal-forming process and the oxygen process in the Earth's atmosphere is underlaid by a force that, to the spiritual scientific way of looking at things, is revealed as the tendency to become animal. <clears throat> it is possible to characterize this animalizing tendency only in a somewhat surprising way. We are forced to say that something intrinsic to the external process that confronts us, the interaction between carbonization in the earth and the processes that take place around the oxygen in the earth's surroundings, calls forth beings, actual etheric beings, which in contrast to the animal kingdom constantly strive to escape from the earth. We understand the nature of the animal kingdom only when we see it as the earth's counter-response to this process that would de-animalize the earth. This counter-response then comes to light in the animalizing process. That is, this is why, when we first introduce carbo vegetabilis into the human organism, we are introducing nothing less than the principle that strives to become animal. All the symptoms that appear, from belching to bloating to foul-smelling diarrhea to hemorrhoid formation on the one hand, and burning pain of all sorts on the other, stem from the fact that animal nature, which has been externalized by humankind in its process of becoming human, has been taken back into the individual human being. This permits us to say that if human beings are given carbovegetabilis in large doses, they are challenged to defend themselves against the animalizing process that is invading them. They defend themselves by bringing into play what they owe to having externalized animal nature in the course of their evolution. The fact that we have expelled animal nature from ourselves is associated with the possibility of creating new light within our organism. You may be astonished, but this is really true. We are creators of light in the upper parts of the body, in contrast to the lower parts, where the organs that 
allow us to resist becoming completely animal are present so that we can acquire the ability to create light. This is one of the profound differences between animal beings, excuse me, between human beings and animals. <clears throat> Although the animal kingdom shares other higher spiritual processes with human beings, animals do not have the ability to generate sufficient light within themselves. At this point we come to what I might call a truly painful chapter in modern natural science. A chapter that cannot be concealed from you for the simple reason that you cannot circumvent it if your intention is to understand the connection between the human being and the external non-human world. The great obstacles to an objective grasp of how substances in general and medicinal substances in particular work in the human organism are the laws of the so-called conservation of energy and of matter. These laws, posited as universal natural laws, are nothing but an absolute contradiction of the process of human development. The entire process of digestion and nutrition is not what the materialistic way of thinking sees it to be. The materialistic viewpoint sees this entire process as the taking in of substances, let's keep carbon as our example, that were initially outside of us, after which the carbon appropriately processed is led further into the organism and then absorbed so that we continually carry within ourselves small particles of what the outer world has given us. As far as this view is concerned, there is no difference between the carbon that is outside us and the carbon we carry around in our bodies. But this is not so. The human organism has the ability to totally destroy external, non-human carbon in the lower body, to eliminate this carbon from space and use the counter-effect to simply create it anew out of nothing. This is the true fact of the matter. Within the human being is a site where substances external to the human being are created, while at the same time the possibility to destroy these substances is present. Of course, this is not conceded by a modern science that c cannot imagine the effects of substances other than in their smallest particles wandering about like Ahasuerus. Footnote, this is Ahasuerus which reigned from India even unto Ethiopia over an hundred and seven and twenty provinces. That's a quote from it's Esther chapter 1 verse 1. End of footnote. It knows nothing of the life, creation, and death of substances nor about how the death and re-enlivening of substances takes place within the human organism. The re-enlivening of carbon is connected to what we have described from a different point of view as the, quote, formation of light, close quote, in the ordinary human being. <clears throat> this internal light-forming process confronts the influx of external light. With regard to the upper part of the body, we are organized in such a way that outer light and inner light meet and interact. The most essential aspect of our organization rests on the fact that where these two forms of light are meant to work together, we are in a position to keep them apart rather than allowing them to merge, so that they influence each other but do not mingle. Wherever we confront the outer light, whether through our eyes or through our skin, a dividing wall is erected between the light that originates within us and the light that works in from outside. The light that works in from outside is significant only as a stimulus to the creation of internal light. Thus, in allowing the light from outside to flow in on us, we allow ourselves to be stimulated to create internal light. 
Now we must understand this whole process in somewhat greater depth. When we look at our internal involvement in breaking down the material aspect of carbon, we come to the human kidneys and urinary tract and to related upper parts of the body. Thus we approach the kidney process inside the human being when we consider the activity that is associated with carbon in external non-human nature. At the same time, the path to follow in using something like carbovegetabilis in the human being is pointed out to us. With regard to less serious illnesses, we realize that carbovegetabilis allows us to counteract the animalizing process in the human being that leads to nausea. The symptoms characteristic of carbovegetabilis are nausea and its extension toward the interior of the human being. The effective counter to this tendency constitutes the counteraction in the human being. That is everything related to the functioning of the kidney system. If you manage to stimulate this kidney process when you are confronted with the symptom complex that can be artificially induced by administering large doses of carbovegetabilis, that is if you manage to enhance or heighten the kidney process by administering higher potencies of carbovegetabilis, then you are working to counteract this disease process in the human being that resembles the allopathic effects of carbovegetabilis. In studying the remedy carbovegetabilis, we must understand how it relates to the entire kidney process with respect to potentization. The kidney process can also have the effect that it asserts its polar opposite in relation to digestion. That is, in cases of digestive disturbances that appear as accompanying symptoms in the disease picture of carbovegetabilis, the kidney process can assert its counter-image. <clears throat> the polar opposite of digestive disease in the gut in order to normalize these symptoms. What is going on in the case of carbovegetabilis contrasts with the formation of light. What I have now said can be summarized and understood by examining, excuse me, by imagining that this is the earth and there's a drawing and here is the surrounding air. Above the air, however, we come to something else that we can initially describe as a sort of blanket of warmth around the earth. If we are to move upward, away from the earth, we would encounter conditions of warmth that would surprise us because of how they contrast with earthly conditions of warmth. At some distance from the earth, what is inherent in the forces of warmth plays a role similar to that of the atmosphere itself below this blanket of warmth. The farthest end of this warmth effect, which we will posit as an extra telluric zone of warmth, is opposite to the zone of air. <clears throat> Here everything acts in ways that are opposite to what takes place in our atmosphere. By removing air, eliminating the existence of air, this zone emanates what comes down to us as light. It is really nonsense to believe that our earthly light comes from the sun. This is just a rather disastrous fantasy on the part of physicists and astronomers. Our earthly light comes from this upper zone. This is where light springs up. This is where it is generated. It grows there just as plants grow down here on earth. There's a diagram. In this sense we are justified in saying that the creation of new original light within human beings is due to the fact that their formative forces have preserved an internal capacity to do something that otherwise takes place only above. That is, they carry within themselves the source of an extra telluric factor. 
Admittedly, this extratuluric factor also works on human beings from outside, just as it works on the entire plant kingdom, but something inside them also shifts human beings to this upper zone. Now let us ask what happens if we move one zone closer to the earth than the air itself. Does the counterpart of this zone bring us a bit deeper into the human being? Well, you see, when we move from the airy element toward the earth element, we arrive at the fluid or watery element. We may well assume that there is a fluid zone beneath the zone of air. This also has its counterpart out in the cosmos, even higher up than the zone of light. Once again, everything in this zone is different, the polar opposite of what is going on in the fluid zone. Something grows up there, just as light grows in the preceding zone. Chemical forces grow up there and work into the earth. There's a drawing on page 165. It is nonsense to look for the driving forces behind earthly chemical effects in the substances themselves. They are not there. They come toward the earth from this zone. In this case, too, human beings contain something similar to what is up there in the cosmos. We human beings have an internal chemicator, in quotes, if I may put it like that. We incorporate an aspect of the heavenly sphere in which chemical activities originate. What works within the human being in this way is very strongly localized in the liver. Just study the very remarkable activity the liver develops within the human organism, its suction effect with regard to the constitution of the blood on the one hand, and on the other its regulatory function via the secretion of gall with regard to the production of blood serum. If you look at the extensive activity of the liver and study it thoroughly, what you find is nothing less than chemistry, real chemistry, because the reality of our external earthly chemistry cannot be found on earth at all. It must be seen as a mirror image of the external non-human sphere of chemistry that can also be studied in all the wondrous functions of the human liver. We can now move beyond carbovegetabilis and its inner properties by combining it with alkalis such as potassium, perhaps in the form of potassium carbonate, and inducing the corresponding effects in the human organism. The effect of all alkaline substances lies deeper in the interior of the organism, in the direction of the liver processes, while all effects related to carbovegetabilis tend toward the urinary tract. We will be able to perceive an absolutely clear interaction between all alkaline substances and the processes of the liver system. If we were to study the alkaline quality, we would find that it is related to the plant-forming tendency within the human being and to human externalization of the plant kingdom, just as the carbon-like quality relates to the tendency to become animal. In previous lectures, I pointed to the process of oyster shell formation as one that is important if we want to extract and separate effects within the human being from effects occurring in nature. <clears throat> Here we move from the force that results from combining carbon with potassium to the result of combining it with calcium. The interaction between carbon and calcium, however, is not the only factor at work here. It is somewhat moderated by the strong phosphorus effects that are also present in oyster shell and by yet another factor that is due to the surrounding forces of the ocean. When we observe this process of oyster shell formation, we take another step in understanding the connection between the human being and external nature. 
<laughs> if we move downward from water formation, again see the drawing, we come to earth formation or solidification. We would not be so embarrassed to speak of earth, water, fire and air if this terminology had not been scorned and fallen into disuse, and if it had not been assumed that those so-called ignorant people of antiquity were speaking about actual earth and air and so on. Surely among ourselves we can at least point out such things from time to time. But the formation of solid earth also has its counterpart in the cosmos. And this counterpart, you see, is the formation of life, the origin of vitalization. Actually, this counterpart is what is to be found in the life forces themselves. These, therefore, come from even farther away than the chemical forces and are totally killed off within the solid element in external non-human nature. I would just like to interject a related issue here because it may be of interest to some of you. Our earth would be subject to constant proliferation of life, to the constant development of carcinomas, if this proliferation of extra-telluric factors were not countered by the mercurial process, by the effects that mercury exerts on the earth. It is important to at least think about these issues for once. In oyster shell formation, what generally takes place in the formation of solid earth, which we can also call the formative element in the process of becoming substance, is held back at an earlier stage. Oyster shell is prevented from being completely subsumed by the earth-forming process only because it still has connections to the ocean, to water. It is held back and solidifies at an earlier stage in the earth-forming process. Although earthworms cannot do this because they have no shell, such effects still emanate from them. For this reason it is quite valid to state that if there were no earthworms there would be no formative forces in the earth's interior. Earthworms are significantly involved in ensuring that the earth-forming process continues. Taken as a whole, the world of the earthworms goes beyond the formation of oyster shell but has similar connections to the entire earth. Instead of going so far as to form actual shells, it gives rise to everything that comes about in cultivated soil and so on. You will naturally assume that if we look for the process that lies still deeper in the interior of the human being than the chemical process, which is associated with the liver, we will again have to come to different human organs. These organs are none other than the lungs, which must be considered from two different aspects with regard to the human organism. First, they are respiratory organs, but, just, but as strange as it may sound, this is the situation only on a superficial level. At the same time, they are also regulatory organs for the earth-forming process deep within the human being. If we move from the outside in, beginning with the digestive process and moving through the processes that form the kidneys and liver, to study the process that forms the lungs in an inner sense, that is, if we disregard them as the basis of respiratory functioning, we find that they are the opposite of the activity expressed in oyster shell formation. In its lung-forming process, the human organization has incorporated a process that lies up here, above the zone of chemistry in the external universe. References the drawing again. All you need to do is study the actual symptom complex that develops in human beings under certain circumstances as a result of calcium carbonate's influence. 
and you will find that this has very strong connections to all of the lungs' independent life processes. It is difficult, however, to separate these processes from the ones that are influenced solely by respiration. But because the lungs serve the human organization on two fronts, it is especially important to consider that they serve both external and internal functions. You must look for pulmonary degeneration in processes similar to those that appear in oyster shell formation or the like, and certainly also in the formation of snail shells, and so on. <laughs> Today, in a sense, we have taken a different perspective on a topic we have also approached yesterday. It was more possible to complete the circle yesterday than it will be today. But we will manage to achieve closure with regard to today's subject in the next few days. We have reached the point of being able to see kidney, liver, and lung activities as internal human processes that correspond to external activities of air, water, and solid earth. Air activity corresponds to everything that is associated with the renal system in the broadest sense, and especially to all urinary functions. Under certain circumstances, the system of which the kidney is the part that lies deepest in the interior can provoke shortness of breath, as can ingesting carbovegetabilis. Thus we can say that we must look to the renal system for the deeper reasons for such respiratory disturbances as shortness of breath. And we must look to the liver system for the deeper reasons for balances and imbalances related to water or the fluid element. Thirst is related to the liver system, just as the need to breathe, shortness of breath and respiratory regulation, is related to the kidney system. All thirst is related to the liver system. It would be an interesting task to study the interconnections between various human manifestations of thirst and the effects of the liver system. Similarly, the phenomenon of hunger and everything in that area are intimately related to the lungs, inner constitution and internal metabolism. In actuality, hunger, thirst, and the need to breathe are related on the tangible side to air, water, and earth. Many other things are related to their counterparts out there in the universe. Understandably enough, if we need light stimulation, because the internal factor that creates new original light is exhausted, this light stimulation is best obtained from light itself. As we see, this is a justification for therapeutic methods that use light. It is important to consider, however, that light baths are not always light baths. In reality, light baths are a more intense exposure to the zone of chemistry that we usually have as we go about our life on earth. Factors accompanying the chemistry that streams in from outside, along with the light, of course, are the effective principle behind most light baths. And directly behind these factors stand, as you can see from the diagram, again that picture on page 165, the life forces, which are also present as a consequence of allowing intensified light or intensified chemical action to work on a person. It is always a question of moderation and balance, but as long as overly strong effects are avoided, the effects of the chemical and life activities accompanying the light streaming in from the universe can be extremely beneficial. In conclusion, I would like to comment in passing that it will no longer surprise you that modern science does not succeed in achieving insight into the origin of life itself. Modern science limits its search to regions where, thanks to Mercury's influence, only the counter-image of life, death, is present. 
to find life itself, we have to look out there in places where today's scientists do not want to go. They want to avoid having anything to do with extratelluric realms, if at all possible. <clears throat> Even when scientists have been unable to avoid considering these realms, they make everything materialistic. Their hypothesis that the seeds of life are carried down to our earth from other heavenly bodies is a convenient materialistic translation of the working of life forces. Supposedly these seeds are carried down in a materialistic way by other heavenly bodies, avoiding all the obstacles, and then appear on our earth. Some people even see meteorites as the vehicles these seeds of life drive down to earth. So you see, today people can even claim to have successfully explained matters with their materialistic theory. Just as they believe they have explained everything that is observed on a macroscopic level by relegating it to the microscopic level or to the sub-microscopic level of molecules and atomic theory, they also believe that they have explained life when they have really only relegated it to someplace else. The end of lecture 11. This is a reading of the cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Introducing Anthroposophical Medicine. This is lecture 12, given in Dornach on April 1st, 1920. Reflecting on the connection which we sometimes encounter in very strange ways, between external phenomena and internal human phenomena, is fundamental to the perception of professional healers. Such reflection yields very significant intuitions with regard to the nature of therapeutic substances. To mention one example, let me remind you of how some good spirit seems to have formulated substances such as Ronsenio water or Levico water, developing them in advance in outer non-human nature under specific circumstances, expressly in order to prepare a number of forces capable of playing a beneficial role in the human organism. Footnote, Ronsenio, I'm, I'm pronouncing that Ronsenio, and it's spelled R-O-N-C-E-G-N-O, and Levico, L-E-V-I-C-O, are mineral waters from the Dolomites, limestone mountains in northern Italy. End of footnote. During the next few days, we will characterize such matters thoroughly. If we think about how wonderfully the two forces of copper and of iron offset each other in this water, and about how arsenic is also present to provide a broader basis for this interaction, we realize that something is being prepared in the outer world with specific regard to certain conditions in the human being. It is absolutely possible for such things to have extremely unfavorable effects on some individuals but even the negative instances demonstrate the general fruitfulness of the overall principle. It is especially important to point this out whenever such things are talked about today, because reflecting on them makes it possible to combat certain illnesses whose symptoms are only now appearing. Let us not forget that truly unbiased observers are beginning to realize from all sides that very specific circumstances are now spreading over parts of the globe and evoking very specific forms of human illness. We must also not forget another intriguing modern phenomenon, namely a very peculiar characteristic of even a condition like ordinary influenza in its modern manifestation. <laughs> it wakens dormant illnesses, illnesses to which the organism is predisposed, but that otherwise remain hidden by the organism's counteractive forces. Under certain circumstances, these illnesses might even remain dormant until the death of the person in question, but they are uncovered in some way 
because the person comes down with the flu. All of this adds up to a cluster of questions that I will use as the basis of these lectures for the next few days. In order to get off to a productive start, I would like to mention another remarkable concordance whose entire profound significance can become apparent only to spiritual scientists. <laughs> as you know, oxygen and nitrogen are loosely bound to each other in our atmosphere in a way that cannot be properly explained physically or chemically, as it were. As human beings, as earthly human beings, we are totally enmeshed in the activity that emanates from oxygen and nitrogen. From the very beginning, therefore, we can suspect that the fundamental proportion of oxygen to nitrogen is important. The important thing that spiritual science shows us is that human sleep disturbances are linked to any change in air composition that tends to alter one way or another the usual proportion of oxygen to nitrogen. This phenomenon leads us to investigate the underlying relationship more exactly. As you know, spiritual science prompts us to say that the human being consists of four members, the physical, etheric, and astral bodies, and the capital I. You also know that the phenomena compel us to say that on the level of dynamics, at least, the eye and astral body leave when a person goes to sleep, and they move back in when the person awakes. <clears throat> we must realize that in the sleeping state, the astral body remains bound to the eye and the etheric body to the physical body. Therefore, during the waking state, we see that the astral body and I are related to the etheric and physical bodies more loosely than either the I and the astral body or the etheric body and the physical body. This looser internal relationship within the human being between the upper principles, I and astral body, and the lower, etheric and physical bodies, truly reflects the loose relationship between oxygen and nitrogen in external air. The correspondence is remarkable. Because of how the outer composition of air is fixed, it also provides a gauge for the relative connectedness of the astral body and the etheric body, or of the physical body and the eye. This correspondence also makes us aware of how we must relate to the air's composition. We must pay attention to whether we are in a position to supply people with air of the appropriate composition or whether they must do without. At this point, however, you can delve still deeper into physiology and perceive this correspondence. If you go through all the known substances that fulfill some function in the human organism, you will discover that they are all bound up with other substances in the human organism, generally in the form of compounds and solutions. The only elements that exist in a free state within the human organism are oxygen and nitrogen. Therefore, the constituents of external air play a very specific role in the human organism itself. The interrelationship between oxygen and nitrogen is absolutely central to the material aspect of the human being. Oxygen and nitrogen play a specific part in human bodily functions as the only substances that work in their free state, not allowing their effects to be modified by being bound up with other substances in their sphere within the human organism. <coughs> this shows you that what we can trace extending from external nature into the human organism is not the only important thing. We must also trace the how, whether the effects of the substance in question remain free or are linked to those of others. The strange thing is that substances develop specific affinities and relationships to each other 
within the human organism. If we introduce one substance when another one is already present in the human organism, such an affinity or relationship can appear. If you pursue this thought further, it leads to a very specific intuition that spiritual science needs to point out. You know that proteins form the basis of plant, animal and human organisms, and that in the sense of modern chemistry, the chief constituents of protein are the four most important substances in nature, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen and hydrogen, with the addition of sulfur, which homeopathically pervades what the other four substances do. We need to come to an idea of how proteins actually function internally. The modern science of chemistry tends to assume that the configuration of such a substance is imposed by its intrinsic forces. The inevitable consequence of this assumption is that substances are described as identical when they are not, or at least not to the extent that we imagine. Whenever any difference at all is acknowledged, equating the two substances is not justified. Seeing plant protein and animal protein as similar, as chemically identical to a certain extent, is only a consequence of this atomistic way of thinking about the structure of protein and is totally unjustified. If we observe the human organism more precisely, it becomes apparent that plant protein neutralizes animal protein and especially human protein. These two proteins stand in a polar relationship to each other in that the one cancels out the effects of the other on an intimate level. This is the strange phenomenon that we must acknowledge. The functions of animal protein are such that they are diminished or negated, either partly or wholly, by the functions of the plant protein. This leads us to ask what the difference is between a substance of this sort as it occurs in the animal or human organism and in the plant organism. You see, in the past few days I have spoken about the important role played by the organ systems the kidney urinary, the liver, and the pulmonary systems, with regard to meteorology, to the supra-earthly factor. To these I added the cardiac system. These four organ systems play a crucial role in the human being's relationship to meteorology, to what is outside. What do they actually signify from a more intimate perspective? These four organ systems are nothing less than the creators of the structure of human protein. They are what we need to study, not protein's molecular or atomic forces. When we wonder why protein is the way it is, we must understand it as being internally built up as a result of the emanations of these four organ systems. Protein is a consequence of their interactions. This also says something about the internalization of external effects in the human being. What modern chemistry seeks in the structure of substances themselves must be attributed to organ systems. The structure of human protein cannot be imagined to exist out in our earthly surroundings. When it is not under the influence of these four organ systems, this structure cannot persist and absolutely has to change. And again, let me read these again. There's a, there's a diagram here. The four organ systems he's talking about, one is the kidney urinary system, another is the liver system, another is the heart system, and the last one is the lung system. End of my aside. <clears throat> it is different with plant protein. Although plant protein at least appears uninfluenced by such organ systems, it is subject to other influences. It is under the influence of oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen and carbon, and of whatever else is present in the external meteorology of nature as a whole, 
and also to the influence of the sulfur that mediates their functions. In plant protein, these four substances that are dispersed in the atmosphere give rise to what is brought about in the human being by the heart, the lungs, the liver, and so on. <clears throat> in outer non-human nature, these four substances contain the formative forces that are individualized and contained by the four organ systems within the human being. When we say the names oxygen, hydrogen, and so on, it is important to think of these so-called substances not only in terms of the intrinsic forces modern chemistry speaks of, but also in terms of formative effects that always have relationships to one another inasmuch as they contribute to the earth's repertoire of substances. If we go into detail and associate these substances with the corresponding internal organs, we must equate what oxygen does in the outer world with the renal urinary system. We must equate the formative forces that carbon develops on the outside with the lung system, that is, with the lung's own formative forces rather than the pulmonary system as a system of respiration. We must equate nitrogen with the liver system and hydrogen with the cardiac system. External hydrogen is the heart of the external world, while nitrogen is the external world's liver, and so on. It would be desirable for modern humanity to take the initiative to work out these matters instead of merely being persuaded to acknowledge them. You see, if we consider the cardiac system's relationship to the formative forces of hydrogen, we will immediately recognize the importance of hydrogen activity as such for the entire upper region of the human being. Hydrogen's development in the direction of the upper part of the human being is accompanied by the transformation of the more animal aspect down below into something human, something that moves in the direction of concepts, and so on. In a previous lecture I told you that, the, that we encounter an influence that is supra-earthly, and it was identified as lead. You recall how we described lead, tin, and iron as forces having to do with the upper part of the human being. As yet there is no great tendency today to acknowledge such connections. There is no great tendency to move outward from the human being, to see lead's effects as particularly related to the phenomenon that the human heart prepares hydrogen, which in turn becomes the vehicle for preparing our thinking apparatus. The unconscious progress of human evolution coerces human beings into acknowledging this fact, although I do not mean this in the sense of propagandizing. Now that science has confirmed that lead, along with helium, is a byproduct of the disintegration of radium, it can no longer be denied that lead plays a role of some sort in external non-human nature, even if we consider it only with regard to its functions. The lead that has been found in this context, although its so-called atomic weight is not quite right, is nonetheless considered lead. Tin and iron will also be found under similar circumstances. These are substances that are external to the human being, but are simultaneously uniquely involved in human nature. I think we should not simply allow ourselves to be coerced by such phenomena as radiology, which is actually a wonderful hint that if we go out into the non-human world, we may discover not crudely material metals, but the metal forces that are working in from above the earth. This is something that needs to be said today, because the appearance of new modern types of illnesses will make us realize that we absolutely must take such matters into account. At this point, we must be particularly interested in the fact 
that the interaction of external carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, which is mediated by sulfur, is taken over internally and individualized by the four human organ systems. If you reflect on a matter such as this correctly, you will perceive the depth with which it is possible to see into the human being when considered this way. It will no longer seem miraculous when involuntary human processes, ones that do not initially seem to be immediately subject to our mental functions, are viewed in relation to the whole of external non-human nature. Here again, it is true that each of these four human systems has the tendency to, quote-unquote, become the entire human being. Take the renal system as an example. <clears throat> I might say that the kidney, with its functions, attempts to become the entire human being, as do the heart, the liver system, and the pulmonary system. It is important to convince ourselves of the questions that come into consideration here by using our own eyes, or rather our own sensations, to discover how we can observe certain external effects within ourselves. It is almost impossible to avoid pointing out a clear-cut boundary between natural science and spiritual science in this regard. In reality, you see, as you make progress in your meditative life as medical practitioners, as you understand more and more how to achieve harmony with a meditative life, so that you feel yourself to be a meditator, you will increasingly acquire concrete self-knowledge of a sort that is truly not to be scorned when we are dealing with positive tasks in life, such as healing. As you make progress in meditation, you will notice that you become conscious of things in your own organism that were formerly totally unconscious. By simply taking into account what rises to consciousness, you become aware of something that is still difficult to speak about in lectures to the public or to lay audiences because of a very distinct inclination that emerges in that context. Given the present-day moral constitution of humanity, if we were to talk about such matters, and I am now drawing your attention to one of the elementary ones, and communicate them to wider circles, the following questions would immediately arise. Why don't we take advantage of that? Why should I meditate if I can achieve the same result more easily by simply swallowing sub -subst some substance or other? It is more comfortable to take a remedy instead of meditating. In some respects, people who do, who do this destroy themselves morally. Given the present-day moral constitution of humanity, people would be relentless. You will soon see what I mean. Instead of meditating, they would prefer to take an external agent that would help them take the first steps toward a result similar to that of meditation. <clears throat> it is really possible for this to happen. You see, if you continue meditating for a certain period of time and are inclined to take such phenomena into account, you will become aware of the radiating effects of iron in the same way that you are aware of having hands that allow you to pick things up and feet that allow you to walk. It really is true that being conscious of the effect of iron appears in the same way as the consciousness that you have arms and legs or a head that you can turn. What appears is the consciousness of feeling yourself as an iron phantom. I mean that people would come along and say that it is possible to heighten your sensitivity to the iron within you by external means, by means of something you ingest, in order to get the effect of meditation. With regard to certain steps, this is absolutely correct. But then the danger would be that people begin simply experimenting in this way in order to find an easy way to become clairvoyant. These things have often been done. 
It is different if they are done out of a spirit of sacrifice for humanity. But if they are done out of curiosity, they destroy the moral constitution of the human soul from the ground up. One man who performed a great many such experiments on himself was Van Helmont. This was how he discovered much of what you can now read in his writings. In the case of Paracelsus, you have the feeling that his insights arose in him atavistically from within, that he carried them into this world from a super-earthly super world, while Van Helmont always acquired his strange insights by ingesting some substance or other. Footnote Van Helmont and Paracelsus, see footnote lecture 1, page 6, end of footnote. This is evident from how he presents his findings, and I believe he also says so quite clearly in certain places. Inner sensitivity to the radiant effects of iron is as close as we can come to the characteristic effect that bears witness to a radiating force that proceeds outward from the upper part of the human being, branching out into all the limbs. We gain a clear perception, and I use this word deliberately, that we are dealing with the iron inside us, or rather with its functions and forces. If I represent this iron radiation schematically, I must also mention, at the same time, that as such it has no ability to work beyond the human organism. We always have the feeling that what is radiating outward is localized within the human organism and remains within it. Some counteracting force, something that arrests these iron radiating forces, is omnipresent. See Steiner's blackboard drawing on the following page. We might say that it is as if the iron radiates out toward the periphery and something radiates back toward it in the form of spherical waves. These are the two effects we perceive, the radiating element and its collision with something impenetrable that does not permit it to go beyond the body's surface. We gradually notice that the opposing radiation is the force of protein. This means that iron introduces a functional connection that works against everything emanating from the four organ systems I mentioned earlier. These forces counteract each other. This battle, which is constant in the organism, is the first thing that can be sensed by means of inner perception. If we move on to study human spiritual history, we will clearly note that the medicine of Hippocrates and even that of Galen worked with remnants of inner observations of this sort. Galen himself was no longer able to perceive much, but he recorded all kinds of traditions that came down from earlier times. Anyone who can read Galen in the right way will probably find that a great deal of ancient atavistic medicine, which began to decline in the time of Hippocrates, is still illuminated in Galen's works, which is why they contain so many important views on natural healing processes. If we pursue such concerns, we will inevitably come to this polarity in the entire human organism between iron radiations and the influences that block them. It is important to look at these questions because everything that tends to form protein in the way I described always has to do with the blocking effects, while everything metallic that is introduced into the human organism has to do with the radiating effects. Admittedly, there are significant, extraordinarily characteristic exceptions to this rule, but here, too, these very exceptions allow us to look deeply into the strange interaction of the forces that assert themselves within the human organism but come from all points of the universe. <laughs> In order to do so, some things that I have already pointed out, the details of which you can then develop in your own thinking, need to be taken a bit further. For example, I need only mention that the carbon in plants, we can see this in Carbo vegetabilis, which we looked at yesterday, 
lacks an element that animal carbon generally possesses, namely a certain nitrogen content. This accounts for the very different behavior of animal carbon and plant carbon when they are burned. It also accounts for the tendency of animal carbon to play a part in the production of such substances as bile or mucus or even fat itself. The differences we see here between animal and plant carbon lead us to look at how metals, as opposed to non-metals, work in the human organism. I call this radiation and what arrests radiation. When we look at this polar interaction, we come to very important matters. You see, in the course of explaining spiritual science, I have often emphasized that human beings go through various periods in life, the period of childhood until the second dentition, the period from the second dentition until puberty, and the third period, which lasts until the early twenties. In reality, these periods of life are connected to processes intrinsic to the human organism. I have often characterized the first period, which concludes with the second dentition, as a process of self-limitation that focuses the entire human organism on separating out and incorporating its solid scaffolding. This process culminates in the emergence of new teeth from this human scaffolding. Obviously, bursting forth into solid form in this way must have to do with the overall development of the human form, especially its development toward the periphery. <coughs> it is well worth noting that two substances that are otherwise not given their due in the human organism, namely fluorine and magnesium, are intimately involved in everything that is taking place here. Fluorine and magnesium are present in dilute form in the human organism and play prominent roles in the process in childhood that leads up to the second dentition. In terms of incorporating solidity into the human organism, what happens here is a constant interaction between the forces of magnesium and the forces of fluorine with fluorine assuming the role of sculptor in the human being, rounding off and arresting the radiating element, while the magnesium forces ray outward, organizing fiber bundles and the like, so that calcium can infiltrate them. To say that a tooth comes about simply because fluorine, the sculptor, shapes it with regard to its size, cement and enamel, while magnesium pours in the substance that is to be sculpted, is not nonsense, but is dramatically in line with what happens in nature. This is why it is so very important to maintain a balance between magnesium intake and fluorine intake in earliest childhood. You will always find that the teeth decay early if this balance is not properly established. We need to begin observing the child's dental development as soon as the first tooth appears, appears to see whether the enamel is underdeveloped or whether the teeth tend to be small. Through appropriate diet, we must make sure to counteract any incipient problem by supplying the appropriate compounds of either fluorine or magnesium. We will have to speak about these things in more detail. But for now, I would like to approach the subject in concentric circles. This allows us to see into the process of human development, where we discover this interaction between magnesium and fluorine. It is characteristic of the substance fluorine to be markedly external to the human being during the first years of life, because in these early years, the human being really belongs to the outer world to a great extent. <clears throat> fluorine is taken from the world, external to the human being, from the external principle that counteracts the radiant effect of metal. Similarly, if you take the third period of human life, it is very important to bring about the right balance between iron and protein, or protein formation. If the right balance is not achieved, 
and no strongly corrective developments emerge to offset the lack of balance between protein and iron, we confront all the outer symptoms of anemia. It is important that we not look at the developing human being only in a crude way, noting phenomena such as tooth decay, for which the groundwork was laid at an earlier age, or looking at anemia only from the modern chemical perspective. We must delve into the entire mystery of the human organism if we want to understand anything of what appears in an individual who is ill. You all know, more or less, which metals play a part in building up the human organism internally. With the exception of iron, the metals that I described to you as the most important in a certain connection, lead, tin, copper, mercury, silver, gold, and iron, are not involved. With the exception of iron, as I said, they have no direct effect on the overall functioning of the human organism. But this does not mean that they are any the less active in the human being. If we trace the substance that is most involved in developing what is located near the periphery of the human organism, <coughs> we find that it is silicon. I have already spoken about this. But the processes going on in the human being are not simply contained within the skin. The human being is also enmeshed in universal processes. Just as the substances you know of are significant within the human organism, the metals I have just listed are significant outside the human organism, but work into it. <clears throat> Iron alone plays the role of mediator between what lies within a human being's skin and what lies outside it. We can say that the entire system that appears in the pulmonary human being, which as you know attempts to become a whole human being, is strongly connected to our entire relationship to the life of nature in the universe. We must realize that we take only one part of the human being into account if we consider anatomy alone. This is not the entire human being. It is simply that aspect that counteracts the external principle consisting of the effects of lead, tin, copper, and so on, effects that are external to the human individual. It is never permissible to restrict the human being to what is inside the skin, not even when we are simply considering the human organization in a natural scientific sense. As we can see, it is not simply a question of effects that make their way from within outward. We must also take into account <clears throat> the effects that provide some sort of direction for human organic processes. What follows will demonstrate that this is a very significant consideration. You know that certain substances take effect in the human organism simply because they are bound to alkalis or acids or because they appear in a neutral form, as is said in science, as salts. But the relationship of bases to acids as polar opposite systems of forces that enter a neutral state of sorts in salts does not cover this subject in its entirety. We must also take into account the relationship of the acid-base-salt trinity to the overall direction of human organ forces. We will find that all alkalis tend to support processes that begin in the mouth and continue in digestion, working from front to back. Similarly, all other processes that run from front to back also have a role, have such a role. Bases have to do with the front to back direction, while acids have to do with the reverse. Only when we look at the contrast between the front and back of the human being do we arrive at the contrast between bases and acids. The salt-like principle relates to these two as if it were directed downward toward the earth, standing vertically on both. Salt 
throws itself into all processes that work from above to what lies below. For this reason we must absolutely take these three directions into account in considering how the human being fits into the alkaline, acidic and salty elements. These directional forces are another example of how observing the human being bridges the gap between the purely external chemistry of metals and human physiology. Here you also have the entire relationship of the salt-like element to the earth and the phenomena of bases and acids. Schematically it could be drawn something like this. If this is the earth here, and there's a blackboard sketch on page 181, the salt-like element tends toward the earth, while bases and acids tend to move around the earth in circles. This in turn suggests that simply by becoming familiar with the directions of functions in the organism, we are then able to intervene in these directions. In this case, external remedies such as ointments and salves, everything that works externally, are crucial. At this point we must also study the direction of external effects. Under certain circumstances, the extractive effect of a mustard plaster or the effect of a metal ointment, suitably prepared of course, can be just as important for the organism as any internal treatment. As will be clear to you from what I just said, we must simply know how we should use it, because it does make a difference whether we apply a past plaster to one part of the body or another in a particular situation. It is essential to evoke the effect that counters a damaging force by applying the plaster to the right part of the body. Simply placing it on the painful or otherwise irritated spot is not always the right thing to do. The end of Lecture 12 This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Introducing Anthroposophical Medicine. This is Lecture 13 given in Dornach on April 2nd, 1920. Especially with regard to three sets of facts that we must now begin to discuss, the more materialistic trend in medicine may possibly begin to turn toward our spiritual scientifically oriented school of thought. This will, most probably, be the case with our observations of everything involved in tumor formation and possible cures for cancer, a truly rational view of so-called mental illnesses, and our knowledge of the therapeutic use of external remedies, liniments, ointments, and the like. We can scarcely hope that conventional physical examinations, unguided by spiritual scientific insights, will suffice to approach subjects such as the development of growths that culminate in carcinomas. Connections are omnipresent in the natural world, and today's psychiatry is in such a sorry state because there is no human conscious connection between it and conventional pathology and therapy, two fields that are perhaps the most receptive to spiritual scientific viewpoints. It will be ne especially necessary to consider everything spiritual science can say about these topics. Today all that is needed is to consider my writings. You will find that they have already said quite a lot in this regard. We need to take into account all aspects of the etheric body's intervention in the human organism. It should not be said that clairvoyance is absolutely necessary in order to be able to talk about the etheric body's activity in the human organism, because a great many processes that simply oppose the etheric body's activities demonstrate that the etheric body is not active, or at least not properly active, in a specific way. To come to valid ideas on this subject, we will need to look at inflammations and their consequences as well as at tumor development as a starting point for the destruction of the human organism, so to speak. 
In the case of tumor development, very justifiable attempts are now being made to avoid surgery. Because of social circumstances that will need to be changed, not outer conditions, but social circumstances in which medicine plays a part, namely issues of public hygiene, this very justified ideal cannot always be implemented. The important point here is to create a substitute for what the surgeon's knife does or does not accomplish, and it certainly is effective in some respects but fails to accomplish anything in others. There are, undoubtedly, many people who advocate surgery today simply because they have no way of knowing about anything else, but who will immediately take the opposite approach as soon as information becomes available. You do not need me to describe the character of inflammatory processes in their various specific forms, organ by organ. I am sure this is well known. But what is not so well known is the overriding process common to all inflammatory processes. This common process can best be characterized by saying that in every true inflammation, whether very large or very small, and in everything that can lead from inflammation to ulceration, spiritual scientific investigation will reveal that the human etheric body as a whole is still functioning. This means that we can count on being able to do something to normalize and redistribute the etheric body's effect, which has become sluggish in a single direction, so that the person's entire etheric body will then work in a healthy way. In inflammations, the etheric body's activity is guided only in specific directions, whereas the activity of a healthy etheric body extends into the organism in all the appropriate directions. In essence, we can say that if the etheric body as a whole is still healthy but has become sluggish with regard to a particular organ system, we will be able to discover agents, which we will discuss later, that are capable of stimulating it to develop its universal activity, if I may call it that, in this specific direction. It is different in tumor formations of any sort. In this case, certain processes in the physical body function directly as enemies of the etheric body's activity. These processes in the physical body simply rebel against the etheric body's activity. <clears throat> as a consequence, the etheric body is no longer effective in these areas of the physical body. The etheric body, however, has a great capacity for regeneration and spiritual scientific observation shows that if we can remove the obstruction and overcome the enemy that counteracts the etheric body's activity in a certain area, we will indeed be able to deal with the problem. With tumors, then, it is a matter of using natural processes to stimulate the removal of the physical processes opposing the etheric body so that it can once again work in a spot its effects formerly could not reach. This will become very important in the treatment of carcinomas. If carcinomas are observed objectively, it is quite evident that in spite of their many different forms, they all constitute a revolt on the part of certain physical forces against the forces of the etheric body. The cornification, C-O-R-N-I-F-I-C-A-T-I-O-N, cornification, that typically appears in internal carcinomas and is less prominent in carcinomas located nearer the surface, although the tendency persists, shows us that a physical formative process has overcome the etheric formative process that should be present at that particular spot. A careful study of these two phenomena, inflammation and ulceration on the one hand and tumor formation on the other, eventually makes it obvious that they are true polar opposites. Having said that this is obvious, 
Let, let me also ask you to recall your experience of carcinomas located close to the surface. What happens in such cases can frequently be confused with pseudo-abscesses, at least in certain respects. Above all, therefore, it will be important to study this polarity more precisely. Medical nomenclature, that is, at least medieval, if not exactly ancient, is often very disturbing in such instances. I am not referring to the historical medieval period, but to the Middle Ages of nomenclature that lie in the quite recent past. It is not totally correct to describe tumors as neoplasms. There is nothing new about them except, in the very trivial sense, of not having been there before. They are not new in the sense of growing out of the ground of the skin-enclosed organism of their own accord. They come about because the physical body opposes the etheric body so strongly that the outer body aligns itself with aspects of outer nature that are inimical to the human being. Tumor development offers easy access to all sorts of outer influences. <coughs> Here again, it is important to study the image that contrasts with all these processes. Let me point you first in the direction of studying the development of viscum, mistletoe, in outer nature. Although we do initially need to pay attention to how viscum species develop on other plants, this is not the most important consideration. The parasitic nature of mistletoe is certainly the most important consideration for botany, but as far as our study of the connection between outer non-human nature and the human being is concerned, a much more important consideration is that mistletoe, because it grows on other plants, on trees, is forced to carry out its vegetative growth in a different annual rhythm. For example, it has already done flowering before the tree it grows on, trees it grows on have begun putting out leaves in spring. It is a winter plant and rather aristocratic in its behavior. It uses the foliage of its host trees to protect it from the intense light of summer and does not expose itself to the most intense rays of the sun. In line with the processes we described the day before yesterday, we must always see the sun simply as a representative of the effects of light, but this would need to be studied in the context of physics and does not belong in this discussion. We cannot completely avoid what has crept into our language as a result of somewhat inaccurate observations of nature. Mistletoe's whole way of growing and thriving by attaching itself to other plants is especially important because it allows this plant to acquire very specific forces that can be described more or less as follows. Thanks to the forces it acquires, it rejects the intentions of organizational forces that develop in a straight line and demands their opposite. Here, too, the situation will become clear only when we understand it in the following way. Here is a schematic representation, there's a blackboard drawing on page 190, of a spot in the human body that uses its own forces to revolt against all the etheric forces working into it. The etheric forces are backed up and brought to a standstill, and as a result something that looks like a new growth comes about. Mistletoe is a remedy that counteracts the etheric pocket that has formed there. It pulls the etheric forces back into this spot where they did not want to go. You could verify this situation yourself through observation if you ever had a, have a coincidental opportunity to observe the effect of mistletoe on the expulsion of the placenta. In this case, you would be able to study mistletoe's tendency to oppose straight-line organization. Mistletoe causes the placenta to be retained in the human organism. That is, in its own way, it does the opposite of straight-line organization. The ability to cause retention of the placenta 
that is, to bring the usual organizational process to a standstill, is one of the most important characteristics of mistletoe's effective processes. Of course, in the case of more subtle activities in the human organism that have the same basis as placental retention, this effect is much less readily apparent. But the same force that is strongly active when mistletoe counteracts the straight-line organizational tendency also confronts us in any other images we get of mistletoe's effect. Having noticed that mistletoe counters the etheric body's failure to take hold of the physical body to the right extent, if we then induce a specific mistletoe effect, the etheric body may take hold of the physical body too strongly, resulting in convulsions. In other cases, the effects of mistletoe can cause the peculiar sensation of being in constant danger of falling over. These consequences are also related to the fact that mistletoe essentially promotes pollution, for example. You can see in every instance even in connection with the development of epilepsy, for example, that mistletoe has the capacity of opposing the human organism. This ability has less to do with the fact that it is a parasite, however, than with the fact that it allows nature to give it a free helping of sausage, to use an expression that at least the Viennese among you will understand. It is granted a special favor, an exception to the rule, in that it refuses to thrive in the usual season, to flower in the spring and then bear fruit. Instead, it does these things in a different season, during the winter. By doing so, it retains forces that then counteract the normal course of events. If it is not too offensive, we may say that if we look at how nature behaves in the development of mistletoe, nature seems to have gone crazy. It does everything at the wrong time when it comes to mistletoe. This behavior, however, is exactly what we will put to use when the human organism goes physically crazy, which is what happens in the development of carcinomas. The point is to develop an understanding of such relationships. There can be no doubt that mistletoe is the substance that, if potentized, will allow us to replace the surgeon's knife in treating tumors. <clears throat> it is only a question of handling mistletoe fruit in the right way. But in connection with other forces in mistletoe itself, of course, so as to turn it into a remedy. Mistletoe's craziness is also evident in the fact that its continued existence and reproduction are always dependent on being moved from place to place by birds. Mistletoe would surely die out if birds did not repeatedly carry its means of reproduction from one tree to another. Curiously enough, its reproductive structures also choose to pass through the birds themselves, in that they are first taken into the birds' bodies and later evacuated so that they can sprout on another tree. All these findings if observed objectively, lead to insight into mistletoe's entire process of development. The gluey substance in mistletoe in particular needs to be brought into the right connection with a triturating agent so as to gradually produce a very high potency of the substance. Next, this substance needs to be specially adapted to different organs. I will go into detail later. In part, by considering the origin of the mistletoe, the specifically what kind of a tree it grew on. But it will also be important to produce remedies that are based on the interaction of this gluey substance with specific metallic substances, which can even be derived from the metal content of other plants. For example, the interaction that comes about by combining and potentizing mistletoe from apple trees with silver salts will result in a remedy that can be highly effective against all abdominal, abdominal cancers. You must understand that I need to speak cautiously about these subjects 
because although the basic thrust of what I am saying is absolutely correct and well-founded in spiritual scientific research, actual therapeutic measures depend totally on how mistletoe's constituents are processed, and the knowledge needed to produce such remedies is scarcely available yet. At this point, of course, spiritual science would be able to work favorably only when it could actually constantly collaborate with the clinical process that is the basis of so much of what other physicians do. This is what makes the relationship between spiritual science and medicine so difficult. These two approaches, the opportunity for clinical observation and spiritual scientific research, must still remain separated because of modern social conventions. It will become evident that we will get nowhere unless these two paths are brought together. The important point will be to gather empirical evidence, because the only way you will be able to impress the outer world is if you can at least supply verification in the form of outer clinical reports and so on. The need for these proofs is more an outer than an inner one. <clears throat> if we simply proceed methodically, we will be able to prove that the effect of mistletoe really is based on what I have just explained. According to what I said here a few days ago, tree trunks are more like outgrowths of soil substance, little hills in which the vegetative aspect is still present and which support the growth of everything else that belongs to the tree. When mistletoe also grows there, its roots grow toward the ground as it makes itself at home up there in the tree. Thus it is to be expected that if we conduct experiments with plants that have the same crazy aristocratic attitude as mistletoe but lack its bohemian parasitic quality, we will see similar characteristics, and this is indeed the case. If we begin to investigate winter plants with regard to their tendency to counteract normal tendencies of the human organism, and specifically normal tendencies to develop illnesses, we can expect that plants that find it appropriate to put forth flowers in winter will all have similar effects. For example, if we simply extend our experiments to include Helleborus niger, the common Christmas rose, we will find that it induces similar effects. We must take into account, however, the contrast between male and female that I have at least begun to characterize. With Helleborus niger, we can hardly expect to achieve clearly visible results in women, but results will be perceptible in cases of tumor development in men if we use a similar processing method but produce a higher potency than the one I indicated in the case of viscum. If we work in this way, we must consider relationships of this sort, whether a plant thrives in winter or summer, whether it derives its effect from behaving like mistletoe, or whether it is more inclined toward the earth. Mistletoe does not like to be close to the earth, but black hellebora or Christmas rose does, and is therefore more closely related to the male system of forces which in turn is more closely related to earthly factors, as I explained a few days ago. The female system of forces is, instead, more closely connected to supra-earthly factors. These differences absolutely must be taken into account. It will prove especially important to acquire a certain insight into the processes of nature. This is why, in the attempt to illustrate the forces in the outer world, I turned to concepts of character such as bohemian, aristocratic, and crazy, which can serve us very well and are not at all inadequate with respect to what we are considering, to show what these forces are like. Having acquired such concepts, we will then encounter the characteristic difference between a remedy's external and internal effects. But before we take this difference into account, we must also look at ideas that can introduce it in the right way. 
For example, there is one thing that absolutely must be studied with regard to certain illnesses that are now appearing. In the case of these new types of illness, which I pointed out yesterday, we will have to study what happens, for example, when we expose carbo vegetabilis to marsh gas for some time, simply by leaving it lying in the gas. We proceed with trituration only after the carbon is sufficiently impregnated with gas. The result will be externally effective in some way, in the form of ointments and the like, especially if the trituration is performed in conjunction with substances that can enhance the effect further. It is simply a question of discovering the right technique. If triturated with talc, for example, according to certain technical methods that we will certainly be able to ascertain, the resulting remedy will be very effective if used externally in the form of ointments and the like. The important thing for us now, however, is to understand such a process. We will not understand it if we do not first sharpen our vision by learning healthy thinking with regard to psychiatry. Please believe me that spiritual scientists are actually angered, if I may express myself drastically, by the use of the German word Geisteskrankheit, spirit illness, for psychiatric illness. It is ridiculous to use this term, because the spirit is always healthy and incapable of falling ill. What happens is that the spirit's ability to express itself is disturbed by the physical organism. There is never any real illness in the life of the spirit or soul. Symptoms appear, but that is all. Now, however, we must sharpen our vision for concrete individual symptoms. Perhaps you will see the first indications and then the further development of something like religious mania. As you know, these terms are not all precise because the nomenclature in this field is extremely confused. Nevertheless, we do need to use these words. All this, of course, is merely symptomatic. But assuming that something like this develops, the important point will be to gain a picture of its entire process of development. Once we have acquired this picture, however, and encounter an individual with this symptomatology, we will have to look carefully at any abnormalities in the process of lung formation, not in the respiratory process, but in the lung's formative process, in pulmonary metabolism. You see, the term brain disease is also not totally correct. If the term Geisteskrankheit is completely false, then brain disease is actually half false, because any degeneration in the brain is always secondary. The primary factor in all illnesses never lies in the upper part of the body, but always in the lower part, in the organs belonging to the four systems of the liver, kidneys, heart and lungs. In the case of someone who is losing interest in outer life and beginning to brood and act out delusions, the most important concern is always to get an idea of the constitution of this person's pulmonary process. This is extremely important. Similarly, if we observe someone in whom obstinacy, pig-headedness and self-righteousness appear, indicating a certain immobility or rigidity in thinking, this should lead us to investigate the status of liver function in the person in question. In such people, it is always the inner organic chemistry that is not functioning properly. Even what we have become accustomed to calling softening of the brain, in common parlance, is entirely secondary. The primary factor in psychiatric disorders even if, it it, even if it is sometimes more difficult to observe, always lies in the lower organ systems. This accounts for the often dishearteningly low rate of success of psychotherapy. In fact, psychotherapy can accomplish more in the case of organic diseases than it can in so-called psychi psychiatric disorders. We will have to get used to treating psych psychiatric disorders with medications. This is crucial, 
and it is the second of two areas in which outer trends in medicine will have to find a way to approach spiritual science. In this area, well-trained psychologists will always prove to be the best observers. An extraordinary amount lies hidden in our psychological life, with all its great variety and its frequently merely suggestive effects. We will, gradually, have to achieve a real capacity for observation in this field. It is not true that human beings are simple or simply constituted in terms of their abilities, by which I also mean the capabilities of the bodily state of organization, which is the tool of a person's spiritual organization. Let me give an example. Strange as it may sound, it is absolutely possible for someone we are obliged to describe as an idiot, as a feeble-minded person, to have abilities that allow him or her to come up with comments that are witty and brilliant. This is truly possible because feeble-mindedness can make a person very open to suggestion, very receptive to reflecting the mysterious influences of his or her surroundings. There are very interesting observations to be made in the field of pathological cultural history. We must not name names in reporting the results of such such observations which would detract from their credibility. It is not right to name names, but it is an idiosyncrasy of the field of journalism in particular, that people with feeble minds can become good journalists because their slow wit puts them in a position to reflect the opinion of the times rather than giving their own obstinate views. For example, dull-witted journalists reflect the opinion of the times to such an extent that their accounts are much more interesting than those of self-possessed, strong-minded journalists. We learn much more about what humanity as a whole is thinking from weak-minded journalists than from strong-minded ones, who are always intent on developing opinions of their own. This is an extreme case, but it occurs over and over again. It is the ultimate disguise of the actual state of affairs. We fail to notice the presence of feeble-mindedness because its initial manifestation can be quite brilliant. In everyday life, such a circumstance doesn't make much difference. Ultimately, no harm is done if our newspapers are written by the feeble-minded, as long as they present only good things. In extreme cases, however, where the limit is reached and this tendency develops into a form of illness, we need to acquire a very unbiased eye for observing the soul conditions of people who then fall into the domain of psychiatry. Since we will not always be able to judge by the disguises their soul activity has assumed, we will have to make our assessments on the basis of deeper lying symptoms. We must always realize that it is easiest of all to succumb to error when we are observing psychological states because the most important question is not whether the person expresses intelligent thoughts, for example, but whether he or she tends to repeat these intelligent thoughts more often than the context necessitates. How an individual expresses his or her thoughts is the important concern. Whether a person repeats thoughts very frequently or utters them without supplying transitions is more important than whether the thoughts themselves are intelligent or stupid. A completely healthy person can still be stupid, merely physiologically stupid, not pathologically stupid. It is also possible for someone to express a clever thought and still be predisposed to psychiatric illness and even succumb to it. We can see this most readily if the person in question suffers from omission of thoughts or frequent repetition of thoughts. The person who suffers from frequent repetitions always has a potential for illness that is related to a formative lung process that is not in order, while the one who suffers from omission of thoughts always has an inherent predisposition to a liver process that is not functioning properly. Other symptoms fall in between. These questions, too, can be studied in real life. 
For example, in cases where a substance is used as a food for pleasure rather than as a medicine, at least in the ordinary sense, we can see that coffee has a very clear and pronounced effect on the entire symptomatic process of our psychological life. And incidentally, I have often mentioned this before, at least in certain circles. We should not place any value on such effects, although they are indeed present, because reliance on them simply makes the soul, soul sluggish. It is possible to compensate for deficient logic by consuming coffee. That is, coffee consumption predisposes the organism to release more forces for purposes of logic than is the case when a person does not drink coffee. Thus, drinking a lot of coffee should be one of the habits of modern journalists, so that they do not have to chew on their pen so much in order to connect one thought to another. This is one aspect of the question. In contrast, tea consumption prevents us from always thinking one thought to the next in a pedantic professorial fashion, which, if taken to extremes, is not at all witty but bores people, because we are constantly subjecting them to the precision of our own logical processes. Certain professions are now in decline, but their old state of organization could have made good use of an external means of becoming as witty as possible without inwardly being so. Members of these professions should have been advised to drink tea. Just as coffee is a good drink for journalists, tea is an extremely effective drink for diplomats, who have great need of the ability to habitually toss off disjointed thoughts that allow one to appear witty. Such things are important to know, because if we can acknowledge them properly and have the necessary moral soul attitude, we know as a matter of course that in a moral lifestyle these abilities must be promoted in some other non-dietary way. Such connections are extraordinarily important as a means of educating ourselves about certain natural relationships. Similarly, in a cultural context, it is important to look, for example, at the very low sugar consumption that was once typical in Russia, in contrast to the very high consumption typical in the Western or English-speaking world. We will discover that where psychological development has not paralyzed such manifestations, people present a very clear imprint of what they ingest. Russians express a certain selfless devotion to the outer world and have less ego awareness, which they substitute for on a level that is theoretical at best. This is related to low sugar consumption. In contrast, the British possess a strong organically based sense of self that is related to high sugar consumption. Here, however, it is less important to look at actual consumption levels than at people's sugar cravings, because the level of consumption always develops as the result of a craving, out of the longing to enjoy something. That is why it is especially important to take a look at such cravings. Looking to the organ systems of the lower human body as the origin of so-called psychiatric disorders, points you in the direction of interactions within the human being that should not be disregarded from the joint perspective of pathology and therapy. These interactions between what I have described in simple terms as the upper and lower areas of the human being must always be taken into account with regard to both pathology and therapy. If we neglect to do so, we will never achieve a proper view of the effect of outer influences through which we want to work on a patient. It makes a big difference whether we apply the effects of warmth or water to a patient's feet or head. But we cannot bring reason to bear on these questions without first becoming aware of the great differences in the functioning of the upper and lower parts of the human being. This is why we will now discuss outer effects on the human being, to the extent that our particular subject permits. The end of Lecture 13 This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Introducing Anthroposophical Medicine. This is Lecture 14, given in Dornach on April 3, 1920. 
I have been thinking for a long time about how to approach today's topic in this lecture series, as I will be able to present it only superficially owing to the shortage of time. I have been pondering whether or not to include it and have decided to do so, even though it will show us once again how easily such matters can be misunderstood. You see, for a long time now, certain people have been launching their attacks on anthroposophy by suggesting that anthroposophical statements are just confused nonsense. Now, however, the opinion seems to be emerging that it is no longer possible to make this suggestion because belated research shows that the matters we discuss give all too strong an impression of agreeing with what can be derived from the ancient mysteries. So now people are inventing the objection that I am betraying the mysteries. It will always be possible for them to formulate their objections in a way that suits their purpose. If they can no longer say that the contents are false, they will at least claim that it is quite wrong to talk about them. What I want to say first of all is this. We must realize that the physical perspective reveals only a small portion of any human being, for the obvious reason that the human being also includes the etheric body, the astral body, and the eye, which are constantly and independently active and working on the human organism, and which naturally elude external physical assessment completely. I use the term ad assessment advisedly in view of what I want to present shortly. But this does not mean that it is impossible for individuals of good will to train their intellect and capacity for judgment to absorb aspects of what we might call clairvoyance. <laughs> These individuals will not achieve clairvoyance of the sort that deals with clear images, but they will achieve a method of evaluation that is at least able to establish a strong and valid relationship to clairvoyant insight. Please consider the following. Let us begin with how the eye works on the human being. Because human beings are what they are in our present period of evolution, the capital I works first and foremost on the human physical body. In present day humankind, it has relatively little ability to master even the etheric body. In childhood, the eye still governs the etheric body in a relatively dull and unconscious way, but later it no longer controls the etheric body at all. It retains a very strong influence on the etheric body only in those whose imagination remains strong in later life. In general, however, in people who become intellectual in a dry and rational way, the eye has a stronger influence on the physical body than on the etheric body. If you imagine properly what I have described as the influence of the eye on the physical body, <clears throat> you will be quite close to also being able to imagine that this eye works on the physical organization, setting up a kind of scaffolding throughout. Our physical body really does incorporate something resembling a delicate scaffolding, which can be seen as a kind of phantom that is constantly present. We carry around within us a scaffolding that has been impressed upon us by our eye organization. <clears throat> a very delicate scaffolding that is incorporated into the organization of the physical body out of the forces of the etheric body. In the course of a lifetime, however, we gradually lose the strength to incorporate this scaffolding consciously, although it remains present in our imaginative creativity in a semi-conscious, dreamy way. You can easily see that to a certain extent the scaffolding the eye builds into the human organism is a foreign object and so the human organism constantly defends itself against this scaffolding and attempts to destroy it every night during sleep. Even though we perceive very little of this scaffolding in everyday life, we must not forget that it tends to splinter or fall apart 
within the organism. For this reason it is the constant mysterious cause of inflammations in the organism. It is very important to consider that a phantom of sorts is built into the human organism by the eye, that the organism defends itself against this phantom as if it were a foreign object, and that this foreign object constantly tends to splinter and fall apart within the human being's physical organization. You can get a more or less reasonable view of this scaffolding simply by studying the organization of human eyes from a psychophysiological perspective. The entire interplay between the eyes and the outer world, or the interplay between the soul and the outer world that takes place through the eyes, is representative of the building of this scaffolding in its purest form. <clears throat> there is a relationship between the capital I scaffolding and what comes about through the interaction of the eyes with the environment. When I say eyes, it's E-Y-E-S. And I have often studied this relationship in people who were born blind and in people who have become blind. This makes it very easy to compare the interrelationship between the one phantom, which is a normal phantom in most people, and is incorporated into their organization simply through the fact that they see, and the other phantom, which is the consequence of eye activity in the organism. To express these phenomena graphically, I might say that through seeing, through the visual process, a phantom scaffolding is incorporated into the organism, and there's a drawing, the other scaffolding, which is incorporated through the eye process, simply lies a bit deeper within the organism and gives a clear indication of physical forces. What the eye builds into the organization is a nearly physical phantom, an actual scaffolding, while what the eyes supply is still etheric. It is interesting to see how close these two come to each other in nearsighted people how what I have sketched here in white comes very close to the other scaffolding, the yellow. In contrast, in far-sighted people, the white scaffolding moves outward. In short, if you study the organization of a person's eyes, you will be able to get a reasonable understanding of that person's etheric body, which is very similar to what I have described here as one of the scaffolds. There is no better way of training yourself to grasp certain aspects of a person's etheric body than by paying attention to the organization of that person's eyes. The rest will come by itself. If you develop the habit of paying attention to whether people are near or far-sighted and allow the observation to work on you, this habit trains you to be receptive to perceiving the etheric body. If you then also assist this process by meditating, it will no longer be so difficult for you to move on from dedicated study of what the organization of the eyes evokes in the human being to a study of the etheric body. Next you will convince yourself of the following. The process that is related to the organization of the eyes is always present in the human being. It is a normal token of a tendency that can also appear in an abnormal form. <clears throat> it is a normal process in everyday life, but something similar appears in all inflammatory conditions. You can really say that if the scaffolding in the physical body, the one that is similar to the etheric body, emerges too strongly, it gives rise to inflammations and their consequences. The conviction that is dawning in you can be strengthened by experimenting with external applications of formic acid derived from the animal kingdom. This is easy to do. You simply obtain the highest possible dilution of formic acid and administer it to your patient in the form of baths. You are then met by a consolidation of this yellow scaffolding here again referring to the drawing. Through the use of formic acid, 
the capital I, is harnessed to and pervades the scaffolding. If your patient is predisposed to inflammations, this is how you can cope with them, because the scaffolding tends to fall apart and trigger inflammations only when it is not properly pervaded by the eye, since the scaffolding and the eye belong together. They can be brought together by using formic acid in baths, as I have just described. But the formic acid must be highly diluted, because only then do its forces become fully available. You must pursue symptomatology a bit if you become involved in such matters. You must observe, <clears throat> for example, whether your patients with inflammatory conditions tend toward obesity. You will achieve good results <clears throat> with the above-mentioned external therapy with animal-derived formic acid only if both predispositions are present, on the one hand a tendency to inflammations and on the other an inclination to obesity, which points to a certain syndrome. If you have reason to suspect a breakdown of this scaffolding, which you can recognize from various other symptoms we will discuss later, and if you are simultaneously dealing with a patient who is quite strongly predisposed to obesity, you will always achieve extremely beneficial results. This is what must be taken into consideration. You see, in this case, spiritual scientific knowledge is very shocking to modern individuals. Spiritual science knows that the process that must occur in the human organism, so that the eyes develop in the way that they must in human evolution, through a long developmental history, of course, is an infl inflammatory process that is constantly kept within normal limits so that it does not erupt into inflammation. If you imagine that the same process that is at work in inflammation is held back, slowed down and compressed, you have the process that forms the eyes in the human organism. From the very appearance of a person's eyes, you can gain an impression of whether or not that person is predisposed to inflammatory conditions. You will be able to see it in people's eyes if you train yourself to observe it. What we can experience about people's vision really is intimately related to observing the human etheric body. And when we speak of the presence of the etheric body, of learning to perceive the etheric body, there is, of course, the inner process that leads to actual clairvoyance by way of meditation. But there is also the possibility of self-education from the outside. By attempting to view natural processes in the right way, we acquire insight into them from the perspective of judgment. You see, the organs of clairvoyance must be developed from within but we develop our capacity for judgment in conjunction with the outer world. If we do this on a more intimate level, our capacity for judgment meets up with the otherwise more intimate meditative process that moves from within outward. You may be justified in raising the question of whether all this cannot be observed in the animal kingdom too. The situation is this. We do not gain a good idea of what is at issue in the human being by studying the same thing in animals. In public lectures, I have often emphasized a point that I want to emphasize here as well, but in greater detail. You see, people think that eyes are eyes, organs are organs, lungs are lungs, livers are livers, and so on. This is not true, however. Human eyes are the same organs as the eyes that are present in an animal, but they are modified by the fact that the eye is incorporated into the human being, and the same is true of all the other organs. And with respect to what happens in an organ, which plays a very great role in a human being who is ill, by the way, the fact that it is pervaded by the eye is more important than the aspect that also appears in the animal kingdom where the organ is not pervaded by the eye. This is a circumstance that is never taken into account sufficiently, 
People really never cease to judge these issues on this basis. Here is a knife, and there is a knife. A knife is a knife, and I insist that these are both knives on the basis of how they were made. Yes, but if one knife is a piece of silverware, and the other is a straight razor, it becomes impossible to insist that one knife is the same as the other. It is the same when someone comes along and insists that human eyes and animal eyes can be explained in the same way. It is simply nonsense to attempt to derive the principle that explains something exclusively from that thing's external appearance. This approach leads nowhere, especially if we base a study on mere outer appearances. Animal studies prevent us from examining certain circumstances in humans in the right way, because we can properly call these circumstances to mind only when we are conscious of the fact that the human being's most peripheral organs are the most thoroughly pervaded and shaped by the eye. Human ears are formed in a completely different way from the eyes. We can also comprehend human ears, however, we can train ourselves to understand them objectively in a way that is similar to how we train ourselves to objectively understand the eyes. Parenthesis, this latter type of self-education brings us close to clairvoyant perception of the etheric body. Close parenthesis. We can school ourselves to see the facts in the right way, namely that the ears are incorporated into the human being just as they are in the animal, but that in the human being their formation is then pervaded by the eye organization. If we study the formation of the ears, we discover that they are related to a somewhat more internal aspect of the human organism, just as the etheric body's formation of the eyes is related to a more peripheral aspect. We become able to direct our powers of observation toward ear formation, and to say that the eye has a role in this process, just as it also has a role in forming the eyes. The eye also incorporates a scaffolding into the organism that is somewhat different from the scaffolding described earlier. This one is related to everything that underlies ear formation in the organism. I will ske sketch this second scaffolding in here in blue, same drawing, page 201. It lies deeper within the organism than the yellow one, and has less of an organizing effect as it extends into the limbs. If we were to extract it from the human being, we would find that it has only stumps instead of arms and legs. We might call it a scaffolding that has remained as an infant in its development. It is also much less differentiated in the direction of the head than the other scaffolding. Once again we discover a correspondence, this time between the second scaffolding and the organizing forces in human ear formation and all that underlies this process. I will draw it here in violet so that it corresponds to the white. Like the first scaffolding, the second one also possesses a certain idiosyncrasy within the human organism. It too can become abnormal, so to speak when the eye is working too strongly. In this case, when the eye is working too powerfully in the interior. We dealt earlier with the case of the eye working with too much force at the surface. Once again, here is a circumstance that can help you study this subject properly. Pursue a bit of symptomatology and consider people who tend to be excessively or even slightly underweight, who have no tendency to put on weight. In such people the eye works too strongly toward the interior and strengthens this second scaffolding. But in contrast to the first scaffolding, this one has a different peculiarity. It tends to proliferate internally, while the first one tends to splinter and fall apart. This one needs to be developed in two directions in particular. It needs to be developed in such a way that the proliferation that results from the eye slipping out of it does not occur. Parenthesis, proliferation and breakdown in these scaffoldings 
are both due to the fact that the eye is not properly contained within them and slips out. Close parenthesis. If the eye slips out of this scaffolding, but it is strong enough to maintain itself within the organism, psychological and physical consequences will develop. The psychological consequence is hypochondria. The physical consequence is constipation or similar symptoms. This is one possibility. It is also possible, however, for the eye to be too weak to hold together when it slips out. It may fall apart as an eye, so that the cause of the breakdown is the eye itself rather than its correlate, the physical scaffolding. Imagine what a strange state of affairs this is. In this instance, the eye is so weak that fragments of it establish themselves in the organism. This is the true fact of the matter. These fragments become established because when people with this type of organization fall asleep, they are not able to take everything that slips out of the scaffolding with them. Part of it remains inside and proliferates as an eye on the soul level. Human organisms subject to proliferations of the soul eye, which appear especially strongly during sleep, are predisposed to tumor formation. We are looking at an infinitely important process. People who are predisposed to tumor formations do not sleep properly because fragments of the eye remain behind in the organism when these people fall asleep. Here we confront these eye fragments, which are the triggers of malignant tumors and which are related to the entire syndrome I have just described. It is truly as if on the one hand we have hypochondria and constipation and on the other the organism, if it cannot help itself by turning the person into a constipated hypochondriac, proliferates internally and malignant tumors appear. We will talk about this at greater length, but for now the point is simply to look at the principle. You can also convince yourself outwardly of the facts of the matter by taking a different view of a topic I discussed earlier, namely that the first formative process we mentioned can be dealt with by externally administering finely dispersed animal formic acid in the form of baths. Try administering an appropriate potentized preparation of the same formic acid internally and observe the effect it has especially on thin people. In thin people it influences tumor formation, driving out the tendency to tumor formation. These effects absolutely must be observed on the excuse me, macroscopic level. They demonstrate the importance of acquiring an eye, EYE, for the macroscopic, for seeing a person's entire status and all aspects of his or her constitution in conjunction with what appears when the person is ill. They also give us a real sense of the need to separate a remedy's external and internal effects. If we trace the efficacy of the same remedy in its external and internal applications, we discover very interesting information. Once again, spiritual science is tremendously informative with regard to this second aspect of the human organization. It tells us that all of the forces that shape human ears lie on the same path as the forces that ultimately lead to internal tumor formation if they go too far. Our ear formation is the result of a process that is normalized by holding back the tumor forming force at the right stage. The ear is an internal tumor in the human being, but kept within normal limits. In the process of human development, the factor that shapes the eye EYE, is related to the inflammatory process, while the factor that shapes the ear is related to the tumor forming process. Here we see a wonderful connection between health and illness in the human being. 
we are dealing with the same activities in both health and illness, but in one instance they take place at the right speed and in the other at the wrong speed. If you were to do away with the inflammatory process in nature, not a creature would be able to see. Sight is possible simply because the inflammatory process is integrated into nature as a whole. It has a specific tempo, however. If the wrong speed is imposed on it, it turns into the pathological process of inflammation in the human being. Similarly, the tumor forming or proliferative process is significant in the natural world when it takes place at the correct speed. If you were to do away with this process, not a creature in the world would be able to hear. If you give it the wrong speed, however, you end up with everything that takes place in the development of myomas, carcinomas, and sarcomas. We will have more to say about these matters later. If we are not in a position to seek out the healthy counterpart of each individual disease process, we cannot incorporate the disease process into the human organization in the right way, because it is simply true that this human <coughs> organization is based on centrally internalizing certain processes that are scattered about on the periphery in nature as a whole. Instead of many of the subjects that our modern physiology beats to death, we should be looking at other subjects. Although these other matters are studied, their great importance has not been recognized. Take another example. On a macroscopic and even trivial level, you can trace how the skin that is spread out over the body turns inward so that its continuations cover all of the internal parts. This reversal of functions, which occurs between the cheeks or outer parts of the face, and the inside of the lips, for example, is extremely important. Here we can still see in the outer human being the rudiments of a process that ought to be traced properly in embryology, where cavities and involutions are all important. <clears throat> it would be tremendously instructive to pursue such topics simply by studying the differences in reactions when we apply formic acid externally to the skin and internally to the mucosae, noting the subtle difference that appears. Everything I have indicated here represents only details of something that appears on a fundamental level, as I have most recently described. If you conduct such studies, you will encounter the great difference between the aspect of human organization that simply turns itself inside out toward the outside, etherically as well, and the internal centralizing aspect, which are polar opposites. This is important to the following consideration. If you ask what the second phantom I described, the one sketched in blue, corresponds to, I will tell you that it is a physical scaffolding in the organism that simply has a tendency to proliferate. If it remains within normal limits, it is related to the development of the ear. Train yourself to observe the human being in a way that teaches you how to look at the organization of the human ear, and especially at how it is entirely internalized, while considering the organization of the eye at the same time, EYE. Consider the fact that the visual process takes place in the etheric, while the auditory process takes place in the air. This is a significant difference. Everything on the lower end of the series of tangibles and intangibles is more closely related to the factor in the human being that is centralized and shifted into the interior, while everything that is more closely associated with the etheric is related to the human factor that is shifted toward the periphery. What I have sketched here in violet contains nothing less than an indication of what lives within the human astral body. By studying the organization of the ear, you can train yourself to use your capacity for judgment to observe human beings. This observation is a substitute of sorts for clairvoyant perception of the astral body. Learning to observe sight 
trains us to observe the etheric body, while learning to observe hearing trains us to observe the astral body. If we consider people who are born deaf and people who become deaf, it is possible to make very interesting observations and more profound associations in nature are revealed. Take note of the following example. As early as childhood, the congenitally deaf would have been predisposed to the worst sorts of tumor formation if they had not been born deaf. This is another one of the natural aids nature creates, and it points beyond what can be understood as the individual human organization between birth and death to an influence that intervenes in repeated earthly lives, because that is where it is balanced out. <clears throat> we trace each phenomena to a certain extent. We reach a point where we begin to grasp the reality of repeated earthly lives. If you attempt to stimulate the human being peripherally, you will always strengthen what I characterized as the relationship of the I, capital, to its first scaffolding. If you find it necessary to strengthen the human I, you can choose either an educational route or a therapeutic route. If you note a predisposition to inflammations, you will always find that you need to strengthen the activity of the I in your patient. This I activity simply needs to be incorporated into its phantom scaffolding in the right way, so that the scaffolding will not fall apart. The activity of the I can be significantly strengthened, so that it fits into its scaffolding very well, by having your patient take baths to which highly diluted oil of rosemary, the sap expressed from rosemary leaves, is added. The stimulation coming from the periphery via the finely dispersed rosemary sap, enables the eye to work within what approaches the person in this way. You will find that the most remarkable phenomena begin to appear. Consider how the human eyes are incorporated into the organism. The process of seeing is based on the fact that the eye is able to pervade what is extracted from the human organism at this spot. There is very little animal activity in the eyes. It is all shifted to the vegetative level. And the process of seeing is based on the fact that the human being, the inner human being of soul and spirit, pervades something that is no longer animal-like and can identify with what is external rather than only with internal factors. If you identify with a muscle, you identify with the human formative process from within outward. But when you identify with the eyes, you are identifying with the outer world. This is why I once said that an organ such as an eye is a gulf that extends from the outer world into the human being. It is a piece of the outer world that has simply pushed its way into the organism like a gulf. Again, sense physiology makes a fatal error by totally failing to take such considerations into account, and this is the origin of those silly stories about subjectivity and so forth. Objectivity pushes its way into us. In this objectivity we participate in a bit of the external world process. This is not taken into account at all today. For centuries, or at least for a century and a half, all sorts of sense physiology has been based on the subjective because no one thought about how the outer world pushes its way in through its gulfs, as it were, so that we participate in it through our senses. If you grasp this correctly, you will also have a correct understanding of what happens when a very finely dispersed substance works in from outside. If this is the skin, there's a picture, with its pores and all the processes that are played out in connection with the pores, and if droplets of rosemary are finely dispersed in a bath, it will be easy for you to see that an interaction comes about between the skin and the finely dispersed rosemary droplets. This interaction evokes something similar 
to the stimulation of a sensory process. And this stimulating sensory process works on the human eye, incorporating it into its scaffolding. <laughs> we can even go so far as to prevent the peripheral process of hair loss, if it is not too late, of course, if it is done in time, by supporting the scalp through the stimulating effect of rosemary droplets, finely dispersed in liquid. It is simply a question of doing this correctly. This is an example of an effect working on the surface, on the periphery of the human organization. Let us assume that the orderly interaction between the I, capital, and the human organization is broken through from outside. The I is really not just a point. It is a point that affects its surroundings, which means that the human organization's formative force, the I organizing force, capital I, spreads throughout the human being and pervades everything. If injury occurs from outside to some part of the body, interrupting the interaction between the capital I and the force of the human organization, what you will need to summon to this spot must come from the astral organization, which is one stage lower than the I, and pervades the human being in a way that makes it easier for the I to develop its therapeutic powers at the place where external injury has taken place. If you want to tell the astral body, which I have described as being located deeper in the interior, as even its phantom indicates, to come to a particular spot and help, you do not administer a bath. Instead, you wrap arnica in a woolen rag and apply an arnica compress to a sprain or similar external injury where the effect of the eye has been weakened. In this way, you summon the astral body from the interior to come to the aid of the eye. This is an example of a remedy working as a balancing factor on the surface or periphery of the human being. This gives us a real basis for comparing different substances in the outer world in terms of whether their readily dispersed constituents aid the periphery, which means that these dispersing substances must be administered in the form of a bath that directly supports the eye, or whether other substances, including arnica in particular, must be applied in order to summon the astral body, which supports the eye indirectly. We discover the effects of such substances only by asking the eye and the astral body to help. As you see, this is knowledge that can really lay the foundations for a theory of external and internal therapy. The end of Lecture 14 This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Introducing Anthroposophical Medicine, Lecture 15, given in Dornach on April 4th, 1920. Yesterday, someone who is very competent in this regard commented to me that of all anthroposophical lectures, these are among the most difficult to understand. I would like to begin today by addressing this comment. Within certain limits, we must certainly admit that it is true. But we will also have to admit that the difficulties are almost unavoidable. In my opinion, however, the very fact that this comment is justified can teach us a great deal. Let us take a case where what I have to say is very easy to understand, or even two cases, one of which is very near at hand and the other somewhat less accessible to modern humanity. <clears throat> With regard to the first, more obvious example, people of our current cultural epoch are justified in experiencing difficulty in understanding subjects like the ones that are presented here. A blackbird, however, has no such difficulty. A blackbird would find all of this readily understandable and would even offer practical proof of being able to comprehend it. Blackbirds, which are not, after all, totally ascetic animals, occasionally eat cross spiders. Footnote cross spider, Epira diadema, is a common European garden spider with a cross-like marking on its back. 
End of footnote. But when a blackbird eats a cross spider and begins to feel very uncomfortable, which is what happens when blackbirds eat cross spiders, it heads straight for a henbane plant. If there is a henbane plant nearby, the blackbird will go straight to it to get the appropriate remedy. If no henbane is available, the blackbird develops convulsions and dies a terrible death. Footnote henbane Hios Caimus, excuse me, Hios Caimus Niger, black henbane or stinking nightshade. And a footnote. Its own healing instinct, however, protects it from this fate. It immediately begins pecking away at henbane, the appropriate remedy. This is the very obvious example. Another related process, however, is less accessible to modern human beings. At a certain time in the distant past, humans developed healing instincts like this, and these instincts encompassed aspects of what we encounter in a more or less concentrated form in Hippocratic medicine. It is interesting to study the wisdom of blackbirds, or of other birds who can do the same thing in many instances, with reference to the very justified comment that was made yesterday. <laughs> what is actually going on when a blackbird eats a cross spider? The cross spider's entire organization is closely linked to certain cosmic relationships in supra-earthly nature, and this connection gives rise to its overall limb development as well as to its markings. If I may put it in this way, the cross spider has a lot of planetary life in it. In contrast, birds have lagged behind in experiencing planetary events, which they have shifted toward the interior of the organism. When a bird swallows a cross spider, the planetary forces make themselves felt inside the bird. These planetary forces, which still have the tendency to assume form, attempt to pervade the bird, which then has to combat this process. As soon as the bird has consumed the garden spider, its inner will becomes a copy of supra-earthly life, and it goes straight to a specific plant. This plant has become similar to earthly factors the opposite of the planetary factors, because of the very way it grows out of the earth, specifically because of its inability to fully process a substance influenced by the planets, which it retains as a poison instead. The bird goes straight to this plant for help, because as soon as the spider toxin begins to work in the blackbird, it summons up the bird's counter-instinct its defensive instinct. There is an immediate transition from instinctive response to injury to the defensive instinct, so the entire phenomenon is nothing less than a very elastic elaboration on what we ourselves do if a fly gets in one of our eyes and we blink or move a hand in the simple re reflex gesture. It is extremely important for us to observe these processes in the plant and animal kingdoms because it cures us of the belief that reason and common sense are contained only within our own skulls, when in fact they must also be flying around outside, since very rational behavior is evident in the bird's instinctive self-defense against injury. We human beings simply have the gift of being able to participate in the workings of outer reason and common sense. We engage in them. But it is nonsense to imagine that we carry them within ourselves. A bird does not yet participate in these workings in the sense of having a specific body part for acquiring the instinct to respond defensively to injury. To understand what is inside us, we human beings use the head system, whereas birds still use the lung system for this purpose to a greater extent. Because a bird's thinking is less peripheral and lies closer to the core of its being, its lung system 
produces the defensive instinct against hyoscyamus. I'm going to spell that. It's H Y O S C Y A M U S, excuse me. In contrast, we humans have forcibly removed our thinking from our lungs and rhythmic system. Perhaps we will have time to speak more specifically about what human beings use for thinking, but in any case, we no longer think so centrally. Unlike birds, we do not think with our lungs and heart, and so on. Our thinking is no longer so connected to the cosmos. We must relearn such cosmic thinking. If you ask what eliminated the final remnants of the instincts that connected us to nature, we must say that our schooling and our university education did this to us. Such things are fundamentally predisposed to preventing us from living in harmony with nature as a whole. They drive us into refined intellectuality on the one hand and refined sexuality on the other. In modern humankind, something that was central to primeval humanity is being driven apart into these two poles. You see, in order to find our way back to a proper understanding of the universe, we must regain our health in the realm of scientific activity. Unfortunately, many subjects are currently being studied only by means of an unhealthy science. They will have to be studied by pursuing science in a healthy way. Next, in connection with what I said yesterday, we will concern ourselves a bit with observing the human being in a way that points directly toward the relevant healing process. This mode of observation was so highly developed among primeval human beings that the appearance of anything abnormal in an individual immediately directed them to the appropriate healing process. This ability has been lost to modern human beings. Our intuition is unlikely to discover what primeval human beings discovered through instinct. This is simply a matter of evolution, which proceeds from instinct through intellectualism to intuition. Physiology and medicine, however, are among the fields that suffer most in the purely intellectual stage of evolution and are at least able to flourish in the atmosphere of intellectualism, and are least able to flourish in the atmosphere of intellectualism. Let us take a concrete example, a case of diabetes. As an abnormal development, what does diabetes represent? First of all, we can acquire true insight into diabetes only when we recognize it as weakness of the I, capital an inability of the eye organization to cope with the whole process of sugar formation as it is meant to take place. We must simply interpret the phenomena in the right way. It would be totally wrong to believe that because sugar is being excreted we are dealing with an eye that is too strong. No, in this case the eye does not participate forcefully enough in the organic process to be able to supply and pervade the individual's organization with sugar in the appropriate way. This is the initial phenomenon. And everything that works to promote diabetes is related to it. We can perceive a first sign of diabetic illness if someone simultaneously eats too many sweets and drinks alcohol. This first sign may disappear again, of course, but it does show how the eye weakening process is initiated. The eye cannot cope with what really ought to be taking place. At the moment it is important for us to look at these phenomena. This leads me to a concept that has not come up much in the course of our studies. Since it does appear on many of our lists of questions, we will enter into it in more detail in the remainder of these lectures. Your questions will all be considered, but first appropriate preparation is necessary. The concept I am approaching here is that of hereditary predisposition, which plays a major role in diabetes in particular. This hereditary predisposition 
does indeed have an effect on a weak eye. We can always confirm the connection between a weak eye, or rather an eye that is not functioning with all its complexes of forces, and predisposition to inherited illnesses. illnesses. If it were simply a question of hereditary predisposition, we would all be suffering from illnesses of this sort. That this is not the case is essentially due to the fact that someone with a well-functioning eye is less likely to suffer from them. On the other hand, we must not overlook the fact that psychological causes are often present in diabetes to a greater or lesser extent and that its appearance can be linked to stressful stimulation in high-strung individuals. Why is this so? <clears throat> when the eye is weak, it tends to restrict its activity to the periphery of the organism, where it develops a strong intellectualism via the brain. This weak eye, however, is not capable of penetrating deeper into the organism and specifically into those parts of the organism where protein is processed, where plant protein is transformed into animal protein. The activity of the eye does not extend to this process. In its place, the astral body becomes all the more active, because the astral body's activity is greatest where digestion, blood formation, and respiration interact in the middle organizational process. <laughs> because of the in, uh, inability of the eye, this middle process is left to its own devices and begins to develop all sorts of obstinately independent processes that relate only to the middle region of the human being rather than to the totality. We can say that predisposition to diabetes occurs if the eye excludes itself from internal processes. These internal processes, especially that of secretion, are strongly related to the development of feelings or emotions. All of this secretion, which as you know is an oscillating and circulating activity, is neglected while the eye is focusing its chief activity on the brain. As a result, the person in question loses control over certain psychological influences that assert themselves in the form of emotional influences. Why can we remain calm when something exciting occurs around us? It is because we have the ability to send our reason into our guts, because we are really in a position to engage the whole person instead of remaining only in the brain. While we are thinking, we cannot do this. While we are busy in the one-sided intellectual way that comes from the brain, the inner part of the body is engaged in its own movements. We are then extremely susceptible to stressful stimuli. Consequently, these stimuli also evoke their organic processes intellectually, while they should be doing something else. Stimuli that work on our feeling life should not evoke their organic processes without first being pervaded by the intellect. They should be subdued by reason before working on the interior of the human being. <laughs> it is important to realize that in a situation like this we are encountering a labile eye and that the eye is related to the most supra-earthly factors in the human being to the factors that are most peripheral to the earth. In reality, everything that is active in our eye approaches us from far beyond the earth. Thus, we must try to become familiar with activities that are related to these supra-human processes having to do with our eye, so that we become able to shift the eye into a realm where it learns to participate appropriately in supra-earthly factors. Within the earthly element, the equivalent of the supra-earthly influence 
that leads the I to work on its inner central organization causes either the mineral part of the earth or its plants to form etheric oils or oils of any sort. Just as the human eye becomes active in the eyes, coming into direct connection with the outer world through this gulf, it must also be brought into connection with the oil-forming process. We can probably do this best by attempting to incorporate finely dispersed oil into therapeutic baths. It would be very desirable to investigate what degree of dispersion is required how often the baths should be administered, and so on. This is how diabetes' devastating attack on the organism should be counteracted. You can see here how observing an outer process and associating it with an internal human process creates a human supra-human physiology that is also a therapy at the same time. This is the path we must take if we want to achieve anything at all in this regard. After we acquire some additional, more concrete concepts, I would like to point out once again how human beings actually relate to the environment. Please consider how the totality of the Earth's plant life grows upward, dispersing its forces in the flowers and gathering them together again in the fruits. <coughs> consider, too, all the thousands of strange variations of this process that exist. Perhaps something that ordinarily shoots entirely into the seeds is retained in leaf development, making the plants thick and cabbage-like. Or perhaps the seed pods thicken because certain forces are held back at the very last minute. There are all kinds of possible variations. The process of plant development, however, should truly not be considered only from the perspective of the physical effects of the earth and the counter-effects of light. While it is certainly true that a plant incorporates a physical and an etheric body and is entirely subsumed by them, it is equally true that up where the supra-earthly collides with the earthly there is a cosmic astrality related to this plant. We might say that the plant grows upward, toward, but cannot attain an animal process of development. The interior of the earth is saturated with the plant-forming process, while the atmosphere toward which plants grow is saturated with an animal-forming process, which plants approach but cannot attain. The process we see taking place here weaves above the flowering plant world, where it has a circumferential or peripheral relationship to the entire earth. This same process, however, is centralized and internalized in animals. Animals split off and incorporate the activities that take place above plants. The organs that animals have and plants do not are nothing other than what animals claim for themselves. Something that is otherwise developed on the periphery and directed at plants from outside is developed from a central point outward by animals. This animal forming process is also present in human beings but is located closer to the center of the physical human organization. It tends more in the direction of the interaction of digestion, blood formation, and respiration, where the process shaping the human being is most similar to today's animal-forming process. This is also why the interior of the physical body is the part of the human being most closely related to the vital processes of the plant kingdom and why we can always count on being able to treat the interior of the human body with derivatives of vital processes that manifest in the plant kingdom. Human beings, however, have an advantage over the animal kingdom. This advantage is based on the fact 
that the humans undergo not only the interaction that takes place in animals between the plant and astral elements, but also one that takes place between the mineral element and an element that is super-astral, that is, even farther out on the periphery than the merely astral element. Thus we can say that the specifically human attribute at the present stage of the Earth's evolution is to participate in the mineral forming process. Just as protein transformation takes place in animals, another process, one that science does not take into account at all, takes place in human beings. This process tends mo to move toward the periphery. Excuse me, let me read that again. This process tends more toward the periphery than the animal activity of transforming protein happening, if we may put it like this, between the heavens and the mineral kingdom. If we want to have a term for it, we can call it a desalinizing process in accordance with its chief characteristic. You see, in the human organism, a desalinizing process is continually taking place, a tendency to transform salt formation into its opposite. This is the true basis of our humanness, and especially of our human thinking, which transcends animal existence. In our peripheral aspect, although not in our central aspect, which is similar to animal formation, we resist the formation of salt. <clears throat> we counteract salt formation just as animals counteract the ordinary earth-forming forces of plant protein. We must seek out the forces inherent in this counteract, counteraction, preferably in the mineral kingdom, in order to be able to cure certain conditions in human beings that we cannot successfully treat with phytotherapeutics. I might say that we see human beings as mere animals if we attempt to treat them exclusively with plant-derived remedies. We respect people's humanness by asking them to take part in the fiercer battle against the mineralization of the earth, a battle that goes on in the earth's surroundings. And by allowing the I to participate in this battle, when we make it possible for an individual to become involved in it. Each time we treat a person with silica, we are appealing to that person's silica-splitting forces, to the ability to overcome this hard mineral. By doing so, we enable the I to engage vigorously in a process that no longer takes place on earth at all. The forces prevailing outside the earthly sphere attempt to fragment everything that is earthly and solid in universal space. The universe has the peculiarity of smashing to pieces everything that aggregates and solidifies in the planetary realm. In everyday life we seldom participate in this process, which is usually confined to universal space. The people who participate in it the most are mathematical personalities, people who are accustomed to living in the world of numbers and thinking in terms of mathematical forms. Their kind of thinking is based on smashing the mineral element to pieces. In contrast, people with, certain, with a certain distaste for mathematics want to restrict themselves to a mere desalinizing process and cannot become agents of internal destruction. This is the difference between mathematical and non-mathematical personalities. <laughs> Counteracting the Earth's mineralizing process is the basis of many ideas about the therapeutic process. Once again, these are things that were simply part of primeval humanity's instinctive, defensive response to injury. When primeval human beings noticed any sign of their thinking becoming weak, they turned to some mineral substance, which they took. By breaking down this mineral substance internally, they once again acquired the ability to be in harmony with supra-earthly factors that are very far removed from the earth. It is possible to trace processes in the natural world 
outside the human being in a way that permits direct observation of the validity of statements such as this. Let us do this by considering a plant that is extremely interesting in this regard, Betula alba, or white birch. Footnote, the European white birch is now called Betula pendula. Betula alba can refer to either that, more likely, or to Betula papyrifera, papyrifera, American white birch, paper or canoe birch, papyra, Papyrifera, maybe. P-A-P-Y-R-I-F-E-R-A. Excuse me. End of footnote. White birch counteracts or refuses to participate in the normal process of plant development in two ways. The usual process of plant development would come about if you could mix what happens in birch bark with what happens in birch leaves, especially the young spring leaves, that still have a trace of brown in them. If you could mix these two separate processes and make the active principle in birch bark work together with the active principle in birch leaves, you would get a wonderful herbaceous flowering plant. The birch tree comes about simply because the processes that arise during the living formation of protein are carried into the leaves to a greater extent than is normal. The protein-forming process is concentrated in the leaves, while the process of potassium salt formation is preserved in the bark. In a plant that remains herbaceous rather than becoming a birch tree, the process of potassium salt formation mingles with the process of protein formation in the plant's roots. In the birch tree, what the roots take from the earth is forced outward into the bark, while the leaves receive what a herbaceous plant would mingle with what comes from the earth. Thus the birch tree works on the human organism from two different directions, through its bark, which contains the appropriate potassium salts. It works in cases where the patient's desalinizing processes need to be stimulated, as in skin rashes, for example. What shoots outward into the bark in the birch tree also shoots outward in the human being where it has a therapeutic effect. But if you take the leaf, leaves which preserve the protein forming forces you get the birch factor that influences the center part of the human being where it proves to be a good remedy for gout and rheumatism. If you want to further enhance the process you can take the mineral aspect of the birch's development by producing charcoal from birch wood. Then you you get therapeutic forces that work in a strong internal and external way on the outside of the human interior, that is, on the intestines and so on. We must learn to see a plant's effect on the human being from its external form. If you study Betula alba, You can say that if we wanted to transform this birch into an image in the human being so that it would make the entire human being healthy, we would turn it inside out and incorporate the forces that surge into the wood and bark into the human skin, the periphery, while we would take what the birch sends outward and apply it to the interior of the human being. We would turn the entire birch tree inside out in the human being, as an image, mind you. This is meant to provide you with an image, in such a way that we can trace the healing forces it offers to the human being. When you look at plants with very pronounced root development, plants that develop very strong root forces that then deposit potassium and sodium salts in the plants, you find that this tendency to hold fast to the roots has a healing effect on internal bleeding and also on the formation of kidney stones and so on. Shepherd's purse, Capsula bursa pastoris, is one plant that might be useful in these conditions and everything lying between. Think your way as well into a plant such as Cochlearia officinalis, common scurvy grass or spoonwort. This plant is also interesting to study. Through the sulfur, 
contained in its oils. It is able to work directly on its own proteins. In the mineral realm, sulfur works on protein by enhancing its formative forces. If the process of protein formation is too sluggish, it can be speeded up through the addition of the sulfur process, which is essentially what a plant such as spoonwort develops in an organic form. The fact that spoonwort grows in specific locations, <coughs> that it is introduced into nature in a very particular way, condemns it to develop excessively sluggish protein processes. A wonderful instinct of nature balances this with the plant's sulfur-containing oils, which counteract sluggish processes of this sort. A protein process that has been speeded up is something different from a protein process that proceeds at a natural pace. We must always take this into account. You can find protein forming processes in many different plants that proceed just as quickly as those in spoonwort, but they do not come through about through the interaction of a sluggish principle and an accelerating principle. A constant interaction of this sort in the growth of spoonwort makes it inwardly related to and especially suited for use in diseases such as scurvy, because the process that takes place in scurvy is ex extremely similar to the one I have just described. <coughs> I believe we can actually get quite far by training ourselves to think of outer natural events in conjunction with events within the human being in this particular way. This thinking leads us to these extremely important relationships, but it also leads to an understanding of the human being that cannot be acquired in any other way, because the human being can only be understood, excuse me, can be understood only from the perspective of what is external to the human being, while the external can be understood only from the perspective of the human being. We must be able to study these two things in conjunction with each other. <clears throat> I hope you will not find it extraneous if I conclude today's lecture with a topic that will help us with subsequent observations, namely the peculiar way the spleen functions in the human organism. Human spleen function tends very strongly toward the spiritual aspect. This is why I once said in a lecture cycle on esoteric physi physiology that if you remove the spleen, the etheric body, that is the etheric spleen, takes its place very easily, so that this is one of the human organs that can be most readily replaced by its etheric counterpart. Footnote, these lectures took place March 20th through the 28th, 1911, in Prague, and it is Collected Works number 128. End of footnote. The spleen, however, is less closely related than the other human abdominal organs to metabolism as such. What is the spleen actually? To spiritual scientific research, the spleen presents itself as the organ that is called upon to create constant harmony between crude metabolism and all the more soul-like or spiritualized processes in the human being. The spleen, and this is basically true of all other organs to a greater or lesser extent, is a strong subconscious sensory organ and it reacts extremely strongly to the rhythm of food intake. <clears throat> Constant eating induces a totally different kind of spleen activity than leaving intervals between meals. We can observe this particularly in the irregular spleen activity that develops in children who snack constantly. We can also see it in the fact that when eating does not intervene, after we fall asleep, for example, the spleen comes to rest to a great extent, but only in its own particular fashion. The spleen is the organ of sensation that allows the more spiritualized aspect of the human being to perceive the rhythm of food intake, and it speaks to the human subconscious, telling us what needs to be done to mitigate, at least in part, the damaging impact of unrhythmical eating. Thus, spleen activity works less 
in the direction of metabolism as such, and more in the direction of the rhythmic processes. It participates in rhythmic processes that must take place between food intake and respiration. An intermediate rhythm provided by the spleen is simply interposed between the rhythm of respiration and the intake of food, which otherwise does not tend to be especially rhythmical. Respiratory rhythm enables human beings to live within the strict rhythmicity of the cosmos. Our irregular food intake constantly disrupts this strict cosmic rhythm, and the spleen is the mediator. This state of affairs can actually be confirmed by simply observing the human being. Please do study anatomical and physiological details. You will find that all of this is confirmed down to the smallest detail. On the one hand, you will find proof of what I have said in how the artery to the spleen is almost directly connected to the aorta and also externally in how the spleen is incorporated into the organism. On the other hand, you will find evidence that the spleen mediates in the direction of food intake in how the splenic vein is placed within the entire organism. <laughs> it leads to the portal vein and is in direct connection with the liver. Here a rhythm that is half outer and half inner aligns itself with the lack of rhythm so that they regulate each other. The activity of the spleen is interposed between the rhythmic human being and the metabolic human being. Many symptoms that are related to improper spleen function can be put in order by building on the knowledge we have acquired about the connection between the respiratory system and the metabolism or between the circulatory system and the metabolism as mediated by the spleen. It is not at all surprising that the physiology of the spleen is largely ignored by materialistic science, which knows nothing about the threefold human being, the metabolic human being, the circulatory human being, and the neurosensory human being. The end of lecture 15. This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Introducing Anthroposophical Medicine. This is lecture 16, given in Dornach on April 5th, 1920. You will see that the answers to the questions you so kindly gave me now begin to appear in the lectures. It was simply a matter of creating the foundation for a rational response. Today, I would like to link up with the last topic we talked about yesterday, when I was able to draw your attention to the significance of spleen functions in the human organism. These functions are the regulators of our subconscious soul life and must be addressed as such. We misunderstand the entire nature of the human being if we believe the spleen to be an organ of secondary importance. Admittedly, it is not difficult for this error or misunderstanding to arise because the spleen is such a highly spirit-pervaded organ that its functions are very easily taken over by only the etheric spleen, and other organs can also be called upon to step in and take over its functions. You will see, however, that the effect of the spleen becomes more curious the more it is lifted up out of the subconscious into the consciousness. At this point we come to a certain method of healing that has attracted interest recently, which strangely enough takes the effect of the spleen as a starting point, spleen massage you will be convinced that gently massaging the area of the spleen initially has a balancing effect on human instinctual activity. When people receive gentle massages to the area of the spleen, they develop better instincts in some respects. 
For example, it becomes easier for them to discover what foods suit them and generally what is useful or not useful to their bodies. But there are immediate limits to massaging this area. As soon as the effect grows too strong, it becomes capable of completely undermining instinctual activity once again. A curious pause ensues here at the null point. This massage must not be taken too far. What is this actually related to? Gently massaging the spleen, the area of the spleen, that is, drives something into that area that is otherwise not there. In a certain way, the consciousness of the person being massaged is projected in that direction. A great deal depends on this shift and flow of consciousness. The limits of our language sometimes makes it difficult to express adequately such subtle workings in the human organism. But strange as it may sound, there is a strong interaction between the unconscious activity of reason and common sense, which is mediated by the spleen, or rather by the spleen's functions, and the human organism's conscious functions. And what are these conscious functions? All physical processes in the organism that are accompanied by higher conscious processes and especially by ideational processes have toxic effects. This must not be overlooked. The human organism is constantly poisoning itself through its ideational activity and is continually counteracting these toxic conditions with unconscious states of will. The center of unconscious states of will is located in the spleen. If we pervade the spleen with consciousness, influencing it through massage, we work against the highly toxic effect that emanates from our higher consciousness. Spleen massage, however, does not always have to be external massage. It can also be internal massage. You may argue that this should not be called massage, but the important point is that we understand each other. Spleen massage can also be implemented like this. If we see that a person has a strong inner organic activity that stems from toxic conditions, we can influence the spleen's abnormal state of consciousness by telling that person to eat as little as possible at meal times and to eat more frequently, dividing up the meals so there is less time between them. Dividing up the activity of eating massages the spleen internally and has a profound effect on its activity. Of course, there is a certain catch to this, just as there is always a catch to such processes. You see, in our hurried times, people, or at least many people, are always involved in external stressful activity that has an extremely strong influence on spleen function. People do not do as certain animals do, which stay healthy by lying down after eating and refusing to allow their digestion to be disturbed by outer activity. These animals spare the functioning of their spleen. People who are engaged in outer nervous hurried activity do not do this. As a result, spleen activity is gradually becoming highly abnormal among all of civilized humanity, and it is becoming especially important to relieve the functions of the spleen by using the methods that I have just spoken about. Being attentive to subtle forms of massage, such as internal and external spleen massage, points very neatly to the connections between the human organs that are the vehicles of the unconscious and those that are the vehicles of consciousness. This leads us to discover the importance of massage, or at least makes it easier for us to understand its entire significance. Massage has a certain importance, and under some circumstances 
it can also have a strong healing effect, although its primary effect is on the regulation of rhythmical activity in the human being. But if we want the massage to be successful, we must know the human organism well. For guidance on this path, consider the tremendous difference between the arms and the legs in the human organization, not in the animal but in the human being. In human arms, which are relieved of the burden of gravity and move freely, the astral body is much more loosely bound to the physical body than it is in the feet. In human feet, the astral body is very closely bound to the physical. We might say that in the arms, the astral body works more through the skin, from the outside in. It envelops the arms and hands and works from the outside inward. In a sense, it has a swaddling effect. In the legs and feet, the will works through the astral body in a way that is very strongly centrifugal, radiating from the inside out. This is the reason for the considerable difference between arms and legs. Consequently, if we massage a person's legs and feet, we are doing something fundamentally different from massaging the person's arms and hands. When we massage someone's arms, it draws the astral body in from outside. This makes the arms much more into instruments of the will than normal which has the effect of regulating the internal metabolic exchange between the intestines and the blood vessels. In this way we work more on blood formation when we massage the arms and hands. In contrast, if we massage the feet and legs, the physical aspect is transformed into an ideational one to a greater extent. This has a regulating effect on the metabolic processes of elimination and excretion. <laughs> in this extension of the effects of massage, moving in one instance from the arms toward the inner anabolic realm of metabolism, and in the other instance toward the catabolic realm, we see what a complicated creature the human organism really is. If you investigate these issues rationally, you will discover that every part of the body has a specific connection to other body parts. Understanding this inner interaction in the appropriate way is the basis of effective massage. Massaging the abdomen can always have beneficial effects, even with regard to respiration. It is especially interesting to note that abdominal massage has a particularly good influence on respiratory activity. When we massage directly below the area of the heart, respiration is influenced more strongly. Whereas, if we move further down, it influences the organs in the throat. The action is reversed when we massage the torso. As we move farther, it has a greater effect on the upper organs. For example, we can enhance an arm massage by also massaging the uppermost part of the torso. I might say these things illustrate the connection between individual members of the human organism. In particular, we can see that this interaction between the upper and lower parts of the human being, or in general, between related parts that are sometimes quite far apart, appears in conditions such as migraine. <laughs> in truth, migraine is nothing but the shifting of digestive activities, which should actually have their seat in the rest of the organism into the head. This is why anything that makes too many demands on the rest of the organism, such as menstrual periods, for example, also affects migraines. We can say that when misplaced digestive activity takes place in the head, the cranial nerves are burdened with something they are normally freed from. The very fact that only highly regulated digestive activity in the form of absorption 
takes place in the head frees up the cranial nerves to become sensory nerves. When the above-mentioned unregulated activity takes place in the head, they lose this quality and become inwardly sensitive and receptive to things that the internal parts of the organism should not be able to sense. This is the basis for the pain of migraine and all similar conditions. It is quite understandable how someone must feel when suddenly forced to perceive the interior of the head instead of the outer world. If we understand this condition properly, however, we will be able to suggest only that the best cure for migraine is sleeping it off in peace or something like that. Everything that people take for it or which they are sometimes forced to take has harmful effects. By taking the usual allopathic medications you anesthetize the neural apparatus that has been sensitized, meaning that you impair its activity. Let us say that someone suffers a migraine attack shortly before having to go on stage and chooses to put up with a certain amount of damage rather than not being able to perform. In this case, it is especially easy to observe the anesthetization of something that should not be anesthetized. Such instances demonstrate that the human organism is extremely subtle and that one is often forced to sin against its demands simply as a consequence of being socially entangled in life. This is self-evident and should not be disregarded. Sometimes we may simply have to accept the damage that results from a person's situation in life and attempt to cure its inevitable consequences later. The great subtlety of human bodily organization also becomes evident if we investigate color and light therapy in the right way. Therapy of this sort should certainly be taken into account to a greater extent in the future than has been the case in the past. We also need to explore the difference between the effect of color, which appeals entirely to the upper part of the human being, and the effect of light, which is more objective in scope and appeals to the whole human being. A direct effect on an organ can be achieved by bringing someone into a room where objective color and light shine upon the entire person or where a specific body part is exposed to the purely objective effect of color or light. This is something that definitely affects the person from outside. If, however, the exposure is brought about in a way that engages the impression of color or the presence of the color, which is otherwise engaged only by consciousness, the effect is different. That is, if instead of allowing colored light to shine on a person, I bring that person into a room that is totally decorated in a certain color, the effect is different and pervades all the organs leading up to the organs of consciousness. Subjective color therapy of this sort invariably affects the eye, capital, while objective color therapy works on the physical system through which it only indirectly affects the eye. Please do not say that because blind people are unable to receive visual impressions, it is irrelevant to bring them into a room decorated in a certain color, and that the inevitable result will be the total absence of any effect on them. This is not the case. In this instance, certain effects that emanate from perceptible things but lie below the level of perceptibility emerge very strongly. Even if the people I bring into a room painted red or blue are blind, the color still makes a difference to them. It makes a significant difference. And it must be said that the effect of bringing blind people into a blue walled room is to shift the entire organization, their entire functioning, away from the head and toward the rest of the organism. If I bring them into a red-walled room, 
their functioning shifts away from the rest of the organism and toward the head. From this discussion, you can see that the rhythm induced by allowing one color to alternate with another must be the essential factor when the surroundings are objectively suffused with color. Whether the room we bring people into is blue or red is less important than whether we bring them into a blue room after first experiencing a red one or vice versa. This is of crucial importance. If I see a general need to bring about improvement in the rest of a person's system by strongly stimulating their that person's head functions, I move that person from a blue room into a red one. <laughs> if I want to improve someone's head function by way of the rest of the organism, I move that person from a red room into a blue one. I believe that such matters will become very important in the not-too-distant future, and that color therapy as opposed to light therapy will have an important role to play. It is important to allow a role in any future therapy for the interplay between the conscious and the unconscious. This will help us to develop healthy judgment concerning the peculiar way that substances work on the human being through baths, for example. It makes a great deal of difference whether the impression made by external applications is cold or warm. It must be understood that a cold impression, a cooling effect of a compress or bath, indicates that the substance itself is the active therapeutic principle. It is the effect of the particular therapeutic substance that is important in this instance. It is not the substance itself that is important, however, if the effect of an application, such as a compress, is warming rather than cooling. The substance used is almost irrelevant in this case, since it is the warming effect that must be considered. The origin of the warming effect is irrelevant to the effect itself. In the case of cold compresses, then, we must always pay attention to how we can tincture the fluid or water being used with a substance. We can elicit the effectiveness of these substances when we are able to make them work in cold water, that is, if they are soluble at low temperatures. In contrast, unless we are using etheric substances or highly aromatic substances, which constitute a somewhat different case, because their effects are also present at high temperatures, we cannot produce any significant direct effect from solid substances that do not dissolve easily. We will not be able to induce real healing effects with warm compresses or baths. On the other hand, if substances similar in nature to sulfur or phosphorus, such as sulfur itself, accompany a warm bath, they will be especially able to develop their corresponding therapeutic effects. The important point here is the subtle observation of relationships such as those I have just presented. At this point I would like to say that you will find it very useful to establish an archetypal phenomenon of some sort. It is interesting to note that this method played a great role when medical knowledge and so on were still cultivated on the basis of the mysteries to a greater extent. In those times issues were stated in terms of archetypal phenomena rather than theoretically. For example, one such statement was, by taking honey or wine internally you strengthen the forces of cosmic origin that work in you. <laughs> we might also say that this strengthens the forces of the I, capital, which would be the same thing. I think such a statement <clears throat> makes it very easy to gain an overview of the subject. <clears throat> also, quote, by rubbing an oily substance into your body, you weaken the harmful effects of the earthly forces within you, close quote, that is, of the forces that counteract the effect of the I in the organism. And, quote, 
By finding the balance between sweet strengthening from the inside and oily weakening from the outside, you will live long. Close quote. The physicians of antiquity also said, quote, Rub yourself with oil to remove the damaging influences of the earth, and if you are able to do so, if your organization is not too weak, strengthen the forces of the eye with honey or wine. Thus, you strengthen the forces that lead to old age. Close quote. Any statement such as this was meant to express the archetypal phenomenon of the matter. It was intended to point people in the right direction, through facts rather than through theorems or dogma. We must make our way back to this approach because it is much easier to get your bearings among all the many substances of the outer world if you can refer back to archetypal phenomena rather than to abstract so-called natural laws, which leave you in the lurch whenever you want to tackle anything concrete. I would like to present you with a few of these archetypal phenomena that are easy to state. Quote, By putting your feet in water, you evoke abdominal forces that promote the formation of blood. Close quote. Here you have an archetypal phenomenon that points you strongly in the right direction. <clears throat> quote, By washing your head, you evoke abdominal forces that regulate elimination. Close quote. These archetypal phenomena are very informative because they encompass the lawfulness and reality of the issues. The human being is present in statements such as these because, of course, they would make no sense if I were not thinking about the human being. The fact that I am thinking about the human being is very important in all these areas. Once again, these things point to a more spatial interaction of forces in the human organism. A temporal interaction is also present, however, and we encounter it clearly when we observe people who have been mishandled in their childhood or early adolescence to such an extent that for the rest of their lives they can cultivate only things that should actually be cultivated in adulthood rather than things that should be cultivated in adolescence and childhood. <clears throat> Let me express myself more clearly. During adolescence, human beings develop certain forces that shape the organism during that same period. Not everything that takes shape during adolescence, however, is immediately put to the right use. Shaping the organism during adolescence also serves to store up something that becomes effective only during adulthood. I might say that certain organs that are built up during childhood should not be used then and there. Since in adulthood, however, it is no longer possible to build them up, they are kept in reserve for later use. For example, people should be educated through imitation up to the second dentition, after which authority should play a big part in their education. If this is not taken into account, organs that should remain in reserve for adulthood may be called upon prematurely. With modern materialistic ways of thinking, People may object and say that how we use imitation or authority could not possibly be so important. In fact, however, it is tremendously important because the effect carries over into the organism. For example, it is very important to allow children to grow into liking a particular food by imitating the sympathy their parents or teachers have for that food. That is, you bring the imitative principle into connection with developing an appetite for a particular food. An extension of the imitative urge is then present in the organism. Later the same is true of authority. <clears throat> to put it briefly, if organs, these are very delicate structures of course, that are meant to be held in reserve for adulthood are called up during childhood the terrible illness that we call schizophrenia appears. Since this is the real basis of schizophrenia, appropriate education is an excellent preventive. 
At the moment, what we are attempting in the Waldorf School can be implemented only after the age of six or seven and cannot yet be extended to early childhood education, but, as I described in my booklet titled The Education of the Child, schizophrenia will disappear if it becomes possible some day to place education as a whole in the service of the knowledge that comes from spiritual science. Shaping education in this way prevents people from calling on their adult organs prematurely. This is something that must be said with regard to appropriate education. The opposite also exists in life. It involves saving organ effects for later that should unfold only during adolescence. Throughout life, there are demands placed on organs that exist primarily for the benefit of childhood and adolescence, but the consequences of such demands are damaging unless they gradually diminish. In this area, a great variety of causes permit such practices as psychoanalysis to intervene in human thinking as a whole in a confusing way. It is, in fact, true that the most damage is caused not by major errors, which are soon revealed as such, but by those that contain kernels of truth, since they may be taken to extremes and misused. What is the phenomenon behind the rise of a view such as that of psychoanalysis? It is this. Because of today's lifestyle, which is frequently unnatural and fails to adapt human beings sufficiently to the outer environment, much of what impresses people during childhood remains unprocessed. Such impressions simply remain a part of our psychological makeup without being appropriately incorporated into the organism as well. The slightest effect on the psychological level extends or should extend also into the organism. But a child today receives many impressions that are highly abnormal so that they must remain psychological impressions and not become immediately transformed into organic impressions. They continue to work as psychological impressions. Instead of participating in a person's entire development, they remain as isolated soul impulses. If they were to participate in bodily development as a whole, they would not remain isolated soul impulses and would not place demands later in life on the organs that exist only for the sake of adulthood and are no longer present to make use of adolescent impressions. Thus, an inappropriate situation arises. The individual as a whole is forced to permit isolated soul impulses to act on organs no longer suited to this purpose. The symptoms that then emerge can be diagnosed by means of a properly applied psychoanalytic method. By questioning the patient, it is possible to discover certain things that are still present in his or her soul life, impressions that simply have not been processed and have devastating effects on organs that have become too old to do this processing. The important point here, however, is that this route leads only to diagnosis, but never to therapy. If we use psychotherapy simply as a diagnostic method, we are doing something that is somehow justified if conducted tactfully. Many letters that have been written to me, however, claim that psychoanalysts use their receptionists like spies to unearth all kinds of issues on which they then question their patients. This happens so frequently that all of psychoanalysis has been tainted by this nonsense. But if we disregard these unfortunate incidents, and it really all depends on the moral stance of the people involved, we can say that from the perspective of diagnosis there is some truth in psychoanalysis, but it is never possible to be therapeutically effective by taking the psychoanalytic route. Once again, this is related to a phenomenon of our times. <clears throat> the tragedy of materialism 
is that it leads us away from actually recognizing matter, prevents us from acknowledging matter. Materialism is less damaging to the recognition of the spirit itself than to the recognition of the spiritual aspect of matter. Preventing the view that spiritual effects are omnipresent in connection with matter, preventing us from looking for spiritual effects in matter, blocks many considerations that should not be blocked for the sake of a healthy view of human life. If I am a materialist, I cannot possibly ascribe all the properties we have discussed here to matter. Materialism considers it sheer nonsense to ascribe these properties to matter, even though they are properties it does indeed possess. This means that we move away from the possibility of acknowledging matter for what it is. We no longer speak of phosphorus-like or salt-like phenomena and so forth, because all this is seen as nonsense. We move away from both the possibility of acknowledging the spirit in matter and the possibility of studying formative effects properly. Above all, we move away from the insight that each human organ has the dual task of being oriented toward consciousness and toward its own solely vegetative process. This view has been lost in one area in particular that we will now discuss, namely how we consider the teeth. <clears throat> From the materialistic perspective, teeth are seen as mere chewing instruments, more or less, but that is not all they are. Their dual nature becomes evident from the very fact that while a merely chemical investigation suggests that they are related to the skeletal system, from a phylogenetic perspective they actually develop out of the skin system. The teeth in particular have a dual nature, but their second nature is extremely well concealed. If you compare animal teeth to human teeth, you will see that what I said in the very first lecture about the element of weight, which the entire ape skeleton presents, is especially strongly expressed in the structure of an animal's jaw and teeth. In a certain way we see the effects of uprightness even in the human mouth. This is related to the fact that teeth are not merely chewing implements, but also very important suction devices. On the one hand, they have an outer mechanical effect, but on the other hand, they also have an inherent inner suction effect that is very delicate and spiritualized. At this point, we are forced to ask what the teeth, excuse me, what the teeth actually draw in. For as long as they can, they draw in fluorine. They are suction devices for drawing in fluorine. We human beings need very small quantities of fluorine in our bodies. And at this point I'm going to say something that may shock you. If we do not have it, we become too intelligent. We become so intelligent it almost destroys us. Fluorine's effects tone us down to the appropriate level of stupidity that we need in order to be human. We need fluorine in small quantities to constantly counteract the process of becoming too intelligent. <clears throat> Early dental decay, which is a lessening of the effects of fluorine, points to excessive demands that are being made on the teeth's ability to draw in fluorine. It points out that something is making the person in question defend him or herself against stupidity. We will speak about these issues later, although there is not much time left. The person in question is destroying his or her teeth so that the effect of fluorine does not cause excessive stupidity. Just think about this extraordinarily subtle connection. Our teeth decay so that we don't become too stupid. This shows you the intimate connection between effects that are useful to human beings and the damaging effects that are the opposite pole of the pendulum swing. Under certain circumstances, we need the effects of fluorine so that we do not become too intelligent. 
We can also do ourselves damage, however, by making these effects too strong, in which case we destroy our teeth through the activity of our organs. These are issues I ask you to ponder carefully because they are related to extremely significant processes in the human organism. The end of Lecture 16 This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Introducing Anthroposophical Medicine. This is Lecture 17, given in Dornach on April 6, 1920. To the extent allowed, and on the basis of the content of the last lecture, I will have to summarize a few topics that will shed real light on this whole issue and make it bear fruit. Consequently, although this can only be a beginning, it is good that we can take two days to address this matter. In relation to what I said yesterday about dental development and tooth decay, I would like to say a few things that are also generally appropriate to illuminating the matter of the healthy and the sick individual. It is not good to take discussions, such as those we engaged in yesterday, in an overly materialistic sense, because it is important to see an external process, such as tooth decay, as only the outer symptom or consequence of a specific inner process that is concealed from outer perception. You will understand the entire process of tooth formation if you look at it in conjunction with other processes in the human organism that appear to be quite far removed from it. Consider, for example, a familiar phenomenon that we assess properly only if we know how to think about it in connection with the process of tooth development. It is well known that young women can have perfectly healthy teeth until the delivery of their first child and then their teeth decay. This is extremely enlightening with regard to the connection between toothache or tooth decay and the organism's entire constitution. In addition, we must also consider the very interesting connection between what is going on in someone's teeth and that person's predisposition to hemorrhoids. These are all connections that prove that the most strongly mineralizing effects in the human being, on the one hand, because tooth formation is one of the most mineralizing processes, are intimately related to the individual's entire organizational process, on the other, and are revealed in relationships and dependencies that go all the way through to the opposite end of the human being. Our view of the process of tooth development is very much influenced by the undeniable fact that at the conclusion of this process, when the teeth have emerged from the gums and their outer covering has developed, a living human structure is turned over to the external world as a mineral entity. The enamel that covers the teeth is almost completely closed off and anabolic processes no longer take place there. In a certain sense, what we encounter there has become totally inorganic in character. I believe I pointed out yesterday that the building up process is less relevant than the continuous breakdown that occurs in teeth throughout a person's lifetime. Although we must acknowledge that our internal organization, with its anabolic activity, can do very little at the outer boundary of the human organization where the tooth's outermost part develops, we must bear in mind that this internal organization is also related to catabolism, the process of destruction, and that the question of how to delay the onset of this breakdown in the individual is much more important than the other matter, the building up process. It would be totally erroneous to believe that tooth decay is entirely the result of outer damage. This needs to be taken into consideration. <clears throat> Furthermore, what I said yesterday about the function of fluorine 
in relationship to tooth formation applies essentially to the period of childhood when tooth development is proceeding from the inside out. Most of this period is only the preparatory stage of tooth formation because the second teeth develop deep within the organism, within the entire organism, before becoming outwardly visible. Fluorine's formative process culminates when fluorine achieves some kind of stable state of equilibrium in a substance on the surface of the teeth, when it is bound to this substance and is at rest in a certain sense. Its rest is disturbed, however, when the teeth begin to decay and to move into d the direction of breaking down. There is a subtle process that emanates from the teeth and is related to a formative process brought about by fluorine. This latter process, the fluorine process, pervades the entire organism and persists throughout the person's life. Prophylactic treatment of this syndrome is predicated on what I have just said. For example, I might say that much of what has found its way into Waldorf education, apart from other factors that influence a child's healthy development, is calculated to prevent premature tooth decay in those attending the Waldorf school. Strangely enough, with regard to such health prerequisites of the body's periphery, a great deal depends on appropriate education during childhood. Unfortunately, as at present, the point at which Waldorf education can begin to influence tooth formation is a little too late in terms of the prophylactic dental process that needs to be implemented. It would actually have to begin somewhat earlier. Nonetheless, since the teeth appear gradually rather than all at once, and since the effects of the inner process persist for a long time, something can still be achieved, even though the children come to us only at age six or seven, but it is not really enough. It is both possible and important, however, to do what I told you earlier, namely to carefully check the quality of tooth development as the first tooth is appearing. There is reason to object that this presents certain difficulties, since the process of tooth formation begins well before the crown breaks through in its finished form. This is correct, but the teeth themselves are not the only evidence of the state of tooth formation. We will find that children who are clumsy with their arms and hands and legs and feet at age three, four, or five that is, who do not easily learn to use their arms and legs, or especially their hands and feet, in a coordinated way, will also tend to have difficulty incorporating the process of tooth development in the right way. In the functioning of their arms and hands and legs and feet we see the same pattern that emerges in the process of tooth formation. This is why the tooth forming process is regulated to a great extent if we encourage children at the earliest possible age to run in a way that makes them move their feet artistically, for instance in the kibitz step, where they have to brush their feet against each other as they walk. In addition to foot dexterity, training children's fingers to be skillful greatly promotes the process of tooth formation. In our handwork classes in the Waldorf School, you will find the boys learning to knit and crochet along with the girls. Everything is done equally by boys and girls, and even the older boys, boys are still enthusiastic about knitting. This is not done on a whim. It is all done to make the children's fingers dexterous and skillful, to drive soul into their fingers. <laughs> by driving soul into their fingers, we especially promote everything related to the process of tooth formation. It makes a difference whether we let children sit all the time and be lazy or encourage them to run around, whether we permit their hands to remain clumsy or encourage them to become skillful. It makes a difference because later everything we have neglected in this regard appears in the form of premature tooth decay.
more in the case of some individuals and less in others, of course. We can say that the earlier we begin training people in this way, the more we are able to influence and slow down the process of tooth decay from this direction. Because it is so difficult to intervene in any way in anything related to tooth development, we will find that we need to consider processes that seem quite far removed. I have been asked how fluorine is absorbed into the organism. Does it come in through the enamel from outside, or through the saliva, through the dental pulp, or the bloodstream, or the like? You see, fluorine as such is a process that shapes the human being, and spending a lot of time agonizing about how the substance is absorbed is not at all the important issue. As a rule, we need to consider only the usual process of nutrition. That is how compounds containing fluorine are absorbed. We simply need to delineate the very ordinary process of nutrition in order to see how fluorine compounds are brought from the periphery to the places where they are to be deposited. The important point is that fluorine, as such, is much more widespread than we think. A great deal is present in various plants, relatively speaking, of course, since we really need very little. The fluorine forming process, in particular, is present in plants even when fluorine is not evident in chemically detectable amounts. We will discuss this in, a more, in more detail shortly. Fluorine is always present, even in any water we drink, so there is no need to make a special effort to get enough. The important consideration is that the body is organized in a way that permits it to master the specific and extremely complicated process involved in fluorine absorption. But to put it in conventional terminology, you would have to say simply that the bloodstream transports fluorine to the right place. Then there is the question of whether the enamel of fully erupted teeth continues to be nourished. It does not. This is clear from what I explained earlier. But we do need to pay attention to something else that takes place there. We might say that spiritual scientific investigation of the area where the teeth form and the surrounding area reveals an extremely vigorous activity of the etheric body, which is free and only loosely connected to the physical organization at this point. The activity that can be observed here, this etherically mobile organizing that is constantly going on around the jaws, is by no means present in such a free form in the human abdomen, where it is mostly closely bound to physical organic activity. This relates to several phenomena I mentioned earlier. Releasing the etheric body's activity from the physical organism, as happens in pregnancy, immediately calls forth significant changes in the other pole, in tooth structure, and hemorrhoids are similarly related to the fact that the effects of the physical body and etheric body are going in separate directions. But when the etheric body becomes independent in this lower end of the human organism, it is immediately pulled into the organization at the other end, where it is associated with the opposite effect the destructive effect. Enhancing and intensifying normal healthy organic activity on the lower end, which happens in a healthy sense in pregnancy, but in an unhealthy sense in a sick person, works regressively or destructively on the teeth in particular. It is especially important to take note of this effect. It is possible to raise the question of whether therapeutic intervention is necessary in cases where everything I told you about education and the outer effects of fluorine does not work adequately. The human organism is so complicated that medical treatment must sometimes intervene in place of mere education. From a macroscopic perspective, hand and foot coordination are fluorine effects. The effect of fluorine is not what our imagination imposes on it when we think in atomistic terms. 
It is the constitution a person develops when his or her fingers become supple and dexterous, when the legs become agile. The effect of fluorine appears on the surface of the human organism and continues toward the interior. It is the inner continuation of what happens in external activity. Not only the teeth, but also the fact that a child doesn't know how to do anything and cannot become skillful shows us that the child's education has been bad. Then we need to intervene prophylactically in the organism in some way. It is very interesting to note that if we experiment with an aqueous extract of the sap of horse chestnut bark, that is, with an esculine extract, and administer a very high dilution internally, it is possible to regulate tooth preservation if we do not start too late. Footnote, Esculin, E-S-C-U-L-I-N, a glucoside, which is C15H16O9, that absorbs ultraviolet light, obtained from the inner bark of the horse chestnut, Esculus hippocastaneum, and the roots of the yellow jessamine, gelsemium sempervirens, sorry for the pronunciation, end of footnote. This is another interesting connection. The sap of horse chestnut bark actually contains a substance that builds up our teeth. We can always find something in the macrocosm that is important in some way for our internal organization. This effect is related to the fact that esculin expels chemical activity from the substances it works in. It renders their chemical activity ineffective. Strangely enough, when we beam a spectrum through an esculin solution, the chemical effects are expelled from the spectrum. The elimination of chemical effects is also what we see when we give the organism a very dilute aqueous extract. It it must be an aqueous extract of esculin. Then we see that the process of overcoming chemical activity and working toward mere mineralization is the same as the tooth-forming process in the organism. The only difference is that this process, which otherwise takes place on a merely external level when chemical activity is eliminated, is permeated by the organizing forces present in the human organism. Even ordinary chlorophyll works in a similar way, although it is administered differently. The force inherent in the bark of horse chestnut and some other plants is present in chlorophyll in a different form. In this instance, however, we must try to extract the chlorophyll with an etheric substance, and then we need to apply it externally to the abdomen in the form of a a liniment instead of administering it internally. If we massage the abdomen with etherized chlorophyll, the effect on the organism with regard to tooth preservation is the same as when we administer esculin internally. These therapies need to be tried out. Presenting the statistical results would surely have a significant impact on the outer world. Once the dental pulp is dead, we must attempt to make the entire organism receptive to absorbing fluorine, but this is no longer a matter for general dental treatment. All this shows how strongly dental treatment to the extent that it is possible to treat the teeth at all, is related to all the growth forces of the human organism. What I have explained about esculin and chlorophyll points us in the direction of forces that are essentially related to very subtle growth processes tending toward mineralization. The simple fact of the matter is that our higher development toward the spirit is purchased at the expense of of our teeth. We pay for it with a general regression of the tooth forming process. This is also true from the phylogenetic perspective. In comparison to the process of tooth development in animals, this process regresses in humans. It shares this regressive character, however, with the regressive processes that are omnipresent 
in the organization of the human head. I have guided you here to modes of observation that can become significant in assessing the whole process of dental development. We can now add another perspective that will be the basis of a few more discoveries. At this point I am going to interject a seemingly unrelated subject, namely the issue of diet, which also has to do with what we have just been discussing. Dietary questions are extremely important because their significance is social as well as medical. We could spend a long time debating the significance and validity of various peculiar diets, but the main consideration is that any dietary restriction makes people antisocial. This is where the social and the medical aspects collide. The more special needs we have in terms of nutrition, or the more inclusive they are with regard to the outer world's influences, the more antisocial we become. The significance of the Last Supper was not that Christ gave each disciple something special, but that he gave them all the same thing. The possibility of coming together as human beings to eat or drink is of great social significance, and anything that tends to interfere with this healthy social aspect of our human nature needs to be handled with some caution. When individuals are left to their own devices, they develop all kinds of dietary likes and dislikes, not only on the conscious level, but also with respect to internal processes on the organic level. In this sense, it is really not so important to look at people's likes and dislikes, tolerances and intolerances in the usual way. Because by learning to tolerate something that he or she could not tolerate before, that is, by, becoming, by overcoming a dislike in the broadest organ-based sense, an individual achieves more on behalf of his or her organization than could be achieved by any amount of abstention from foods that are not well tolerated. Inherent in overcoming something we cannot tolerate is the literal, not figurative, production of an organ that has been destroyed or even of a new organ, if we look at the etheric body. The organ-forming force is inherent in nothing other than the overcoming of dislikes and intolerances. Beyond a certain point, catering to the appetite causes the organs to hyper, hypertrophy or degenerate rather than benefiting them. Thus further damage is caused whenever too much is done in terms of accommodating what the damaged organism wants to ward off. However, when the attempt is made to gradually accustom a person to something that seems poorly tolerated, the bodily organization is always strengthened. In this respect, contemporary science has obscured almost everything we need to know by subscribing to the external principle of natural selection and the survival of the fittest, which is really quite superficial, at least initially. Roux extended it to the struggle among the organs in the human being, but that is very superficial indeed. Footnote Wilhelm Roux, R-O-U-X, 1850 to 1924, German zoologist, considered the founder of modern experimental embryology, professor at Halle from 1895 to 1921, I'll try the German here, uh, book is Der Kampf, Der Teile im Organismus, uh, 1881 uh, translation, The Struggle Among the Parts of the Body. Also, Über die Zeit der Bestimmung der Hauptrichtungen im Froschembryo, uh, 1883 timetable for the development of the primary directions in the frog embryo. And there's another one here, Über die Entwicklungsmechanik der Organismen. 1890, the, development, de the Developmental Mechanics of Organisms. End of footnote. This principle becomes important only when you can actually examine what is going on internally. And then it must be said that strengthening a single human organ, or in fact any organ in the phylogenetic series, is always based on overcoming an antipathy. The shaping of organs takes place as a result of overcoming antipathies, 
while the growth of an existing organ is due to indulging in sympathies, which, however, must not be taken beyond a certain point. Sympathy and antipathy do not exist exclusively on the tongue or in the eye, e-y-e. The entire organism resonates with sympathy and antipathy. Each organ has its own sympathies and antipathies. An organ develops an antipathy to what built it up under particular circumstances. It owes its development to the very thing to which it then develops an antipathy once it is complete. This phenomenon would lead us much deeper into phylogeny if we would simply consider that the initial impact of the environment is to stimulate inner defenses or a discharge of antipathy against it and that this process progressively perfects the organization. <clears throat> in the realm of organisms, the fittest in the struggle for survival is the organism that is the most able to overcome inner antipathies and replace them with organs. This is part and parcel of the organ forming process. Considering this provides us with a clue to how to look at dosages of remedies. In the organ forming process itself you see a constant oscillation between sympathy and antipathy. The genesis of the human organization is essentially connected to the development of sympathy and antipathy and dependent on the alternation between them. The relationship of sympathy to antipathy in the organism is the same as the relationship of lower potencies in which actual material effects of a substance are utilized to higher potencies. <laughs> the effect of the high potency is the opposite of that of the low potency. This fact is related to the overall organizing force. In a certain sense it is quite true, as I mentioned yesterday from a different perspective, that certain effects that are active in the organism in a particular way during the first period of life are reversed in later stages or may also be postponed. As I told you yesterday, this is the basis of schizophrenia on the one hand and on the other of the development of isolated areas of the soul that take hold of the organism in inappropriate ways later on in life. We will be able to cope with these conditions only when our science has again been spiritualized a bit, when we have reached the point of no longer attempting to cure psychiatric disorders by soul-spiritual means, and when we are willing to ask what is out of order in the organs when a particular mental illness appears. <clears throat> in the reverse situation, strange as it may sound, we have much more reason to turn to psychological factors in so-called physical illnesses than in so-called mental illnesses. In mental illnesses, psychiatric findings are never helpful much beyond the diagnostic stage. They must simply be studied in order to discover the possible location of the problem in the organism. The ancients equipped us with the terminology for these connections. It was not for nothing that they gave the mental symptoms of hypochondria thoroughly materialistic names such as abdominal boniness or cartilaginous abdomen. Even if the hypochondria worsened to the point of insanity, they would never have turned to anything other than abdominal disease as the primary cause of such a condition that appears on the psychological level. We need to progress to the point of being able to see all so-called matter as a spiritual entity. We are suffering tremendously today from the fact that the materialistic way of thinking is the extension of a Catholic asceticism that attempted to achieve the spirit by despising nature. Our modern worldview has chosen to take up certain aspects of this ascetic trend. Consequently, it assumes that the processes taking place in the lower body are crudely material and need not be taken into account. In actuality, this is not true. The spirit is at work in all these things, 
and we need to know how it is working. If I link the spirit at work in the human organism to the spirit at work in some external substance or activity, spirit works with spirit. We must get away from despising nature. We must once again reach the point of being able to imagine all of nature as spiritualized. Right now, when materialism is at its height, we are seeing the emergence of a desire to use all sorts of hypnosis and suggestion to treat individuals with so-called abnormal conditions. Don't you find this striking and tremendously significant for an overall reform of medical thinking? <laughs> Concerns that seemed far removed from materialism are appearing in this materialistic age when we have lost the possibility of educating ourselves about the spiritual aspects of mercury, antimony, gold or silver. The crucial point here is that we have lost the possibility of educating ourselves about the spiritual aspect of matter. That is why we want to treat the actual spiritual aspect as such, which is what happens in psychoanalysis, where we attempt to guide the spiritual aspect. Healthy views on the spiritual properties of matter must once again assume their rightful place. Keeping alive this belief in the spirituality of outer material substances is by no means the least of what the homeopathic tradition accomplished during the 19th century. Because superficial allopathic medicine, unfortunately, has turned more and more to the belief that we are dealing only with material aspects, with outer material effects of substances external to the human being. This is one of homeopathy's most important accomplishments. It leads us to pay attention to the patient's psychological state when we are diagnosing so-called physical illnesses on the one hand, and on the other to look for physical damage when an abnormal psychological state is strongly apparent. <laughs> Actual physical illness should always raise the question of the patient's temperament. If we find the patient tends to be a hypochondriac, this by itself will lead us to treat the person in a way that has a strong impact on the lower part of the body. This means that we must use materially active substances, that is, lower potencies, to treat this particular person. In contrast, if we find that a person, apart from his or her current illness, has a lively mind and a sanguine temperament, we will need to resort to higher potencies from the very beginning. In short, we need to ascertain the patient's psychological state, especially with regard to physical illness. We encounter this overall psychological state even in children in a certain way. If the child does not already have phlegmatic tendencies, if we cannot clearly perceive the potential for this temperament, which should appear only at a later stage of life and even then only to a limited extent, then schizophrenia is unlikely to appear. Making the distinction between inner activity and inner passivity is especially important. Just think, when we make use of hypnosis, in our so-called psychotherapy, we are placing someone entirely within another person's sphere of influence and preventing independent activity. Blocking a person's activity or inner initiative has consequences in outer life that are important for the person's entire biography. <laughs> if we observe the corresponding phenomenon in children, it plays into their dental history with consequences later in life. We will talk about this more tomorrow. For example, I may consider it necessary for myself to avoid certain foods and emphasize others. After what I said earlier, it is important to take this into account. I may consider it important to adhere to a particular diet, which may be very good for me. It makes a considerable difference, however, whether I have arrived at this diet through independent experimentation on myself, or whether I simply let the doctor prescribe it for me. Please don't be offended by this bald statement. From the materialistic point of view, it looks as if a diet that is good for me serves the same purpose regardless 
of whether I have taken the initiative to work it out on my own, possibly under my doctor's guidance, or whether I simply let the doctor prescribe it. Ultimately, however, the effects of the diet the doctor prescribes, although initially helpful, will be damaging in that they make it easier for me to succumb to age-related dementia than would otherwise have been the case, while my active collaboration will make it easier for me to remain intellectually spry in old age, although of course there are other contributing factors. In any form of hypnotherapy, this interplay of activity and inactivity is largely suppressed because I enter a state of dependency, relinquishing not only my own power of judgment, in that I do what the other person suggests, but also the power to direct my own will, which I hand over to the other person's judgment. For this reason, the use of hypnotherapy should be restricted as much as possible. It can be used only if we are certain that for other reasons the person in question will not be harmed by this will impairment, which is present in everyone who is treated in this way, and that the impairment is outweighed by the greater service we are doing this person by helping him or her with hypnosis for a time. In general, however, spiritual science must recommend the therapeutic effects of substances of the atmosphere and of movement in the human organism, in short of everything other than direct spiritual influence. Therapeutic effects should emerge actively from either the conscious or the subconscious of the person in question on the basis of independent initiative. These things are so very important because they are the most sinned against in this materialistic age and infected by prevailing views. It is terrible to experience today how all these tendencies toward hypnosis and suggestion are being carried over into education. This is a terrible trend, and we may be able to see clearly in this regard only once we can answer the question of how the activities of the human organism that wake it up work in contrast to those that put it to sleep. When people go to sleep and dream, they imagine movements that are not obeyed by voluntary actions. In this instance, people are at rest with respect to the outer world, while their conscious experiences are in motion. The reverse is true in eurythmy. Eurythmy brings about the exact opposite of going to sleep, namely a stronger waking up than the ordinary manifestations of consciousness. The hypertrophied imagery of dreams is removed, and in its place a healthy development of the will is driven into the limbs. The will organization is driven into the limbs. If we begin to study how differently the vowels and consonants of eurythmy affect the lower and upper parts of the human being, we realize that a significant therapeutic element can be sought in eurythmy. Footnote C. Rudolf Steiner's Curative Eurythmy, Collected Works 315. This course was held one year later during the second course for physicians. And then also the, the book Anthroposophical Spiritual Science and Medical Therapy, uh, Collected Works 313. That's the end of Lecture 17. This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Introducing Anthroposophical Medicine. This is Lecture 18, given in Dornach on April 7th, 1920. I believe that our scientific medical education truly needs an infusion of what might be called a return to the true causes of pathological phenomena. In recent times, the tendency has become ever more pronounced to disregard actual causes and to look at surface occurrences. A phenomenon related to this superficiality is the fact that whenever we begin to read or hear a description of any type of illness, current medicine or pathology almost always informs us about what has invaded the human organism, about what kind of bacillus 
provokes the illness in question. It is terribly easy, of course, to repudiate any objections to the idea of lower organisms invading the body for the simple reason that it is no longer necessary to first prove that these lower organisms are present. Since distinct forms of microorganisms are indeed evident in different illnesses, the tendency to suggest a connection is quite understandable. But even on a superficial level, this view gives rise to an error that actually completely distracts us from the main issue. If bacilli appear in large numbers in a certain part of the body in the course of an illness, they naturally provoke symptoms, as do any foreign bodies in the organism. As a result of the presence of these bacilli, all kinds of inflammations appear. But if we then attribute everything to the activity of the bacilli, directing our attention only to what the bacilli are doing, we are distracted from the true cause of the disease, because any habitat that lower organisms find suitable for their own development within the human body is brought about by the primary causes. For once, we need to pay attention to the domain of primary causes. In order to do so, we must briefly turn our attention again to modes of observation that we have already begun to use. Consider once again the plants that cover the surface of the earth, the sum total of the earth's vegetation. We must be clear that the vegetation growing up out of the earth toward cosmic space is not simply sent forth by the earth, it is also pulled upward by forces that are just as much a part of plant growth as the forces working into it from out of the earth. In plants there is a constant interaction between the earth's forces and the forces of the supra-earthly cosmos. What is the effect of these non-earthly forces which are always present in our environment? If these forces that work in from the cosmos came to full expression and took hold of the plants totally, that is, if the planets did not ensure that these forces could also withdraw, plants would have the tendency to turn into animals as they went on growing from the stem to the flower and the seed. The tendency to turn into animals is always present. <clears throat> what works in from the cosmos is counteracted by the tendency that works out of the earth, the tendency to suppress plant existence and to become mineral within the plant kingdom. What I am drawing your attention to here is the fact that plant existence as such holds the balance between the tendency toward mineralization or salt deposition in plant tissue and the tendency toward inflammation or becoming animal-like. This process is always present in outer nature, but it is also present in an internalized and centralized form in the human organism. Because it possesses lungs, the human organism is a real little earth, and everything that works out of the lungs works downward in the same way that the forces that work from the earth out into the plant organism work upward. The effect of everything that works via respiration and cardiac activity to counter the internal metabolism of the lungs and so forth is similar to the effect of this cosmic factor out here. And there's a drawing. In a human organism, everything that is concentrated in cardiac activity needs to be kept separate from what is organized and concentrated in the lungs internal metabolism. These two activities must be kept separate. They can be allowed to affect each other only through an etheric or astral diaphragm inserted between them. At this point we must raise the question of whether this diaphragm exists, since I am using this word only to suggest an image. Is there a diaphragm that prevents the activity of the head, throat, and lungs from mingling with the activity of the abdomen and chest 
in any way except through the external rhythm of respiration. Such a diaphragm does indeed exist, and it is the external rhythm of respiration itself. At this point you begin to see how harmony is achieved between the upper and lower regions of the human being. What we call rhythmical activity in the human being, the rhythmical trembling that is expressed outwardly and physically as respiratory rhythm, extends into the activity of the etheric and astral bodies and separates the earthly forces of the upper part of the human being, which are con concentrated in the lungs, and the heavenly forces of the lower part, which work from below upward through the activity expressed in the heart, just as they work from the periphery of the cosmos toward the center of the earth. Imagine that this rhythm is not properly is not working properly. The metaphorical diaphragm, which, though not physically present, is created by these rhythms striking against each other, is out of order. What happens then is analogous to what happens when the earth's activity becomes too strong in plants, when earthly salt-forming activity affects the plants too strongly and they become overly mineralized. What happens then is that an, quote, etheric plant, close, close quote, which is built into the lungs and grows up out of them, just as physical plants grow up out of the earth, becomes the cause of pulmonary hardening or the like. Here we find that the mineralizing tendency that is present in plants can also become too strong in the human organism. <clears throat> On the other hand, the animalizing tendency can also become too strong. When this happens, it creates a domain in the upper part of the organism that should not be there. The organs of this part of the body become embedded in an etheric domain, as it were, that is favorable to an activity that should not be promoted in the organism, namely, the life of microscopic plants or animals. Where they come from need not concern us, but we do need to be concerned about the creation of the habitat that supports them. This favorable habitat should not be present. Its activity ought to extend throughout the organism rather than becoming a special enclosed domain. When it extends throughout the organism, it supports the life of the entire organism. But when it takes the form of a little enclosed domain, it becomes a life-supporting medium for the microscopic plants or animals whose presence we can confirm in everything that causes illness, or at least in much of what causes illness in the upper areas of the human being. To solve the riddle of how bacilli influence the human organism, we must return to rhythmical activity and its disturbance and see whether a special domain is created in place of a general domain extending throughout the organism. Without returning to the spiritual causes, we will never be able to solve this riddle. <clears throat> exactly the same thing that affects plant life here, above the earth's surface, that is, also affects the outer life of animals and human beings. Like plants, humans and animals are also influenced by certain forces that come from the cosmos above the earth and counteract the forces arising from within. And again that drawing on page 253. The forces coming from within the earth are localized in certain organs in the upper part of the human being. While the forces streaming in from outside are localized in abdominal organs. Once again, if I may put it in this way, a dividing wall must be erected between their respective acti activities. Normal regulation of this separation is accomplished by human spleen activity. This is another example of how rhythm is active in the human organism. But this time the rhythm is different from respiratory rhythm, which takes place in little oscillations and runs through the entire life of the human being. 
if respiratory rhythm is not in order, diseases having exclusively to do with the upper part of the human being will arise. But since digestion extends both downward and upward, it is also possible for diseases that are caused down below to be present in the upper region of the human being. We must distinguish between these two types of illness. We must not think of the human being as divided according to some rigid scheme because individual systems intermingle. However, there must be a dividing wall between what works from above as if coming from the earth and what works from below as if coming from heavenly space. In fact, our upper regions send their forces out to meet the forces of the lower human being. And in each human individual, the rhythm between the two must be regulated. This rhythm is expressed in the right proportion of waking to sleeping. Each time we wake up is one beat of this rhythm, and each time we fall asleep is another beat. This rhythm of waking, sleeping, waking, sleeping incorporates other rhythmical processes, similar peaks that are brought about simply because even in the waking state we are awake in our upper parts but asleep in our lower parts. The rhythmical activity that is continually taking place between the upper and the lower parts of the human being is caught up in larger rhythms only through the alternation of waking and sleeping. Imagine that a breach occurs in the boundary that consists of this rhythm between the upper and lower parts of the human being. In this case, the activity of the upper part of the human being usually breaks through into the abdomen from above. An etheric breach occurs and etheric activity that ought to take place only in the upper human body begins to occur in the lower part. Certain finer forces break through. Once again, this results in the creation of a domain that should not be there. Instead of being localized in the abdomen, this domain ought to be distributed throughout the human being. As a result of a breakthrough of this sort, the abdomen is poisoned, in a sense. When upper body activity intervenes in this way, abdominal activity can no longer take place as it should. In addition, however, the new domain that is created here provides a habitat for microorganisms. You might say that a breakthrough from above provokes typhoid fever in the human being, the concomitant phenomenon of the appearance of an abdominally localized milieu creates what the typhus bacillus requires in order to flourish. Here you see a clear separation of primary and secondary factors. This separation will also enable you to see the need to distinguish between the ultimate causes of such an illness and the symptoms of inflammation that appear simply as a consequence of the presence of a whole army of intestinal fauna or flora, especially in the small intestines. All the physical symptoms in the small intestines, including bacilli, including the activity of these plant or animal microorganisms, are simply reactions to upper functions breaking through into the lower functions of the human organism. Again, we need not discuss where these bacilli come from, because they would not be able to lead their animal or vegetable existence there if the right milieu had not been created for them. All these phenomena are mere consequences. The important point is to aim for the primary factor rather than secondary ones when we are looking for therapeutic procedures. We will speak more about this later, because we can talk about these matters only once we are in a position to go back to their true origins. This is almost impossible for modern conventional medicine because it excludes any view that shifts from a material process to a spiritual process. Everything material, however, is underlaid by spirit. 
You will easily be able to explain the characteristic clinical picture of typhoid fever, for example, if you take a good look at what I have just discussed. Keep in mind that this illness is very often coupled with symptoms of pulmonary mucosal inflammation and disturbances of consciousness. Pulmonary symptoms develop because an activity is withdrawn from the upper part in order to appear down below. Once the breakthrough has taken place, what has appeared in the lower part of the human being is no longer present at all up above. Similarly, the upper organs that are the vehicles of consciousness can no longer work effectively when what is supposed to mediate their activity has penetrated the lower parts of the body. The entire clinical picture of typhoid fever appears before your mind's eye if you really look at this primary cause. Under certain circumstances, this collection of unrelated outer symptoms, something we otherwise always look at only from outside, appears so forcefully in an individual's subconscious that it even becomes possible to paint it on the basis of its existential connections. The urge to objectify it prophetically comes about before it paints itself upon the interior of the organism. Then the person in question feels the urge to record what is slipping away from the upper body as blue spots and what is slipping away from the abdomen as red spots on canvas. Imagine an individual who feels called upon to be an artist instead of a tailor or a shoemaker but has little experience in painting techniques. If this person is also robust enough, and this does not require outer robustness, to constantly suppress abdominal illnesses that are attempting to arise within, you can experience how this person objectifies these abdominal illnesses on canvas rather than allowing them to gain a hold on the body. You can find the products of this strange activity in much of expressionistic painting, where you can see the artist's state of health with regard to the lower body in the red and yellow colors. Try to see everything you find there in blue and purple as a poetic expression of the state of the artist's upper body, of the lungs and everything that accompanies lung activity as it moves rhythmically toward the head. If you take a close look at examples such as this, you will find a remarkable harmony between an individual's general actions and the internal state of his or her organization. From how an individual presents him or herself, you will develop a certain intuition or image of how that person's body is functioning. It is totally false to believe that a person's outer actions and appearance the sole activity he or she undertakes in the outer world is dependent only on the nervous system. It depends on the entire human being. It is an image of the entire human being. Simply by recalling the childhood appearance of someone condemned to carry all of the damaging consequences of delayed growth over into later stages of life, we can develop intuitive insight that enables us to observe in the child what the intellectual adult of advancing age will be like. What prevents him or her from growing upward makes this person appear ungainly but strong. Whether a child appears heavy or light will allow you to get an intuitive idea of how that child will grow. <laughs> Numerous similar phenomena point out how the entire gesture of the way a person presents him or herself is nothing more than the interaction of the inner parts of the human organism, an interaction that has been brought into movement. It would be desirable to include such considerations in medical curricula. Just think, the most favorable prerequisites are already present. It is easiest for young people in their early twenties to immerse themselves in such subjects. As soon as we reach our thirties, we lose this gift 
and it is no longer so easy to find our way into such matters, although it remains possible to acquire intuitions of this sort through very strict self-education. Certain potentials that persist in spite of the destructive drill that takes place in our secondary education, and especially in higher education, also make it possible for us to find our way back to any active forces remaining from our childhood and train ourselves to see the human being in this way. But placing the right value on a more subtle sculptural study of anatomy and physiology for medical students would do a lot to improve medical treatment as a whole for humankind. Illnesses that appear in the form of epidemics must also be considered in terms of their primary causes. The rhythm between head and chest, which has its crudest expression in the rhythm of respiration, is easily damaged in individuals who also tend to allow certain atmospheric or supra-earthly phenomena to influence them strongly. Others whose respiratory system is healthily organized from the start will tend to resist such influences. It is always possible for other disruptive causes to intervene, of course, but let me choose an example that will help us understand what this all depends on. Suppose that during a particular winter the sun's activity, note that I said the sun's activity, not the effects of light, is strongly influenced by the outer planets, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn. Sun activity that can assert itself independently because Mars, Jupiter and Saturn are at a distance would have a different effect from this particular winter constellation. <coughs> During a winter like this we can notice that the atmospheric phenomena are different. In susceptible individuals this has an unusually strong influence on the rhythmical activity taking place between the chest and the head whose crudest expression is the rhythm of respiration. We can say that this constellation significantly strengthens the tendency to regularize this rhythm in people who were born in healthy circumstances and are internally robust, although outwardly, of course, they may be quite frail. In these people, respiratory rhythm is very strongly regulated, as is the general rhythm between the head and the chest. An internally reinforced rhythm such as this is not easily affected by outside influences and severely damaging factors are required in order to influence it. An influence such as the one I described, however, has an exceptionally strong effect on people in whom this rhythm is irregular in some way because an already damaged rhythm tends to permit further damage. All predisposed individuals who live on parts of the globe that are particularly affected by this heavenly constellation are can candidates for so-called influenza. These influences absolutely must be present to lay the groundwork for an illness like influenza. In a different case, something more complicated is present. Even though each individual rhythm is an independent entity, both the ongoing rhythm that finds its crudest expression in respiration and the rhythm influenced by sleeping and waking, human rhythmical activity as a whole is such that these rhythms, taken together, form a unity in the entire human rhythmic system. The lower rhythm may assert itself too strongly, relatively speaking, because the upper rhythm, the head-chest rhythm, is weakened. When the upper rhythm is too weak and deviates from its proper position, it is susceptible to being made even more irregular by the lower rhythm. In this case, the lower rhythm, which emanates from the activity of the spleen and from other organ activity that we will speak about later, works upward too strongly, creating the predisposition to hypertrophy of the upper digestive process with all its concomitant symptoms. Once again, a domain is created that especially favors the growth of certain lower organisms. The total picture that then appears 
is one of symptoms of inflammation and paralysis creeping into the upper organization, while the beginnings of organ malformations or new organic growths also appear there. In short, we have the symptomatology of diphtheria. I might call this excuse me. I might call this a breakthrough. I might call this is a breakthrough from below upward in the opposite direction from the breach that occurs in typhoid fever from above downward. This second type of breakthrough is essentially provoked by what I have just described. In all these issues, the age of the person in question must also be considered. During childhood, the entire interaction of the upper and lower parts of the human being, as well as the rhythmical activity that mediates between them, is totally different than it is in later life. In childhood, for example, the upper region of the human being must exert a much stronger influence on the lower region than is the case later on. In reality, children quote-unquote think much more than adults do. Strange as this may sound, it is nonetheless true. Instead of becoming conscious, children's thoughts simply go into the organism and appear in its growth and in the forms it is developing. This application of thought activity to the body's formative forces is especially pronounced in the first years of life. Once the body no longer needs to use so much of the formative forces for its own purposes, they are held back and become the force that forms the basis of memory. Therefore, memory appears only after the organism's demands on the formative forces are reduced, because the forces that underlie memory on the organic level are transformed forces of growth and development which are especially called upon to shape the organism during the very first years of life. Everything is based on metamorphosis. When what we encounter on the mental or spiritual level is only the re-spiritualization of an activity that worked on a bodily level when spirit was moving into matter. This explains why children have strong forces of resistance to many abdominal symptoms. Heavenly factors, supra-earthly factors, appear principally in the abdomen. <laughs> Here again, imagine that a strong reflection occurs in the human abdomen as the result of a particular supra-earthly constellation of the sun to other planets. What will the consequences be? There will be little effect on adults in whom the rhythmical activity between the upper and lower parts of the body has already settled down to some extent. But children will have to forcefully resist the cosmic factor that wants to be reflected in the abdomen. And when a particular cosmic constellation affects a child's lower body very strongly, the upper body must resist exceptionally strongly. <laughs> this convulsive, overly strong application of forces in the upper part of the children's bodies causes epidemic cerebrospinal meningitis. This process certainly provides insight into how outer, non-human nature sends these influences into the human being. I might say that if you take this as a background for your observation, observations, you can paint a picture of the entire symptomatology of meningitis, right down to the stiffening of the neck muscles. Because of the exertion taking place in the upper part of the child's body, inflammatory symptoms must appear in the upper organs, in the men meninges of the spinal cord or brain, which then result in the other symptoms. It is especially necessary to sharpen our eye for seeing the human being in the context not only of the interactions taking place between different parts of the body, but also of the interactions taking place between internal human factors and natural factors external to the human being, or even external to the earth. To my way of thinking, astrology in its present form is highly suspect, 
so of course I do not want to see it get out of hand as a result of views like this. It is enough to be aware of where such conditions come from, and we will indeed find this awareness necessary with regard to healing in particular. But it is really not so important to say that some illness or other is brought about by the quadrature of this star to that star. Under certain circumstances this can be useful with regard to a cosmic diagnosis, but it is not the point. The point is to be able to heal. <clears throat> Tomorrow we will move on from today's considerations to the substances in outer non-human nature that have a defensive effect, that contain forces opposing what intrudes into the human organism in this way. In this context, recognition of the upper and lower areas of the human being really must assume more of a place in medical science, because in my opinion the strength of this recognition would enable physicians to collaborate in the interest of human health. When physicians specialize, they lose interest in the human being as a whole. I do not mean at all to say that physicians should not specialize. The techniques that appear over the course of time simply do bring about a certain degree of specialization. While this is happening, however, collaboration among specialists should also increase. <clears throat> this becomes evident when we consider pyrrhea, for example, which was mentioned in one of your questions. When it appears we are dealing with not only a local problem, as many people believe, but with a predisposition, or worse, that involves the entire organism and is simply localized in the gums. For example, it would be very helpful if dentists who note the appearance of pyrrhea in their patients would make a habit of alerting other physicians to the fact that these people are likely candidates for diabetes. What we have already described to a certain extent as coming to expression in diabetes is easy to treat as long as it remains in its germinal stages in the upper part of the human being as pyrrhea. Much too little attention is paid to the fact that the lower part of the human being can overcome the upper, resulting in inappropriate impoverishment or enrichment of either the upper or the lower part. If the tendency to inflammation appears first in the upper region, the disease takes one form. If it appears in the lower part of the human being, it assumes the opposite or polar form of the illness. A, great, a very great deal depends on making this distinction. <clears throat> for this reason, we will also seem quite understandable. Excuse me. For this reason, it will also seem quite understandable that the etheric body, which contains all of an individual's forces for growth, must work differently during childhood than at a later age. In childhood. The etheric body must intervene in physical functioning to a much greater extent. It needs organs that provide it with direct points of contact. This is especially important during the fetal period, but it is still the case in the first stage of childhood, when both growth and form development are taking place, when sculptural forces need to take effect as growth continues. This is why we need organs such as the thymus gland and to a certain extent also the thyroid gland, whose tasks are greater in childhood. Later these organs regress and may degenerate if physical forces take hold of them too strongly. <clears throat> Chemical activity within the organism simply must be stronger during childhood. Later this chemical activity tends to be replaced by the action of warmth. I might say that a change human beings undergo in the course of a lifetime is symbolized by the spectrum or more than symbolized if we look first at the more chemical portion of the spectrum, blue-violet, then at the light portion, green-yellow, and finally at the warmth portion, red. Human beings undergo a process of organization in this same direction, and there's a drawing. In childhood we are more dependent on chemical action, but then we move on to light action and later to the effects of warmth. 
the organs that make it possible for the etheric body to promote chemical activity in the physical body are glands such as the thyroid, thymus, and adrenals. Because these organs are in some way bound to chemical activity, the flesh tones of human skin are related to their activity, that is, to the underlying etheric activity, to a great extent. One of the effects of the adrenals, for example, is to make a person either pale or red-cheeked, and so on. Adrenal degeneration has to be expressed in the coloration of the skin. To see deeply into these connections, simply recall that patients with so-called Addison's disease, which is due to adrenal degeneration, turn brown. This points toward a certain chemical activity in the organism. It is especially relevant to the fetal period, while the action of light comes into consideration more in life after the age of about 14. Later still we move more into the action of warmth. <clears throat> All this constitutes an important indication with regard to the course of an individual's life. Childhood, especially the fetal period, represents a preponderance of the salt process, while the middle portion of life, that is still somewhat closer to childhood, represents a mercurial process of sorts, and later life a sulfur process in the context I have just described. In childhood, we must pay the most attention to the salt process, in midlife to the mercurial process, and at a later age to the sulfur-like or phosphorus-like process, regulating each in its turn. If you look at the fact that the human organism also includes the trinity of organized chemical activity, an organized light process, and an organized warmth process, that is, organized salt, mercury, and sulfur processes, you will also get an idea of how life as a whole organizes the human being. In the child, lifestyle, by which I mean not merely nutrition, but everything the person does, works through chemical activity, intervening strongly within the organism. In the very young person, the light process, which I might say is stronger, intervenes in the entire organism in a way that can also sow the seeds of psychological disturbances of all sorts, because adolescents are most susceptible to impressions of the outer world. <clears throat> Whether the outer life that enters us strongly at this age is built up logically or illogically is of great importance for our entire soul constitution in later life. We will continue talking about these questions tomorrow. In particular, we will move on from the pathological aspects we have discussed today to therapeutic aspects. The end of Lecture 18 This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Introducing Anthroposophical Medicine. This is Lecture 19, given in Dornach on April 8, 1920. I will attempt to elaborate as much as possible today and tomorrow. In the case of a very preliminary stimulus such as this, which was all this course could provide, the important concern is to become more familiar with how spiritual science describes the route by which outer substances enter the human organism and also with the counter-effects of these substances. Having a complete overview of how any substance takes effect points the way to discovering its use as a remedy. And we can then judge for ourselves, which is much better than simply following guidelines, stating that this is for this and that for that. Today I will once again have to begin with a topic seemingly very far removed in order to arrive at something very close at hand. One question that appeared repeatedly a question that necessarily interests all of you is the question of heredity. It plays an exceptionally large role in assessing both the healthy, or at least relatively healthy, individual and the sick individual. It must be said that modern materialistic science studies heredity only on a very abstract level, without many practical consequences for real life. Strangely enough, or at least 
exotericists find this strange, because to esotericists its laws are readily apparent. When we begin to study a subject like heredity seriously, we find that everything that is important for people to know about cosmic connections is outwardly revealed and quite visible at some point or other. In each instance an outer manifestation of some sort reveals the forces that are present in external nature but hidden, although very active, in the human being. We must keep these forces particularly in mind as we study heredity, because everything related to heredity is constantly being negatively influenced and veiled in illusions so that we cannot assess it properly. Having arrived at a conclusion about heredity, we find that it does not concur with other phenomena. This is because the facts of heredity in particular are so shrouded in illusions, which in turn is related to the fact that male and female are involved in heredity in ways that are very lawfully governed but are difficult to determine. Heredity is indeed governed by laws, but the manifestations of these laws are such that their regulating principles cannot always be apparent immediately. The horizontal position of the beam of a scale is governed by laws, but if we keep adding weight so that it tilts to the right or to the left, it is difficult to adhere strictly to the principle. Something similar is true of hereditary phenomena. Their governing principle is akin to the forces that bring the beam of a scale into horizontal position. As it manifests, however, this lawfulness is extremely variable, because male and female are always involved in specific ways in heredity. The male always transmits what human beings owe to earthly existence and earthly forces, while the female organism is more oriented toward transmitting what comes from the supra-earthly cosmos. We might say that the earth constantly makes demands on the man, organizing him through its forces, and that it is also the root of the development of male sexuality. In contrast, the heavens are constantly making demands on the woman and bringing about her form. Their influence predominates in all of her internal organizational processes. This distinction points back to something I have already said. If conception results in a female being, she tends to be taken up by the heavens, if I may put it like that, to become ever more incorporated into supra-earthly processes, while a male being tends to be claimed by the earth to an ever-increasing extent. Thus the earth and the heavens work together, because what I am saying should not be interpreted as meaning that only the heavens work on the female and only the earth works on the male. <clears throat> both influence both, but the balance tilts toward the side of the heavens in the woman and toward the side of the earth in the man. The laws governing this balance, although very strict, are also variable. This variability has certain consequences, however. There is something intrinsic to the woman's organism that continually resists earthly factors. But, strangely enough, this is the case only within her own organism and does not apply to the embryo she carries. In the female organism, the heavens struggle against the earth is restricted to all the organizational processes that lie outside the formation of the ovum, that is, outside of what is incorporated into the reproductive processes. This means that the female organization is always withdrawing from the forces inherent in the reproductive process. In the woman, everything surrounding reproduction withdraws from these forces. We can say that while the man has some tendency to pass on all that is inherent in the reproductive forces, that is, everything that can be passed down via heredity, 
The woman, although she tends to withdraw from heredity herself, has a stronger tendency to transmit hereditary characteristics through her egg-forming forces. For this reason, we can ask the question, how can we work within human society to counteract destructive forces of heredity? It is indeed true that the forces of heredity do not come to a halt in the face of either so-called spiritual or so-called physical factors. This is apparent, for example, in the fact that diabetes can very easily appear in the next generation of a family that tends heavily towards psychiatric illnesses in the present generation, so that a metamorphosis in direction occurs between generations. How to rescue people from destructive effects of heredity is indeed an exceptionally important question. The only way to do so is to make sure that womankind remains as healthy as possible, because healthy women will draw supra-earthly influences into our earthly processes, and as a result the processes that work to transmit hereditary damage by means of the embryo will be constantly combated from within the female organism. Therefore, a society that pays close attention to women's health resists the damaging influence of earthly forces on heredity by appealing to the effects of balancing forces that work in from above the earth. The female organization acts as the only earthly accumulator of these forces. It is extremely important to take this into account. What I have just said is universal. It applies to all earthly and supra-earthly forces. It becomes very visible, however, when we are dealing with hemophilia, with blood diseases. It is important to point out the fallacy of talking around the subject of hereditary phenomena in general terms. We must study those instances where the facts obviously point to hereditary the hereditary. Please study the manifestations of heredity in hemophiliacs. You will discover a strange phenomenon that is familiar to all of you, but which is only an outer expression of what I have just explained. You will find that in the bloodline of a family, hemophilia is transmitted only to male individuals by female individuals. That is, a woman who is the daughter of a hemophiliac tends to transmit the disease to her male offspring, even though she herself does not have it. She simply carries it because it, she belongs to that family. The men, in contrast, become hemophiliacs. But if they marry women who can be proved not to come from hem hemophiliac families, their disease is not transmitted. If you analyze this tendency you will find it to be a clear manifestation of what I have just said. The phenomena among hemophiliacs demonstrate the actual processes of heredity much more clearly than any of Weismann's recent experiments. Footnote August Weismann, 1834-1914, first a physician, then professor of zoology in Freiburg, he postulated that acquired characteristics cannot be inherited. His book is Die Continuität des Keimplasmas als Grundlage einer Theorie der Verbung, 1885. The continuity of germ plasma is the basis of the theory of heredity. End of footnote. We must also regard these circumstances as important to an overall assessment of the human organization, which needs to be assessed in accordance with what can influence it. What is the real basis of hemophilia? Even superficial consideration reveals the answer. The clotting ability of the blood is absent, so that even the slightest opening toward the outside can make a hemophiliac bleed to death. As a rule, clotting sets in at the wound site after a nosebleed or a dental operation, for example. But in hemophiliacs, this does not happen. All their symptoms are entirely due to deficient clotting ability. There must be a factor in their blood 
that counteracts clotting and works too strongly, so that it is not negated by the forces that begin to work in from outside when blood clots. When blood clots, we are dealing with forces that work in from the outer world. If there is something inherent in the blood that does not allow these forces to prevail, the blood tends to be too fluid. You will easily discover that a strong tendency toward excessively fluid blood is related to the entire development of the human eye, capital, but not in a superficially apparent way. It is related not to the ideational process, but to the will that is active in the human eye. Thus the organization that causes excessive fluidity in the blood is associated with everything that strengthens or weakens a person's will. Let me give you a nice historical example that once again demonstrates that we can discover certain secrets of nature if we interpret them correctly. It was not nature alone, however, but history that presented the famous case of the young women of Eng Engadin, which you may have heard of. Footnote. There is no documentation of any such case as Engadin, E-N-G-A-D-I-N. -E the incident referred to may well have occurred in Tenna, in the Safin Valley, which, like Engadin, is also in Graubünden. See the novel by Ernst Zahn, Die Frauen von Tano, The Women of Tano. Tano is a poetic variation on the name Tenna. End of footnote. These two young women represent a phenomenon that can thoroughly illuminate the understanding of the human being that medicine needs. These young women who came from hemophiliac families made a firm decision not to marry. They went down in history as personal opponents of the transmission of hemophilia. We must make sure that we are looking at the right place in such a case. It is certainly not characteristic of all young women from hemophiliac families to abstain from the urge to reproduce. Doing so requires the cultivation of a strong subjective will of the sort that works in the eye rather than in the astral body. These, this strong will must have been present in these two young women, which means that what they had in their eye, in their will, was in some way related to the forces that are active in hemophiliacs in particular. Consciously strengthening these forces is easier among hemophiliacs than among non-hemophiliacs. If this fact is acknowledged in the right way, it provides a certain insight into the blood's intrinsic forces and enables us to recognize their interaction with what lies outside the human being. By studying the forces in the blood that are related to conscious will, we discover the nature of the human will's entire relationship to forces outside the human being. The fact of the matter is that certain external forces have this particular inner relationship to human forces of will, because the last thing expelled into the natural world in the course of evolution had to do with conscious human will, or with human will in general. This was the last thing to be forced out into the natural world. It is important to study such processes, which shaped the human being, but have been forced out and are now present in external nature. These excluded processes have intrinsic qualities that show how they relate to the process of shaping the human being. One such phenomenon has been studied for a long time. It is extremely difficult to get an overview of it, because modern intellectual people have difficulty re-enlivening the forces that preserved atavistic medicine even into the 17th and 18th centuries. This phenomenon that has been studied for so long is antimony and everything related to it. Antimony, you see, is a very strange material, which is probably why some people who dealt with it, such as the legendary Basilius Valentinus, studied it so intensively. Footnote, it is said that Basilius Valentinus, Basil Valentine, lived at about the end of the 14th and the beginning of the 15th century. Writings attributed to him include the tract of the great stone. Concerning natural and supernatural things, 
and the triumphal chariot of antimony. End of footnote. Certain characteristics of antimony immediately re- reveal that it is very strangely enmeshed in the processes of nature. Possibly one of the least of antimony's characteristics is that it has an exceptional relationship to other metals and other substances, frequently appearing in conjunction with them, especially in other substances sulfur compounds. In the natural world, sulfur, as you know, has a specific effect that we have discussed, at least briefly. Antimony's affinity for the sulfur compounds of other substances demonstrates how it is enmeshed in nature. This is even more emphatically evident, however, in another of its characteristics, namely that whenever the opportunity arises, antimony appears in the form of bundle-like crystals, that is, it wants to turn into a line and move away from the earth. Wherever antimony accumulates in linear formations, we can literally see the supra-earthly forces of crystallization entering the earthly domain. Crystal-forming forces that otherwise appear in more regular forms are active in these bundled, needle-like antimony formations. The substance of antimony itself reveals how it is enmeshed in the overall activity of nature. Similarly, the smelting process that yields antimony in the form of fine filaments points very strongly to antimony as a revealer of crystallization forces. Another quality of antimony is that it can oxidize and even burn in a certain way if it is heated until red hot. The white smoke that forms has an affinity for cold objects to which it adheres, producing the well-known quote, flowers of antimony, close quote, footnote. Flowers of antimony is the white smoke from an alchemical fusion process that produces antimony. <clears throat> Basil Valentine stated, quote, the flowers of antimony may be prepared in different ways, which all students of alchemy know. Some mix them with salt, ammonia, drive them through the retort, and then wash out the ammonia. These flowers are of a beautiful white color. Others sublime them over a strong fire, and by placing three alembics on each, si- on each other, they manage to prepare white, yellow, and red flowers at the same time. But the most potent and efficacious flowers of antimony are prepared as follows. Mix red flowers of antimony with coal catar of vitriol and sublime the mixture thrice. Then the essence of vitriol ascends with the flowers, and they become more effectual. Extract the flowers with spirit of wine, remove sediment, distill spirit of wine in bath of St. Mary, till there remains a dry powder, which represents the purified flowers of antimony. These flowers act as a gentle purgative. They cure tertian and quartan fever and most other diseases. Close quote from the Triumphal Chariot of Antimony, Vincent Stewart Publishers, London, 1962, pages 122 to 124. End of footnote. Again, this is an example of how the force of crystallization is discharged in conjunction with other bodies. The strangest characteristic of antimony, however, is its ability to ward off certain forces that I have described over the course of the days we have spent here as being sub-earthly in some respects. These are the forces at work in electricity and magnetism. If antimony is subjected to a specific type of electrolysis, that makes it precipitate at the cathode. And if this antimony deposit is then touched with the tip of a metal rod, the antimony explodes. It creates little explosions. The resistance to electricity that antimony develops, if we simply give it a bit of help, is quite characteristic of this substance. Here we can see how antimony fits into the context of nature. Other substances do not demonstrate their place in nature so forcefully. We can understand what an obvious natural example is attempting to show us only when we assume that the forces present in nature are at work everywhere, but are simply exceptionally evident in substances where they are concentrated and localized. The force working in antimony, for example, is actually present everywhere. To coin a phrase, the 
antimonizing force is at work everywhere. This antimonizing force also has a regulating function within the human being. But human beings in normal health draw this force in from outside the earth. In a normal state of health, we turn not to the antimonizing force in the earthly element or to its concentrated form in the substance antimony, but to the external, supra-earthly force of antimony. The obvious question is, what is this antimonizing force in the supra-earthly domain? From the planetary perspective, it is the interaction of Mercury, Venus, and the Moon. When these planets work together, rather than separately, their effects are not mercurial, silvery, or coppery. Instead, they work just as antimony works in the Earth. This effect can be investigated simply by looking for the effects on human beings of constellations in which the three forces of the Moon, Mercury and Venus, neutralize each other through the appropriate oppositions and quadratures. <clears throat> when they work together in this way, their interaction is related to the effect of earthly antimony. The force that works out of the Earth from all of its antimony is the same as the force that works down on the earth from these three planetary bodies above the earth. This leads me to mention another point. You see, the makeup of the earth is such that it is actually incorrect to speak of an individual piece of antimony. All of the antimony within the earth's organization forms a unity, as does all of the silver or all of the gold. The individual piece is not very important. If you take a bit of antimony out of the earth, you are simply rummaging around in the antimony body that is incorporated into the earth. The bit belongs to the entire antimony body. Having said this, we have described one aspect of what becomes visible through the effects of antimony. In nature, however, any effect is always opposed by a counter-effect, and objects are given form through the alternation between effect and counter-effect. Now we need to look for the opposing forces. They reveal themselves as soon as we recognize that antimony forces are acting on the human being whenever anything regulated in the interior pushes its way outward. These same antimony forces are at work in the clotting of blood. This is where the antimonizing factor is active. Wherever the blood shows a tendency to pause and clot in its ongoing existence and flow, the antimonizing force is present. Wherever the blood attempts to evade the force of clotting, the opposite effects are present. As curious as it may seem, we always encounter anti-antimony forces in hemophiliacs. We find these anti-antimonizing forces in them. These forces, however, are identical to what I would like to call the proteinizing forces, if you will, the forces that form protein, whose organizing effect promotes protein formation. I repeat, the protein-forming forces are what prevents blood from clotting. In this way, we develop a knowledge of the connection between antimonizing and proteinizing factors in the human organism. I must say, I believe, that studying the interaction between these factors would yield fundamental insights into disease processes and healing processes, because proteinizing activity takes all the forces that sculpt and shape in the natural world and incorporates them into the human or animal organism for purposes of building up substance. Antimonizing forces are the sculptors, as it were, that work inward from the outside to give shape to the substances that build up our organs. Thus the forces of antimony have a certain relationship to our organs' internal organizing forces. It is important to distinguish between these two processes when you consider the internal structure of an organ such as the esophagus. You can trace its internal structure in a certain way without first taking into account the type of process that takes place there, how semi-liquefied food moves along the esophagus and so on. 
<clears throat> along comes the esophagus and works together with what is entering the human organism. On an abstract level, we can separate the processes taking place in an organ's internal structure and what happens when the organ works together with what enters the human being from outside. These are two different processes. In the organ itself, the antimonizing force is at work in the human being. The human being is antimony if we exclude from consideration everything that is introduced from outside. The human being is antimony. The important thing is not to overburden the normal, vital, internal, organ-forming force with this antimony-forming force. We must not introduce it into life's normal processes or we will poison the organism through over-stimulation. When it needs stimulating more strongly, however, we must administer something that we ordinarily should not. At this point you turn to the effect of antimony, which results from the qualities of antimony that I described earlier. This effect varies in specific ways depending on whether you apply the antimony externally or internally. When you administer antimony internally, you must try to use such a high dilution that it can penetrate into the upper part of the human being. If you are successful, this will have an exceptionally strong stimulating effect on disturbances in organ development or internal organ processes. For this reason, highly potentized antimony will play a major role in certain forms of typhoid fever. In contrast, when antimony is applied externally in the form, in the form of ointments and the like, the effect is somewhat different and is achieved by using lower potencies. Under certain circumstances, of course, we may also need to appeal to the power of more highly potentized antimony for the sake of external parts of the body. In general, however, its external effects are induced by using lower potencies. This example demonstrates that an exceptionally useful therapeutic substance such as antimony is interposed into what I described as a lawfully regulated course of events oscillating between two poles. For this reason you will have to restrict the internal use of antimony to patients who are very strong-willed and external applications to individuals who tend to be weak-willed. You will have to make this distinction. As you see, the antimony in the mineral kingdom manifests as something that has an inner relationship to human will. In that, the more conscious human will becomes, the more it feels the need to bring about an effect opposite to that of antimony. Human will has a destructive effect on all the forces that I described earlier as constituting the characteristic action of antimony. In contrast, antimony supports everything that has an organizing effect in the human being and is influenced by thought forces, especially the subconscious thought forces that are still active in children. Antimony's forces work together with these particular forces. Thus, if I introduce antimony into the human organism arbitrarily and it makes its own forces strongly felt, it develops a powerful phantom within the human being. The inner forces of the organs are immediately stimulated and nothing is left over to allow them to work together with what has been introduced into the organism. The result is vomiting and diarrhea which are due to the fact that the action is confined to the organs themselves and does not extend to their surroundings as the counter effect also attests. Footnote. Critical to understanding this section is the concept of digestion as an external process that moves through the human body. <laughs> A process that is essentially the same as, though more complex than, the digestive process of a single-celled organism when it secretes enzymes into its environment 
and absorbs the dissolving nutrients. The human digestive tract may be viewed as surrounding, not containing, the food passing through, which is still quote-unquote outside. This quote-unquote outer, in this case, should not be thought of as outside the body in the usual sense. End of footnote. If your constitution permits, you can counteract the damaging effect of antimony by means of a drug that is the instinctive choice of people who enjoy anything that supports and regulates their circulation and other rhythmical processes. Drinking coffee has a balancing effect on these rhythmical processes. I am simply recounting the facts here. My intention is not to recommend this practice because in a different connection it can be very harmful to take the regulation of these rhythmical processes away from the I itself. But that is not what I want to talk about here. I simply want to discuss the facts. Drinking coffee brings a certain order into the rhythmical processes when the soul of the person in question is not strong enough to do this itself. This is why coffee is an antidote of sorts to the toxic effects of antimony. Coffee re-establishes the rhythm between the internal action of organs and what lies outside them. This interaction is also maintained by a particular rhythm. The real reason for drinking coffee is to bring about an ongoing rhythmization between our internal organs and what happens to ingested foods in the vicinity of these organs. All of this brings us back to a different activity, namely the proteinizing process. It and all the processes on this other side are strengthened, not the side of the organ's own internal power of organization, but the side where digestion occurs as the result of the organ's outer action. Everything that happens on a mechanical level in the movement of the intestines and everything else that takes place in digestion is in intimate interaction with the proteinizing forces, the forces that build up protein and are the opposite of the antimonizing forces. I must now point again to something I indicated earlier. The oyster, with its shell formation, is a very instructive object, or subject if you prefer. To a lesser extent, the same process is present in the calcium excretions that produce eggshells. What is the basis of this? What is a shell such as an oyster shell or an ordinary eggshell? It is a product that the egg or oyster tissue has to get rid of by forcing it to the outside, since its continued internal presence would kill the egg or the oyster. The development of such a shell is based simply on the need to maintain life. If we eat oysters, we are also eating the life process that manifests in external shell formation. I can put this to you in these terms, I hope, although I would have to speak somewhat more selectively if I wanted to please modern science. In any case, along with the oyster, we eat this life process, a proteinizing activity that opposes the antimonizing process. By doing this, we promote everything in the human being that leads to the development of typhoid systems. Eating oysters is an exceptionally interesting practice. It promotes the formative force, the proteinizing force, in the human abdomen. By doing so, however, it frees the head of certain forces, removes them from the head. As a result, someone who has eaten oysters feels less weighed down by the forces that want to work in the head. In a certain respect, eating oysters makes the head empty. We must develop these proteinizing forces constantly because we cannot allow the head to be burdened with form-giving forces. People who eat oysters, however, take this too far, striving passionately toward empty-headedness and also increasing the possibility that certain forces will break through in the direction of the abdominal organs, as I described yesterday. That is, the tendency to typhoid fever is encouraged. 
You can imagine how this tendency, if present, calls for treatment with antimony. <coughs> we will be able to successfully summon up what is needed to internally combat the tendency to typhoid fever by implementing simultaneous internal and external treatment with antimony, especially by rubbing in antimony ointments while administering high potencies of antimony internally. This therapy would work from both sides to counteract the tendency toward typhoid. You see how we always attempt to consider the human being in the context of the cosmic environment. The significance of this view becomes apparent when you investigate the human being's connection to what happens in the natural world when the direct forces of the earth are opposed in a particular way. Plants are able to resist the direct forces of the earth and to save up many of their formative forces for the time when flowers and seeds develop. The usual process of plant formation that underlies edible plants is based on the use of a very specific total amount of earthly forces in building up the plant. <clears throat> if a plant resists these earthly forces, it is exposed to supra-earthly forces as it approaches its culmination in the development of seeds and fruits and it then begins to want to look out into the world in the same way as higher beings. This plant is greedy to perceive, but has no su organs to support perception. It remains a plant, but it wants to develop an organ similar to the human eye, EYE. It cannot develop an eye, however, because it has the body of a plant rather than that of a human or an animal. As a result, this plant develops into deadly nightshade, Atropa belladonna. I have tried to vividly describe the process that takes place in the development of deadly nightshade. Because it evolves into deadly nightshade and because the forces with which it ultimately imbues its black berries are already present in its roots, this plant is related to everything in the human organism that moves in the direction of the type of form development that can happen only in the domain of the senses to something that lifts human beings out of the domain of their internal organization and into the domain of their senses. The process that takes place when tiny potentized amounts of deadly nightshade are ingested is extremely interesting because it is very similar to the normal version of this same process, namely the waking up process that is mingled with dreaming. Waking up, the state when we are still not quite perceiving with our senses and sensory perception, is still directed inward, pervading our consciousness with dreams, is a type of deadly nightshade process within the human being. Deadly nightshade toxin evokes the same activity that otherwise takes place when our waking is pervaded with dreams, but makes it permanent. In nightshade poisoning, this process is not subsumed by consciousness, and the transitional phenomena persist. We see an interesting circumstance here. If evoked at the right times, processes that may also be symptomatic of poisoning are quite at home in the human organization. As I just described, the development of deadly nightshade is a plant's mad desire to become human. We might say that human waking has something of the character of this process of developing into nightshade, but it is toned down, kept within limits, and restricted to the moment of awakening. Thus, if you want to relieve the body of inner proteinizing processes, to make excessively strong proteinizing processes withdraw, and to deflect the physical aspect into the soul, so that what otherwise works in the body's substances works in the form of hallucinations, you administer potentized belladonna. In this instance, you relieve the body of an activity by shifting it to the soul. This is what we encounter in the usual macroscopic effects of belladonna, although, as I said at the beginning of this lecture, there they are confused and pervaded with illusions. 
If you push people to remain in the waking up stage instead of moving on to full wakefulness, you kill them. People are always in danger of losing their lives when they wake up, but they wake up so quickly that this danger is overcome. There are interesting connections here between a so-called normal process, one contained within normal limits, and a process that becomes abnormal as soon as it transcends normal limits. These are processes that the physicians of antiquity repeatedly attempted to trace, or so it seems to me. When they spoke of engendering the homunculus, this more or less meant that in the clairvoyance they still possessed, they could see something like the antimony phantom. The proteinizing forces that oppose antimony appeared to them projected out of their own being in the external formative process they carried out in their laboratories as antimony forces developed. They externalized a force that normally remains within the human organism. They saw the homunculus appear in the course of the process in which antimony assumes its various forms. In the process that was played out there, they saw the homunculus. The end of lecture 19. This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Introducing Anthroposophical Medicine. This is the le uh, 20th lecture and the final lecture in this cycle, given in Dornach on April 9, 1920. If the education of physicians is to continue in ways that are healing for humankind, certain things that I have attempted to point out in these lectures really must gain ground specifically the ability to think of the entirety of the healthy or sick human organism in conjunction with outer, non-human forces, substances, and effects. This way of thinking will bridge the gap between the scientific direction in medicine, which increasingly amounts to nothing more than the recognition of diseases, and the effort to create remedies and therapeutic effects. To travel this route successfully, however, we need to acquire an overall view of the human being, a view illumined by spiritual science, starting with the present status of the human being in relationship to the external world. As you know, our connection to the outer world is most highly developed in the interaction between our outer senses and the, the environment. Our more outer senses, such as the sense of sight, have little to do with internal physical effects. But as soon as we enter the domain of the lower senses, such as smell and taste, we see that our human exterior and our external interaction with the environment have been internalized. Up to a point, human digestion is nothing other than an extension and transformation of sensory activity until the intestinal processes surrender nutrients to the functions of building up lymph and blood, and even during this transition, the entire process is something of a metamorphosis of sensory activity. The lower down this activity takes place, the more organic its effect. Up to this point, we must recognize the digestive process as an extension of the process of perceiving taste. By giving this fact its due, we can lay the groundwork not only for dietetics as a whole, but also for understanding all the healing factors that are necessary in order to be effective in this particular field. This combination will also allow us to gradually and systematically recognize the damages that can occur here. Suppose you trace the effect of ammonia salts, for example, on the human organism. A believer in modern science will say that ammonia salts, such as ammonium chloride, affect the motoric nervous system of the cardiac muscles. This entire so-called motoric, or motoric, M-O-T-O-R-I-C, motoric nervous system, however, is a non-entity. Let me read that again. This entire so-called motoric nervous system, however, is a non-entity. As I have already emphasized sufficiently, 
There is no difference between sensory nerves and motor nerves, so this whole idea is nonsense. The important concern here is something essentially different. As long as the effect of ammonia salts persists, say within the domain extending from the tasting process to the process of blood formation, an internal continuation of the effects of tasting is also present. This continued effect is also an astral body process. In the astral body, it triggers a reaction such as sweat excretion, for example. Being able to grasp this first phase of human digestion as an extension of the tasting process gives you direct insight into both the excretion of sweat and in a certain way the excretion of urine. Please consider this situation as follows. When we look at the main events of this phase, we are, essentially, dealing with nutrient absorption as a result of internal secretion of body fluids. This is the main factor. Everything that comes into consideration here can be reduced, more or less, to the dissolving effect bodily fluids, excuse me, body fluids have on food. The opposite of this dissolving effect consists in the activity of the liver and spleen, which is why we had to list liver and spleen activity as belonging to the activity of water or fluids. But in contrast to the dissolving effect that occurs in the first phase of digestion, liver activity has the effect of enclosing and surrounding things, of transforming again what was accomplished in the first part of the process. We can form a fundamental image of what we encounter here by simply looking at two processes side by side. The first is what happens when I throw salt into warm water. The salt dissolves, yielding an image of what happens up to the point when nutrients are absorbed into the lymph and blood vessels. Next to this, I place a couple of rounded drops of mercury which attempt to create enclosure, to round off, organize, and create forms. This is an image of the process that begins with the absorption of nutrients into the lymph and blood vessels, a process that is governed by the liver and its relationship to the human astral body. We need this type of insight into what is going on because it encourages us to study how the outer world behaves in the formation of salt and mercury. If we always consider the human being in connection with the outer world, the outer world literally allows us to decipher what needs to be active in the interior of the organism. If we trace the path of ammonia salts further, as they make the transition to blood formation, we find that they alkalize the blood. Further along in their journey, they begin to act from the lower part of the human being and influence the upper region, where they evoke responses. <clears throat> the interesting point, however, is that a complete reversal takes place. The processes are reversed completely. We can characterize this reversal somewhat. Whereas the upper area of the human being initially attempted to perceive within the digestive tract through tasting, now the entire situation reverses. The lower part of the human being tends more toward perception, and the upper part tends more toward what now influences perception. Consequently, while previously a certain reaction set in, which I characterized as proceeding from the astral body, the process is now reversed. The response, that is, what corresponds to the response, goes from below, while what would correspond to the initial action begins from above. Thus, above, the movement of the ciliated epithelia is stimulated, for example, and pulmonary secretion is promoted. The inverse of the original direction is in effect here. Initially, the dissolving process causes movement of the liver, 
But then the liver's enclosing function induces dissolution, dispersion, and stimulation in the pulmonary functions, which are localized above the liver. Instead of dissolution taking place down below, secretion is induced in upper organs. Within the human organism, this is the route leading from the acquisition of substances via dissolution, via the salt process, to the formative process and on to dispersion, which is comparable to the processes of evaporation and combustion. To provide an image of the phosphorus or sulfur effect, where inorganic substance is ignited, imagine a simmering liquid that is continuously and actively evaporating. Juxtapose this with the droplets of mercury. This is the activity that develops both in the opposite organs, that is, in the lower part of the human being, and in the lungs and related organs in the upper human being. Having understood these internal processes, <coughs> we can also gain an idea of what can be introduced into them from the outer world. The concepts we acquire are quite far-reaching, extending even to the following activity. If you recall what we said a few days ago, you will realize that tooth development is a very peripheral activity in the human organism, and that, as such, it soon becomes the completely external mineralizing process I described. Please do not misunderstand this statement. I think it has been slightly misunderstood. I said that because tooth formation is such a peripheral process, technical external attempts to repair the teeth through mechanical dental therapy are justified if we are dealing with deterioration of the teeth after the mineralization process has set in, because that is all that can be done from outside. Mechanical treatment, including everything that is done, externally to fix the teeth and so on, is all we can do for structures that have become outwardly mineralized. We are justified in having teeth replaced when they become defective, because after a certain point we cannot take care of our own teeth from within. <clears throat> we must take care of our own fluorine-forming process, however, because it has to be there. The entire organism needs it. With respect to the fluorine-forming process in the organism, a substitute must be found for what the teeth do as long as they are still sound. There is a way of creating this substitute, but in doing so the process of reversal that I have just characterized must be taken into consideration in the right way. What is this entire process of tooth development if we consider the reality of the situation? It is the mineralizing process moving outward from within. Once the second teeth have all emerged, the goal of pushing the mineralizing process toward the outside has been accomplished. It is then countered by the sexualizing process, which moves inward once again. Tooth formation and the development of sexuality are two opposing processes that work against each other as if in a rhythm. To the same extent that tooth formation is completed, the process of sexualization proceeds in the other direction. But if you look at the situation in this way, you will also realize that a different process in the human being, namely intestinal peristalsis, which is directed inward and toward the rear, is also diametrically opposed to the direction of the tooth-forming process and has a great deal to do with it. These two processes are intimately related. That is, everything belonging to peristalsis is intimately related to everything that brings about tooth formation in the opposite direction. <clears throat> this intestinal movement is intimately associated with the human organism's use of fluorine. We might say that whenever intestinal movement takes place more quickly and intensively than the person's individuality warrants, it has consequences in tooth decay, 
and especially in everything that fluorine normally ought to be doing in the human organism. Consequently, any dentist who notices that someone's teeth are in very poor condition needs to recommend that the movements of digestion be performed slightly less intensely, which can be accomplished by prescribing either rest, in the purely outer mechanical sense, if the person's occupation permits, or remedies that calm down the digestion, specifically by slightly reducing the intensity, intensity of intestinal movement. The regulation of this activity is particularly important and is promoted by limb activity that obeys orderly laws, especially, as I have already pointed out, by activity of the arms and hands and legs and feet and by eurythmy, which imbues movement with soul. It can also be said, however, that if the gymnastic element becomes too strongly physiological, the pendulum swings back in the wrong direction making it very easy to bring about the opposite effect. This also makes it understandable why activities such as ordinary dancing, to which girls in particular subject themselves, can have a damaging effect on the process of tooth formation. So you really must not ask why girls who do a lot of dancing have worse teeth than boys. The point is that this dancing needs to be ensouled and not taken to excess. And with regard to hand activity, simply overdoing the actions involved in knitting and crocheting is enough to produce the opposite effect by using this activity properly. We can see here how a reversal takes place already in the domain of mechanical visible movement. In the first place, a reversal of the process of tooth formation takes place in digestion. But it is also very important for the movement imposed on the digestive process to be transposed into the human mov movement that serves locomotion, the ability to move in a forward direction. This inversion has aspects that are tremendously important in building up the human being. It means a great deal that human beings are able to walk forward and that their digestion is stimulated to move toward the rear. We can bring about beneficial results by accustoming a person with sluggish digestion to walk backward a lot in gymnastics, which has the effect of promoting digestive activity. From being a mere collection of empirical notes, all these phenomena are transformed into inner insight if we use spiritual science to illuminate the entire constitution of the human being. I would now like to draw your attention to another matter. If we move on to Nux Vamaka, we can certainly see that it has a wonderful effect on the human being. What is the basis of this effect? If we simply take advantage of the appropriate opportunity to study Nux Vamaka, we will gain inner insight into it. If you simply study Nux Vamaka, that's N-U-X and then V-O-M-I-C-A, Nux or Nux Vamaka, in people with hangovers, you will see what kind of an effect it has there, and this makes it easier to gain an overview of all of its other effects. In a hangover, there is a real reversal of all of human organic activity. A hangover is an extension of the process that takes place primarily in the first phase of digestive activity. After overindulgence in wine, beer, or champagne, a hangover sets in, when what occurs up to the point where substances are absorbed into the lymph and blood-forming processes continues on into these processes themselves. Then the domain of the human organism, whose real task is to dissolve substances, is transformed into a sensory organ of a sort. Instead of directing the major part of their sensory activity toward the outer world, Instead of entering into communication with the outer world and encountering the earth and its processes, people who are hung over condemn themselves to perceive internally, because what is now inside them has become very, very similar to the earth's external activity. They begin to sense the earth's rotation, and the bed begins to spin.
an earthly activity of a sort, an internal outer world is present beyond their intestinal activity in the activity of lymph and blood formation. These people have transformed themselves into an internal outer world and have horrible perceptions of processes that do not bother them at all when perceived externally. The interior of the human being is not suited to become an earth. On the contrary, it is meant to withdraw from the earth. Now, however, these people create a real earth inside themselves. It would be more appropriate to shift this earth to the outside and surround it by sensory perceivers who could view it externally, but instead these people are forced to perceive it with the outer portion of the human interior. Until a strong natural healing process sets in, which it usually does, Nux Vamaka counteracts the symptoms that arise by suppressing sensitivity to this outer thing that has been internalized. At the same time, this suppression does not disturb the internally located outer process. This relates to one of Naxvamaka's healing effects, which is to weaken the extension of the metamorphosed process of taste so that it no longer disrupts what is located beyond it. This weakening brings about a cure of sorts. <laughs> now assume that the opposite situation is present. The extended tasting process, that is the dissolving process, is impaired rather than enhanced, so that it does not go far enough. Let us assume that this situation exists. The interior proves to be too weak to adequately dissolve what is taking what is taken in from the outer world and involve it in the salt forming process. This first phase of digestion is working the way we want it to when we administer Naxvamaka, but it is doing so naturally through a different process to which the inadequately dissolved substances attempt to adapt. They cannot find the way out. They cannot cross the boundary between the process of tasting and digesting on the one hand and the process of blood formation on the other. Consequently, they look for a way out in the opposite direction, which gives rise to all the symptoms that can be alleviated simply by promoting the dissolving process that Nux Vamaka suppresses. Everything that is looking for the wrong way out can be counteracted with Thuja, T-H-U-J-A. We have just deduced the polarity between Nux Vamaka and Thuja from the constitution of the human being, which also demonstrates that we always need to look at the overall organization of the human being because it is important not to underestimate the polarities present there. The functions that drive the activity in the lower part of the human being up toward the upper part are all intensified during sleep. We must be very careful about how we attempt to characterize sleep. While it is indeed true that sleep is one of the best remedies, this is true only when sleep lasts exactly long enough to meet the needs of the human individuality in question, neither longer nor shorter. Sleeping too long makes a person sick because it causes excessive percolation through the boundary I have just described. Too much moves from the first phase of digestion over into the lymph and blood-forming process. We are constantly exposed to this danger because the lower part of the human organism is always asleep and therefore continually subjects us to the sickening of the blood. We carry the antidote around within us, however, although this antidote is, of course, attuned only to the normal process that constantly attempts to sicken us through sleep, the process that is balanced out by the iron content of the blood. Iron is the metal that is most important to human beings. It works inside us, equalizing any excess that moves from one process into the other. What I have just said explains both the diseases that result from iron deficiency in the blood 
and the fact that iron, if it is administered in a potency high enough to be related to the homeopathizing process that is evoked each time by the upper part of the human being, can always help the organism overcome the intrinsic disruptive processes that work from below upward. As you have already seen, human processes substitute for the other main metal processes relevant to the human being. In this context, I would like to briefly summarize what arises out of the whole spirit of my lectures here. Today we have once again pointed to lymph and blood formation in the human being. This process has a relationship to copper in that it is the polar opposite of copper's mineralizing tendency. We would like to make it clear to ourselves that this activity still belongs to the lower region of the human being, specifically to the uppermost portion of this lower organism, and that its relationship to copper, therefore, tends very strongly in the direction of the earth's copper-forming force, since everything related to the lower part of the human being is related to earthly processes. In working with copper, the golden rule is generally to use it in low potencies, not in doses large enough to be harmful to humans, of course, but in proportions that are all still fairly similar to its naturally occurring concentrations in the earth. <coughs> Just as the inner activity of lymph and blood formation is related to copper, everything standing at the transition between the outer digestive process and the internal digestive process of lymph and blood formation is related to the liver and especially to mercury. It relates to mercury in the same way that the other process relates to copper, with the reservation that mercury's rounding, balancing aspect already links it somewhat to the interaction between these two processes. But the processes that human beings must develop so that not too much gets into the blood, the processes that Nuxvamaka induces and Thuja suppresses, are regulated by the action of silver. At this point, the field is open to investigate outer nature with these constituents in, constituents in mind and to see nature as a dismembered human being, as it were. In this way we put the human being, whether well or ill, entirely into the context of the environment to which we are so closely related through the lower parts of the human organism. What rises into our upper parts from below through the copper-related process is regulated and balanced out by the opposition of iron. This demonstrates that human beings need iron. We always need an excess of iron processes, or chemically speaking, iron. All the other metals are present in human beings in the form of processes. In a certain respect, the human being is a sevenfold metal, but only iron is present as such, while the other metals are present only in the form of processes. Just as everything that works together with lymph and blood formation in our organs is related to copper, everything that moves outward from the lungs, opening up in the larynx and so forth, is related to iron. Similarly, the portions of the brain that serve internal functions that are more similar to the brain's digestive activity and therefore correspond to the process of transition between the intestines and the lymph and blood vessels are related to the tin-forming process, which works to ensole and regulate the digestive process in the area I have just described. In contrast, nerve fibers and related structures that represent the extension of the senses in the upper region of the human being are related to lead, which in turn corresponds to the processes of sweat and urine excretion. I might say that these things illuminate the human being and simultaneously point to how we can extract therapeutic benefits 
from the opposite effects in the substances surrounding us. We must recognize the need for spiritual science to point out how so-called psychiatric disorders are seated in the organs in many respects and how organic diseases are very strongly related to effects of soul and spirit. This is a difficult chapter. On the one hand, materialism proceeds purely on the basis of mechanics or chemistry in dealing with so-called physical illnesses, treating the human being more or less like a mechanical device. On the other hand, it has reached the point of being unable to provide more than a mere description of psychological symptoms in so-called psychiatric disorders because it has lost the ability to see the connection between the soul's spirit and the physical body. <clears throat> the intimate connection between these two aspects becomes evident when we investigate the interplay between psychological and bodily states of health in a concrete way. What promotes psychiatric illness? In the first stages of an illness, pain and other subjective symptoms appear. These symptoms are most apparent in acute illnesses and are transformed in chronic illnesses. They constitute the response of a person's soul and spirit to any type of organ damage, the withdrawal of soul and spirit from the organs in question. Pain is simply the withdrawal of the eye and astral body from the physical and etheric bodies. Pain may also be linked to a withdrawal of the etheric body, but the essence of the sensation of pain lies in the astral body and the eye. As a rule, the eye is still strong enough to perceive the entire subjective conscious process that is the opposite and counterpart of the one taking place in the physical organ. As the illness becomes chronic, this conscious process gradually withdraws from the eye. As a consequence, what is happening on the level of the soul is now restricted to the astral body. The eye no longer participates in what the astral body and etheric body are suffering. A disease of the organs moves on to become chronic. Acute illness becomes chronic. <clears throat> this is a question of conscious symptoms on the soul level, which retreat. If we we want to pursue symptomatology, we must study the individual in greater depth. Instead of asking how someone feels or where it hurts, we must ask whether he sleeps well or badly, or whether or not she feels like working. What we regard as symptoms in chronic illnesses must extend over longer periods of time and have more to do with the entire process of a person's development while immediate subjective sensations can be considered symptoms in cases of acute illness. When it comes to chronic illness, we must look more at the person's biography than at immediate symptoms. Ordinary physical chronic illness occurs when the whole process can be contained within the organ in such a way that the astral body and etheric body still participate properly in the organ's activity, sending as much as is needed into it. If the patient's constitution permits him or her to tolerate the astral body's disordered effect by way of the etheric body, on the organ in question, it will also permit the patient to take the astral body's abnormal connection to the liver, for instance, beyond a certain critical point, so that the liver no longer notices that the astral body fails to work into it in the right way. In this case, I would say that the liver recovers but becomes accustomed to the disordered effect of the astral body. If this goes on long enough, it will make its way into the soul in the reverse direction. Something the liver ought to pull into the physical body is pushed into the soul instead, resulting in depression. In a certain respect, then, the seeds of so-called mental illness are sown by overcoming chronic illnesses to the point of tolerating an abnormal connection to the astral body. 
Someday, when these matters are generally studied in this way, we will go beyond merely describing the pathology of mental illnesses. There is a lot of talk today about irregularities in processes of ideation or will activity. But as long as we do not know how the curious interaction of the liver, spleen, and other abdominal organs supports what ultimately appears in its highest form on the soul level as human will, we will not be able to find the physical counterparts of the pathological symptoms we describe. Especially in so-called psychiatric disorders, it should occur to us to implement physical methods of treatment. It may seem contradictory that spiritual science would lead, on the one hand, to physical treatment in so-called psychiatric disorders, while, on the other, pointing to the soul's role in recovery from physical ailments. But this is related to the great contrast between the upper and lower parts of the human being. It is also related to the reversal that occurs when sensory activity, introduced from outside, becomes inner sensory activity, which is the case in the extension of the tasting process, or when something that is present in the interior discharges outwardly in cilial movement or the potential for ciliary movement. If understood correctly, this can lead to a certain goal. There's a footnote, and I believe it's from uh, Anthroposophy of Anthroposophy of Fragment by Fragment by Rudolf Steiner. Quote, Through the sense of taste, we penetrate one stage deeper into outer substantiality than through the sense of smell. In smelling, the substance itself approaches us and discloses its particular character. In tasting, it is the substance's effect on us that is perceived. The difference between them is best felt by visualizing how in the sense of smell a gas-like substance approaches us in a finished state so that we can perceive it as it is, while in the sense of taste we use our own fluid to dissolve the substance, that is, we cause a change in it in order to delve into peculiarities of this substance that it does not reveal to us on its own. This means that the sense of smell is suited to perceiving the outside of the material element, while the sense of taste already, to some extent, goes inside material things. For the inside of an object to be disclosed, we must change its outside. Close quote from Rudolf Steiner, Anthroposophy of Fragment, Anthroposophic Press, Press, Hudson, New York, 1996, page 91. End of footnote. Now I have tried to expose you to quite a lot in these twenty lectures. When I was preparing them, and getting an overview of everything that would be relevant, I realized that giving these lectures would be difficult. Where should we begin? If we began with elementary subjects, we would not get very far in twenty lectures, because we would have time only to point out the route that needs to be taken. But if we began upstairs, as it were, and introduced all sorts of occult facts, it would not be easy to bridge the gap to modern medicine in a certain direction and even more time would be required. Wherever we observe the extensive damage done by materialism today, we also see the need to counteract this damage from the other direction. Please understand what I am saying as a friendly comment, rather than as taking sides in any particular direction. It is not my intention to be partisan in any way. I simply want to present the facts objectively. One thing, however, may and must be said. If we survey modern allopathic medicine, we invariably find that it tends to evaluate patients with a view to the concomitant phenomena described by the bacterial theory of infection. This diverts our attention to a secondary issue. As a mere aid to recognition, the natural history of bacilli would be extremely useful. We can indeed learn a lot from the type of bacillus that is present because a certain type always appears under the influence of a very specific primary cause. There is always plenty of opportunity to see this connection. There is a tendency to mistake a secondary factor for the primary cause, 
as when, for example, we look at the extent to which bacilli affect human organs, instead of the extent to which the human organism can become a habitat for bacilli. Such a tendency appears not only in allopathic medical theories concerning bacteria, but also in that whole way of thinking. Consequently, this tendency causes damage that I need not elucidate, since many of you have noticed it yourselves. You see, homeopathic medicine has at least certain advantages in that it always aims at the human being as a whole, keeps an image of the overall effect in mind, and attempts to build a bridge to the discovery of remedies. But we also cannot always be satisfied when we scrutinize homeopathic medicine because of another idiosyncrasy of homeopathic medical literature. Please forgive me for saying this, but if you look at this literature, especially the therapeutic literature, it can almost drive you to despair, because you find the remedies listed one after the other, and each one is always supposed to help a whole army of illnesses. It is never easy to find anything specific. Everything is helpful for so many different conditions. I know that this is how things have to be, at least for the present, but it simply leads us astray. We can resist being led astray only by proceeding in the way that has been indicated here, at least on an elementary level. This is why I chose an elementary content for these lectures, instead of beginning with the occult. The situation can be improved only when this method of studying human and non-human nature enables us to move on to restricting the usage indications of remedies to delineating remedies. This is not possible unless, in addition to studying a remedy's effect on a person who is healthy or ill, we also gradually attempt to see the entire cosmos as a unity. For example, we must study the human being by tracing the entire antimonizing process, as I pointed out in one instance yesterday. We must attempt to see what antimony does outside the human being in connection with what it can accomplish inside the human being. This view delineates very specific domains in the outer world, which then have connections to the human being. As I said before, such issues led me to emphasize elementary content in these twenty lectures. Of course, natura, naturopathy, naturopathy, maybe, because it serves the instinct to reconnect human beings to their own healing processes in a natural way, makes it necessary to point out the true basis of these intrinsic healing forces, namely the interaction between earthly and supra-earthly factors. For this reason, naturopathy is dependent on not becoming too strongly involved in materialism. Today it really is possible to see how all the different partisan directions are tending toward materialism, which in a certain sense is common to all of them. Thus the important thing is to spiritualize this entire field. However, today's world is very opposed to any such effort. The antidote to materialism will also need to appear from the side of experts and professionals, because what we are attempting here, although it may be in its very beginning stages, must not be misinterpreted as fostering dilettantism. This prejudiced view of what we are doing already exists and it is very damaging. That is why I want to emphasize how important it is for any of you who understand that we are attempting to work scientifically to contribute to combating this prejudice. At present, people take into account and enlist the help of everything that modern science has to offer, but they are unwilling to see what we are really attempting to accomplish. I would like to mention one thing here in conclusion, just as an example. Such instances occur repeatedly. You see, it is possible to properly explain Eurythmy's significance for the human constitution only to a physician. The reason this building, uh, the first Gertianum in Dornach, stands here can be explained only to a physician who is able to understand how the entire human organism turns first inward and then outward again, as we have discussed in these lectures. Today what we say must be based on what completely opposes lay materialism 
and outmoded traditional schools of thought. We must also consider something that I believe needs to be combated on a professional level, otherwise such blatant examples will simply proliferate. You see, our kind Mr. M., who left yesterday, attempted to put his goodwill into action by writing an article about the Dornoch building and Eurythmy for a Zurich newspaper. He received this response. Quote, Dear Sir, it is beyond comprehension that the theosophical anthropos- anthroposophium, with its tasteless mockery of the countryside, can lay claim to Goethe's name. We have seen more than enough examples of Eurythmy here. Thanks for sending the material. H. Trog, editor. Close quote. Now, you see this curious opposition to the spiritual element that is intended to come into the world. This is what we encounter today, and the decadent substance of such materialistic troughs force us to pay some attention to them as they assault our noses with their contaminating stench. Footnote. There is a play on words here. Trog, the name of the editor, means trough, presumably the kind used for feeding farm animals. Close quote. Or, sorry, end of footnote. This is what I wanted to say in concluding this cycle of lectures, because it helps me to emphasize my request that you consider this cycle to be only a beginning. As I said to myself as I prepared, it was difficult to begin owing to reasons I have already enumerated. But now that we are at the end, I must say that it is even more difficult to stop. Not to say what I would also have said is truly more painful I beg you to consider all this in your assessment of what this introduction was able to provide. I hope that you and others will understand that I am speaking out of truly objective, not merely subjective, heartfelt feelings when I now say to you, whose attendance here has demonstrated your great interest in this beginning, quote, until we meet again on a similar occasion, close quote. Dr. Steiner concluded following a participant's expression of thanks. My dear friends, I have chosen this avenue as the only way that spiritual science will be of use to the art of healing. In future, too, you will find that for readily understandable reasons I will adhere to the method I have used up to now. I want the necessary interaction of spiritual science and healing to remain a matter between myself and the healers. I, myself, of course, never have intervened and never want to intervene in the practice of healing. This is left up to practicing physicians. Everything that needs the stimulus of spiritual science should exist on the basis of the give and take between spiritual science and physicians themselves. Any prejudice that might be added to whatever prejudice already exists can be more easily prevented by making it impossible for people to say that I am a charlatan who is actively involved in curing people. This is something I have always attempted to avoid. Thank you very much. The end of Lecture 20 and the end of the cycle by Rudolf Steiner, Introducing Anthroposophical Medicine, given in 1920 in Dornhoff.